In a world where magic exists, there are four continents, twenty nations, and various species. In Rondel, after the era of myths and swords, the current Rondel is said to be in the age of magic, having developed magic extensively. However, despite the advanced magic civilization, the political system remains a feudal one with kings and nobles, which means classism still exists. Nevertheless, this current age of magic is known as the Golden Age of Rondel. Also, on December 29, 1999, in the magic century, the day before the new century arrived, the will of an archmage named Manuel Lucas was revealed, turning the world upside down. The old man informed everyone that he had hidden power, knowledge, and wealth somewhere in the world, and those who desired it could claim their ownerless fate. Manuel Lucas, the archmage who led Rondell into the golden age of the magic century and an archduke of the Bring Up Empire, held the title of the Ninth Circle Lord Wizard. Upon hearing Archmage Lucas's message, citizens from various backgrounds set out on a quest to possess his legacy. Just like that, those who desired to find Lucas's fate embarked on their journeys, and numerous rumors spread. Some said Lucas's dungeon lay in the barren land of the dragons, while others believed his assets were hidden in the allied nations of Elysia, known for being a tax haven. There were even rumors of Lucas's sky fortress in the Sea of Storms, the center of the world. Regardless of their nationality, species, or social rank, everyone sought Archduke Manuel Lucas's fate. However, rumors remained mere rumors, and despite countless investigations, no one found a single clue. Twenty years passed, and the mystery persisted. One day, a man found himself sweating as the system in front of him confirmed that he had acquired Manuel Lucas's fate. He felt a surge of excitement at this revelation. In the year 2007 of the Magic Century, at Lawrence Castle, the butler inquired of their young master, Adrian, if he intended to resume his studies. Adrian replied in the affirmative, stating that he planned to return the books he had read. The butler suggested he could have someone else handle it, but Adrian expressed his desire to find a specific book, so he would do it himself. He is Adrian Lawrence, the second son of Viscount Lawrence, was reincarnated and retained memories of his past life. He remembered that nothing eventful had occurred in the last moments of his previous life. He had died in a truck rollover accident while serving in the military with just one month left until discharge. When he opened his eyes, he had been transported from the Republic of South Korea to the Reinhardt Kingdom, going from Kim Minji to Adrian Lawrence. Coming from an ordinary middle-class family, he began a new life as the second son of a Viscount's family who owned an estate. Although he felt confused and distressed at the beginning of his reincarnation, his past life experiences became a significant advantage in his new life. While other children his age played without much thought, he was passionate about learning, starting earlier than his peers. The teacher told his father that it was his first time seeing someone so outstanding at learning. He thanked his teacher, thinking that he was able to successfully receive recognition from those around him and fulfill his father's expectations all at once. However, if he had to say one disappointing thing, it was all gone for him. He knows that Rundell was a world with a more advanced civilization than 21st century Earth. Due to this, his knowledge from his previous world wasn't of much help. So, he knows that what he can do in that situation is continuously strive to increase his value and keep acting like a genius. However, life isn't easy enough to be cruised through with effort alone. When he was seven years old, someone attempted to poison him. His doctor told his maid that he was really fortunate because if they had taken action just a little bit later, he would have died, making the maid ask who did it. But he knows that the culprit was obvious. Then the woman told him that he didn't know how worried she was. He panically looked at the woman and the official wife of the Lawrence family, Anna Lawrence, asked him if he was all right. He knows that to that woman who is of high birth, the fact that he— who is of common birth and therefore not her child caught his father's eyes was enough to make Anna uncomfortable. He furiously punched the wall while wondering, So what if that world is so developed when the country's political system is so backward? He knows that convicting Anna without any background is impossible, making him wonder why father isn't reacting when there is no way his father doesn't know that Anna is the prime suspect. But then he realizes that his father is turning a blind eye and playing dumb even though he knows. Ever since then, he stopped acting like a genius. 
and about ten years later, in the magical century of May 1, 2019, the store clerk welcomed him to Pod Convenience Store. He's now twenty years old, smiled as he looked around. The man asked his co-worker if she knew him and if he was a celebrity, but the woman told him to be quiet and explained that he is the second young master of the Lawrence family. The man was shocked to hear it and asked his co-worker if it was Adrian from the Lawrence family. Shouldn't he be one of the lords of that area? The man was about to tell his co-worker that Adrian's outfit wasn't much different from a normal commoner's, but then the woman silenced him because Adrian asked him. The woman asked Adrian how she could help him. He told her that he didn't see any online point cards, and she told him that their policy had changed, so point cards can only be purchased at the checkout counter. Then she asked him how much he wanted, and he replied that he wanted all of them. After that, he left, and the clerk thanked him for the purchase. The woman angrily asked her co-worker if he could get himself together, and if he didn't know that if he lost the noble's favor, he could be punished. The man apologized to her, and told her that Adrian could have told his servant to do it, so he was just wondering why Adrian came to the convenience store himself. But the woman asked her co-worker how would she know and told him that she was extremely scared when she first saw him too. The man asks her if Adrian comes often, and she replies that Adrian comes twice or thrice a month. Also, as he can see, it seems like Adrian is very into games. Adrian looked at his five million loot worth of game point cards, and he knew that in Korean one, it'd be around five million one. Then his guard told him that they received a call that their young master, Cedric, is visiting his abode, making him shocked and pissed. A moment later, Adrian's mother, Sylvia Lawrence, wordily says that he arrived, and he hugged his mother while asking about his brother. But then Adrian's half-brother, Cedric Lawrence, who was twenty-three years old, angrily and shoutingly asked him if he was walking around the estate without a vehicle and if he was in his right mind, making him annoyed and his mother fearful. Cedric told him that if he was the child of a noble, he should think about the family prestige. But he knows that Cedric was always playing around with girls and thinks that if Cedric had not been a noble, he wouldn't even be able to take care of himself. But he also knows that if he talks back, it will just last longer, so he'll just withdraw and told Cedric that he was short-sighted and he'll make sure to mind it next time. Cedric told him that, in any case, being a commoner mixed blood isn't something to be proud of. He asked Cedric what brought him there, and Cedric replied that it seemed like their father was planning to make him take over a business called Far's Distribution, so he must have heard about it too. He knows that by our standards, Rondell's noble families are a powerful combination of conglomerates and politicians. Accordingly, those nobles are engaged in various businesses, and Far's Distribution is the money source from the mining industry one among the businesses run by the Lawrence family. He now knows the reason why Cedric suddenly barged in there. So he tells Cedric that he understands, and he'll refuse. Cedric told him that as he expected, he understood. Well, he told Cedric that if he was done with his business, he should return because he paid a lot of money to play games. Cedric tried to hold his laugh but, in the end, laughed loudly and told him that he should just do what he's doing. Sylvia asked him if he was all right and he replied that he was. Then he told his mother that not getting involved is the best course of action. After the attempted poisoning incident, he abandoned his image as a genius and isolated himself by minimizing his interactions with his vassals. He thinks that perhaps it was because his father wasn't interested in the son of a concubine who wasn't a genius. His father became indifferent to him. Thanks to his father's attitude, he never encountered life-threatening situations again. Just like that, he lived for ten years while trying to erase his presence. As soon as he graduated from the academy, he left the castle with his mother. However, most of the servants working there were under the influence of the official wife Anna, so he couldn't even speak freely in his own home. He overheard one of the maids teasingly telling others that Adrian was desperate and running away from reality. He silently continued walking and entered his room. Inside his room, he grabbed the game gadget from the table. He wondered if he was using games as a way to escape from reality. The game indicated that he had accessed the Chronicle online. He smiled, knowing that there's no way the system showed him that he had cleared stage one of the fate quest. It analyzed his character and indicated that it had synchronized his character with his real-life body. He proudly stated that if he wanted to monitor someone, they should also do it in the virtual world. 
then the system warned him that abilities in Chronicle Online would have an impact in reality. Ten years ago, when he was enrolled at the Royal Academy, he researched Manuel Lucas for his assignment. He discovered something unexpected when he saw Lucas's family crest. No matter how he looked at it, it resembled an English word, making him wonder how English could exist in that world. He guessed that maybe Manuel Lucas was from Earth too, but he told himself he couldn't come to a conclusion with just that. It might simply be a coincidence. However, it wasn't long before he could confirm that Archduke Lucas was indeed from Earth. He saw that Archduke Lucas had said those words before his death, expressing a desire to walk the California beach with Mary once again. Although he wasn't familiar with the place names as they were names he had never heard of before, it was the story of a great man, and he couldn't ignore it. He recorded the Archduke's last message and noticed that those names were also written in the records of the butler who was by Lucas's side until the end of his life. This led him to conclude that it wasn't a coincidence, and that the great Archmage of Rondell was an earthling like him. After becoming convinced, he investigated Manuel Lucas further, and evidence confirming that Lucas was an earthling poured in from all directions. He used his knowledge of earth from his previous life to trace the path that Lucas had left behind. In the end, he acquired Manuel Lucas's legacy, which filled him with excitement. He thought he could now walk on a path of flowers. But then something attacked him from behind, confirming his fears. A sword hit the wall behind him, causing excruciating pain, and he realized that after obtaining the legacy, true suffering had just begun. He wondered if he could properly fight against this newfound threat. Archmage Lucas's legacy was hidden in an unexpected location. It was online, inside a virtual world. He believed that even if this virtual world was meticulously designed to resemble reality, it was still just a game, and pain should generally be filtered out. However, he felt the pain in real life and had to struggle every time he fought. He also considered that the idea of the legacy acquirer becoming synchronized the game, and in real life seemed like an impossible story that no one would believe. As a goblin swung its weapon to attack him, he dodged it and swiftly stabbed the goblin in the face with his sword, dealing a critical hit. The system indicated that he had leveled up to level 10 and had cleared stage one of the fate quests, healing him in the process. It also informed him that he could change jobs at this level. Then he found himself somewhere different as the system informed him that he had been moved to a secret space by the main god Ariel. The system started to initialize his character and synchronize his character with his real body, allowing his abilities in Chronicle Online to reflect in reality. He couldn't help but curse in frustration because it took longer than he expected due to synchronization. A door appeared behind him, and the system asked if he would like to go to the second floor of the magic tower of Manuel Lucas. He walked toward the door and replied with a resounding yes. Upon emerging from the door, he found himself in a library, which was unlike the first floor where there was nothing. Then he saw that the bookshelf was packed with books, and wondered if the chest in front of him was a treasure chest. The system showed him that he had acquired five billion loot, which was in Rondell's currency unit, five billion one, and told him to enter the account to receive the deposit. Also, if he wants, he may also receive it as online currency but he is just glad that finally he gets a reward and feels like a reward has appeared. He grabbed his rewards while thinking that, although it was a shame that he couldn't get that much money, the system showed him that he had created one circle, and as per the circle creation, he had been bestowed the mage's job. Also, a circle has been created on the synchronized body in real life, and he knows that the true value of fate isn't money but that to begin with. Then the system told him not to quit the game because a synchronized body will take a huge hit if forced to quit. While the circle was forming at him, he was thinking that up until then, he thought the mana points displayed with health points were just mana, but he had never felt the presence of mana in real life. The system showed him that circle creation had been completed, making him feel the presence of mana circulating in his chest. He knows that it wasn't an easy process, but he figured out that it was the true power of fate synchronization between the game and real life. He thinks that since one circle has been created, he wonders if he can't learn a technique that suits it because he was sure that those books are part of Lucas's work too. But when he is about to get a book, the system warned him and asked him if he would like to look up some materials, making him think that it was so convenient because he noticed that there are quite a lot of books. So he was wondering about when he'd be able to look through all of them, but he expected it from the best mage of humanity 
Manuel Lucas. A moment later, he was leaning on the bookshelf in pain because he felt a huge headache. He thinks it is convenient to learn skills and magic just by touching the skill book like in games, but the process of engraving the principles into his head is unpleasant and painful. But he endures it and holds a book, knowing that it is the last one. Then the system told him that it was a circle concealment technique book that hid circles and possessed mana and was useless against aura master level knights, mages above the seventh circle, and top level detection artifacts. He knows that it's the skill he needs the most, and it's as if they know his circumstance. Then he acquired it, and he felt dizzy and another huge headache in his head. He felt his surroundings move because of it and slowly fell but he just laughed and thought that he hoped for nothing much through Manuel Lucas's fate. He was on the floor, knowing that he barely took one step forward and there were a lot of things to do in the future. Also, he just wants his mother and him to live comfortably without any problems, so he swears that he is going to do everything for it. The next day at the mansion's training hall, the trusted friend and guard, Knight Vice, told him that he had more stamina than he thought. He asked Vice if he really did, and Vice honestly admitted that he was a bit surprised when he expressed his desire to improve his swordsmanship. He mentioned that he had been feeling a bit sluggish lately and thought some exercise would do him good, but the truth was he knew it would also help in the game as his in-game character's abilities were synchronized with his real-life self. Besides, he could feel his mana and stamina improving, and it seemed that his enhanced in-game stats also affected his real-life abilities. In simple terms, the skills he honed in the game could be applied in real life. He smiled, realizing that he had resolved the mana circle issue with the help of the concealment skill he had learned at Luca's magic tower. Vice noticed his smile and asked if something good had happened, making him wonder if he seemed too excited. He replied that he had acquired a valuable item in the game. People around them whispered, as they had suspected he was a gaming enthusiast, and they considered Vice to be quite a fanatic too. Some questioned why Vice was trying to impress a seemingly powerless and pitiful human. Vice became angry, but he stopped him and told him not to pay attention to them. He appreciated Vice standing up for him, although he knew it was all an act. He needed to appear insignificant to avoid drawing the attention of Anna and Cedric, and being ignored as a worthless individual was currently the best situation for him. A minute later, he logged into the game, and Chronicle Online warmly greeted him. He realized that now that he had confirmed that his stats were indeed affecting his real-life abilities, he knew what he needed most to earn more money and enhance his abilities. It was time to spend, and he recalled someone saying that the most crucial aspect of a game was the power of one's wallet. The system loaded the store product list for him. First, he bought the experience increase with a requirement of below level 100, which boosted experience acquisition by 30% for 24 hours, costing 500 kits. Then he acquired the goddess's blessing with a requirement of below level 100, increasing all stats by 30% for 24 hours, also for 500 kits. Lastly, he purchased goddess's protection with a requirement of below level 100, granting immunity from attacks once for 1,000 kits. He realized that it would have been great to buy these items earlier, but he needed to reach at least level 10 to access the cash shop. He also decided to get a summon supporter, which he believed would be the main event of the day. It cost 500 kits for a one-time use and 4,500 kits for 10 uses. Despite knowing that having a tank would reduce some of the experience points he needed to level up due to aggro, especially when playing in a party, he deemed it a worthy investment. He chose the highest grade warrior to be his tank, regardless of the cost. The system presented him with the option to summon a supporter 10 times for 4,500 kits, and he decided to go for it, explaining that he had both the money and determination to do so. The system then revealed a random summon class supporter. A moment later, he noticed that the chances were similar to those in low-quality Korean games. He put in 30 million won but got no supporters that he liked. Then he saw an interesting one, Arcia the Heavenly Steel Female. She specialized in defense, and wore a protective shield called the Shield of God. It was his first time hearing about this supporter, making him wonder if she was a new character. On top of that, he noticed that at level 25, she was the best even among the unique tier. He was glad that a useful supporter had finally come out. He registered her, but the system showed him that once registered as a supporter, changes couldn't be made. 
It asked if he really wanted to register her, making him confused, but he still registered Arcia the Heavenly Steel as his supporter. He looked at her and noticed that her expressionless face looked like a golem with the outer appearance of a human, but he thought it didn't matter. He asked her if they should go level up. A moment later she tanked the goblins while he attacked them with his magic missile. He stopped when the system showed him that he had reached level 20 and asked if he would like to check out the technique books and magic books that he had acquired. This made him happy because the hunt was going very comfortably with a tanker supporter. He sat behind the tree, thinking that even if it took some of his experience points, he didn't feel like he was at a loss at all, although it would be a pity since the higher the level, the more experience the supporter would need. The system warned him that he had been playing the game for 15 hours without a break in real time and begged him to log out of the game and take a break. He wondered if it wasn't more difficult than practicing magic in real life. Then he logged out. He stretched his body while saying that today was rewarding and planned to take a short break and go to the training hall. But then he noticed someone at his side and was shocked to see his supporter standing and looking at him. He panicky looked at her expressionless face and asked her who the hell she was. She replied that she was his support. He told her that it was not what he was asking and that he was asking how she came out of the game. She replied that she understood it now, and he must be curious about how she maintained her substance in reality, to which he agreed. While noticing that seeing how she can make a precise distinction between reality and the game, it seems like she understands her situation properly. She told him that she is an android, and her creator was Manuel Lucas as predetermined by her master. Her appearance and combat characteristics are that of Arcia of Heavenly Steel. He told her that in other words, she is one of Lucas's legacies, to which she replied yes. He frustratingly thinks that if he knew it would happen, he wouldn't have chosen that tanking supporter, but he knows that something a little more versatile. He was not being picky because he didn't want her, but if it's something like that, the sister should have let him know in advance. He asked her if her stats were the same as in the game. She replied yes and told him that the restricted stats will be recovered as his level in Chronicles Online increased. Functionally, she thinks her maximum stats were comparable to that of a Grand Master, making him shocked. Knowing that when the Knight rankings are divided into nine classes, it'd be equal to the eighth class, and the Grand Master is the same rank as an eighth circle mage. Also, it was on par with the continent's strongest, and even in the Reinhardt Kingdom, the highest ranked mage is at the seventh class and there are only eight mages in the eighth class in that world. He wonders if Manuel Lucas created a monster of that level and thinks that at any rate, it was helpful to have a trustworthy and incredible ally who only listens to his orders. The problem was he wondered how he was going to hide her. He asked her where she was before she was summoned there, and what about reverse summoning. She replied that she was stored in a standby state in a maintenance warehouse located in Everhill, a holy city and she was then transmitted by the Lucky Encounter Management server. Then she told him that transmission is only possible at the time of initial shipment, so after it, if she wants to return to the maintenance warehouse, she has to go herself. He asked her if there was a stealth or magic concealment function, and she replied that since she was in the warrior class, there was no stealth function, but mana concealment was possible. Then he ordered her to try it, and she obeyed him straight away. Then he noticed that the protective shield covering her armor disappeared along with the mana, and fortunately, like him, she has the mana concealment skill, so she won't be discovered by the knights. He said that there was no helping it, making her confused, and told her that his impression was already the worst. Anyway, a moment later, the people outside the mansion whisperingly asked if they heard the rumors that Adrian is now openly inviting a woman into the mansion, and the others replied that he heard it too. They say the maids caught him in the room with a woman. Also, they heard that they go everywhere together and think that Adrian must be the most shameless person in the world. His mother asks him when he is going to get married and tells him that she doesn't mind if his girlfriend is a commoner, while Vice is shocked that he has already become an adult. He's shocked to see that he reached level 30 and his lucky encounter quest stage 2 with the condition of defeating the orc warrior Kants and a reward to unlock Manuel Lucas's magic tower third floor. He thinks if he plays the role of an immature young master who brings a strange woman into his mansion, no one will suspect Arcia. Although his mother's reaction is quite embarrassing, then he asks Arcia what happens to her real-life body when she is connected to the game. She replied that it'll be switched to eco-mode, so it's like her taking a break. 
however, her monitoring function is in operation for his protection. He asks her if it means if there is a problem outside, she can let him know or respond right away, and she replies yes while looking at their side. Suddenly, a loud growling sound can be heard, and Arcea shields him while he asks her if it has begun, to which she replies yes. While a huge monster is walking closer to them, the orc warrior cants with health points of 5,500, glared at them, and the fate quest stage 2, defeated orc warrior cants, started. Cants called him human, and told him that he could become special if he got rid of him. Then the system warned him using consumable attack items such as bombs and scrolls is impossible, making him notice that the use of items that make hunting easier is prohibited. He asks Manuel Lucas if he wants to raise his disciple to be strong. He called Arcia, knowing that it won't be easy to beat the guy. Kant swung his sword forward while telling him to die. But the sword hit Arcia's shield and made it bounce back a little because of the force, making him shocked and confused. Then he aimed at Kanson, attacked Kansas Eye using his magic missile. The system showed him that his attack crit, and Kansas health points decreased to 4,300. While slowly falling, he was thankful that he covered his entire body with high-quality equipment because the power of his magic missile had surpassed that of a first circle. He thought that if it was a monster of the same level, he could easily one-shot one kill. But then he heard a sound to his side, and Kance attacked him. Fortunately, Arcia blocked it in time with her shield. He says that it was crazy and notices that despite Kance's absurd health points, Kance was clearly critically wounded. He asks if Kants is abnormally tough. While Kants continuously hits our shield, he knows that he will die if Kants hits him even once, and he is glad that Arcia is there with him. Also, it would be a lie if he said he wasn't nervous with an enemy charging at him with that kind of force. He knows that he already died once. Then he activated his magic dig, which means earth digging magic, and made Kants trip and fall hard on the ground. While he thought that at that level, there was no way he was letting his fear cloud his judgment. Then he ordered Arcia not to let Kants get up while he was attacking him, to which she replied yes. He continuously attacked Kants, who had 3,900 health points, with his magic missile until Kants stood up with 50 health points. He teasingly told Kants that he was persistently making Kants angrier and launched his sword once again. But he just aimed his finger toward Kants and told him that it would have been better to put the sword down and act out some ground techniques. Then he activated his power and used his magic missile once again, which defeated the orc warrior, Kants. The system showed him that he had cleared Fate Quest Stage 2, and the conditions for opening the next area of the magic tower had been met. So, Manuel Lucas' magic tower's third floor has been opened. At the same time, in Viscount Lawrence's office, he was silently looking out of the window. Anna asked him what he was thinking about. Viscount Lawrence looked at Anna silently. She told him that it was late at night, and he was all by himself. Then she asked him if it was because of the news that Adrian brought a commoner woman into the mansion. Rayford called her name, and simply gave her an envelope. In it, she read a convocation order of local forces that says the possibility of war against the Kroixen Empire increases. The troops from each territory are gathered to form local forces and Viscount Lawrence will join the Western Command with five vanguards, fifty knights, and one thousand soldiers. She asked him if he was planning on sending Cedric to battle, but he just kept silent. Then Anna begged him to send Adrian because Adrian just plays the game every day at the mansion. She told him that as a member of the Lawrence family, Adrian should act his part sometimes. But he just asked her if she is going to summon and use Adrian when it's necessary after leaving Adrian alone all that time. She told him that it was what Adrian wanted himself and that up until now, Adrian enjoyed the rights of nobility to the fullest. But he just asked her if it was really what she thought, and she asked him back what he wanted to say. But he just silently glared at her for a moment, and told her that Cedric is the successor of the territory, and he will make sure that she and his father-in-law will not be bothered by anything from now on. So she should just follow his decision this time, making her angry and silent. Then Rafer told her that, as she said, he would send Adrian to the battlefield this time. However, when Adrian returns, he will make Adrian completely independent, and he hopes that Adrian and Sylvia will not be put in danger in the future, which includes any surveillance and secret investigations. He asks her if it should be enough and tells her to stop now and let Adrian be free. 
The next day, Vice happily told Adrian that his physical strength had improved dramatically thanks to his consistent training over the past few days. He couldn't believe he was improving that quickly. Then he told him that if he had worked that hard since he was a teenager, he would have become a great man. But he just smiled, knowing that, of course, his skills have improved since he's already level 30 and has reached stage 2 of the fate quest. Then he remembers that the reward of that fate quest was quite satisfactory as well because on top of receiving a lot of money and forming his second circle, he even gained a subspace. It was like the inventory in the game. He now had his own treasure chest to hide necessary items. So if he takes good advantage of it, besides simple storage, he can use it for other things too. He thinks the fact that the stats in the game are reflected in reality. Depending on his effort, he can become a mage while possessing physical abilities comparable to that of a knight. And if he can completely absorb the stats received from fate, he may even become a more fearsome monster than Archmage Lucas. Then he told Vice that now he had finished resting, they should continue. But then the other knight called him to tell him that their lordship had summoned him to the castle. A few days later, at Lawrence's castle, he was thinking about why his father called him. Cedric, in an angry tone, asked their father why Adrian was representing their family on the battlefield. Rayford explained to Cedric that he is the sole heir of their family, so he couldn't allow him to be on that dangerous battlefield. Sylvia inquired if Rayford was implying that Adrian wasn't as important as Cedric. Rayford replied that there's a difference in Adrian's value compared to the family heir. Adrian couldn't believe that Rayford had really called him in to say this, and it was making him quite upset. However, he also thought that it wasn't all bad for him. Anyone could enter the game with the headgear, and since he was a substitute for the heir, no one would interfere with him. More importantly, once he got out of there, he could escape Anna's watchful eyes. So he told Rayford that he understood and would participate as a representative of their family. Rayford thanked him, but Cedric issued a threat, saying he wouldn't say more since it was their father's decision. However, he warned that he wouldn't sit back if Adrian defamed their family finding it somewhat amusing that Cedric was saying this to his younger brother who was going to war for him. Adrian also wondered why Cedric was acting so immature, guessing that they had gone a long way from each other. He assured them that he would try his best, but then his father called him over and asked if they could talk privately. A minute later, they arrived at the bridge, and Adrian wondered if Rayford had something private to discuss since Rayford had asked his guard to leave. He inquired about the topic of the conversation and Rayford mentioned that if the situation on the battlefield went well, he would relocate him and Sylvia to the king's land. He added that Adrian should consider it a reward for going instead of Cedric, allowing him to do as he pleased without interference. Adrian knew that Anna didn't like him out of her sight, making him question if she had agreed to this. Therefore, he couldn't entirely trust Rayford yet. He told his father that he understood but needed to think about it. Rayford acknowledged Adrian's lack of trust, and he tells Rayford that he needed to come back alive from the battle to really think about it. Rayford sighed and got something from under his coat, leaving Adrian to wonder what it could be. Rayford gave it to him and explained that it was artifacts with a 5th class auto shield and a 7th class great shield, which would be helpful since the battlefield doesn't allow teleportation. He was surprised to see it, knowing that those are extremely valuable, and thanked Rayford. Then his father told him that he would have to stay conscious to survive but then he felt someone glaring at him from inside and saw an angry Cedric and teasingly smiling Anna. He smiled back, knowing that of course they were watching him, and called them obnoxious in his head. Rayford looked at them too while telling him not to worry about Sylvia and to take it easy. He remembered that when someone had tried to poison him at the age of seven, his father's response was disappointing, and his father disappointed him multiple times afterward. But surrounded by enemies— the only one he could trust right now was his father. He told Rayford that of course he would trust him, making Rayford surprised, and he agreed. A moment later, Rayford was in his room alone and felt a huge headache. Then he used his pain mitigation magic and felt a little relieved thanks to it. After regaining his composure, he stood up and thought that he knew Adrian had been acting differently ever since the poisoning incident. Meanwhile, in Adrian's mansion, his mother was crying, he told his mother not to worry too much because she knew that he could take care of himself. But Sylvia still worriedly asked him what if they hurt him after bringing him to the battle. However, she was shocked to hear him tell her that it was good for him 
and that it's better to have more primes on their name to get rid of them. Sylvia asked him what he meant and what if someone heard them, but he assured her not to worry because Arcia was on guard at the door. He told his mother that he was not just taking hits anymore because it's almost over and asked her to wait a little longer. Two days later, on Lawrence Army's dispatch day, the staff, including Harmon, nervously asked him who that lady was. He asked Harmon back if he didn't know Arcia. Harmon told him that he had heard about their relationship but was unsure about bringing his lover to a possible battlefield. Inside the levitation train's conference room, he told everyone that he wouldn't discuss Arcia further so they should think of her as his secretary. Harmon replied that if he insisted, he understood. He knows that he can't leave Arcia behind, and she will save him with her life if things turn out badly, especially because Arcia leveled up so much recently, and her stats are close to an official night. One thing to prepare before the battle is enchanting himself for survival. He spent two hundred million in two days in the game, and cleared the third level of a lucky encounter with money. Now, he was right before the fourth level, and the rewards for the third level were costing one hundred billion each. The Almighty Cure, three bottles of elixirs. Currently, the elixirs are sitting nicely in his dimension pocket, and he knows that it's the perfect reward for his situation. Then he figured out that he couldn't waste any more time because the fourth level was waiting. So he told everyone that he would be resting in his room, so they should message him if there was anything. Harmon asked him what he meant by message and he replied that he was going to play more games. Harmon was shocked to hear it, but he just asked him if there was a problem. Then someone angrily said that the rumors were true, making Harmon warily call the man Sir Dalton. He notices that Dalton is a vanguard, and a vanguard is a special force armed with force armor and a force sword. They are the center of the war and are prioritized when raiding a nation's military strength. Dalton teasingly asks him if he is sure about it because he will be seen as an incompetent commander. He tells him that his reputation isn't really good already, and he brought a girl to battle, but he was going to play a game. Dalton also told him that he understood the girl part since Arcia was pretty. Then a man called Dalton, glaringly told him to watch his mouth, making Dalton shocked in fear. A vanguard and vice leader of the knights, Bill I am, apologizes to him because his underling overstepped his boundary. He tells him that long travel like it requires a sideshow. He noticed that Bill I am had a cold look different from his speech. Then Bill I am told everyone that there was no reason for the Lord's deputy to care about the underling's opinion, making him realize that Bill I am, for sure, doesn't like him either. But it was nothing to him since he was used to those responses. Then he ordered them to send him a message when they arrived, to which they replied yes. A moment later, he threw a bottle of liquid at the huge monster in front of them, which made a huge explosion and made the monster growl in pain. The item he threw was called Tears of Salamander, with an effect of 3,000 true damage, but it was an overpriced item made with expensive materials. He thinks it was really overpriced, but with 3,000 true damage with no cast, he'll take it any day. Then the system pops up in front of him, making him think that it's worked. He sees that he has reached level 80 so the main god Ariel brings him to the secret room. He was excited because it was the fourth level quest and saw the Demi-Lich, Immerse, with 32,000 health points welcoming them as his prey. But he also knew that he had to clear the fourth level before they arrived at West Headquarters. He looked at Immerse, knowing that Lich monsters are difficult to deal with, but he thinks the Lich in front of him seemed stupid and slow. But then Immerse used his stone magic, making Arcia's foot turn to stone and used Ice Circle Lance spell to attack him, which made him shocked. He panicked. He wonders if Immerse casts before they got into their stances, and Arcia worldly tries to run toward him, but he notices that Arcia is late, and he needs to dodge. But even though he tries, he still gets hit in the shoulder, making him shout in pain. Immerse laughingly told him that he can hear his bones getting crushed and his flesh being torn apart. He was on the ground shaking in pain while he thought he dodged it, and that he couldn't think straight because of the pain he felt. Also, he was annoyed at Immerse laughing because he felt like he heard Immerse laugh from somewhere. But then he remembered Cedric, making him pissed, and he forced himself to stand up while Immerse laughingly told him to stand still. Then Immerse uses fireball to attack him, but he just dodged it while running forward with Arcia in front. A second later, they appeared near Immerse. Then he used his heal magic to attack Immerse, 
making Immerse health points drop to 29,000. He ordered Arcia not to give Immerse time to cast, to which Arcia replied yes. He knows that the best way to go against a lich without a priest. Then he enchanted their equipment with the holy attributes and continuously attacked Immerse with it, knowing that the solution was holy attribute. Beat up Immerse, who was being attacked, asked them why they were doing physical damage with a staff while sneakily casting and cast a firewall, which released a huge wall of fire. Immerse says that if he can distance himself with it, he can win. But then he appears in front of Immerse, making Immerse shocked and telling him that he was a freak from running through the fire. But he just told Immerse to die and smashed his weapon on Immerse's head while calling Immerse a Cedric-looking bastard. Hours later, the system showed that he completed the Lucky Encounter quest level 4, but he was gasping in pain on the ground. Arcia dropped her shield and worriedly ran toward him. Then, Arcia grabbed one of the elixirs while he is remembering that they say he can't feel pain because of adrenaline during a fight, but as soon as the fight is over, he can feel it all. Arcia put the elixir in his mouth, and he slowly healed while he thinks that the servant opened the master's inventory by her own will, which means Arcia is really special. Then he thanked Arcia and told her that he felt much better. The system showed that he met the requirement to unlock the next floor of the tower so it unlocked Lucas's fifth floor of the tower. Then it transported them to the fifth floor of the tower, and he immediately ran to the chest waiting for him. He excitedly opened it, saying they should see what the rewards were. This time, the system showed that he acquired 500 billion loots and acquired all-around glasses. He wondered what it was and knew it couldn't be random since it's a gift from Archmage Lucas. He opened the glasses' detailed description and saw that it was glasses with analysis, observation, clairvoyance, and enhanced vision. It analyzes a living thing, where objects use purpose and stats. It verifies the emotions of a living being and the truthfulness of a conversation. It can see through an obstacle, and it can see something at a distance of hundreds of meters to several kilometers away. He thinks he can see who are allies or enemies, which means it was a useful item for a doubtful person like him. Also, because he completed the quest, the fourth circle is generating for him. The next day at West Headquarters, the man asked if it was the second son of the Lawrence family because he thought the bigger one would come from the Lawrence family. The other man replied that his name was Cedric or something, and he heard Cedric got everyone's attention at an early age because of his talent. But then the man replied that it was probably the younger one, not Cedric, because he heard Adrian became a fool after eating poison. Without them knowing that he can hear them, he happily told them that indeed he was the younger one who ate the poison. One of the men told him that he doesn't really see a fool and can't trust rumors after all. Then one of the men introduced himself as Viscount Evans, the local headquarters chief of staff, and the other man introduced himself as Viscount Miller, the headquarters support chief of staff. He bowed respectfully and told them that it was his honor to meet both of them. Evans looked at the monitor and asked him to confirm if their Viscount's troops were five vanguards and fifty knights. He replied that it was correct and told them that it was five vanguards. Fifty knights, and one thousand soldiers. Evans told him that he didn't have to report about the soldiers because that war will end with just vanguards. He just smiled, but the truth is he can't believe they're treating elites armed with artifacts like this. He knows that vanguards are monsters that only great wizards of the seventh circle or above can handle. So sadly, what Evans was saying is all true, and he remembers that Archduke Lucas was the one who made the vanguard system. Evans told him that Lawrence's army had been organized as the 2nd Independent Brigade under the command of the 3rd Division, so he should make sure to look after Division Commander Earl Otis as the brigadier. He politely replied yes, knowing that Earl Otis was the great lord of the East. After that, he told everyone that Lawrence's army had been organized as the 2nd Independent Brigade and that they should move while hoping that this one had some elasticity. A week later, inside the game, he was excitedly thinking that Commander Otis was the best, while Arcia was busy hunting monsters behind. He thinks the best superior is an absent superior and remembers a man reporting to him that Commander Otis would be commuting back and forth with teleports until the war begins, making him wonder if Otis was commuting while leaving his army there when war could happen at any time. He knows that Otis's actions were absurd but good for him because it allowed him to play the game without any concerns. While he was busy looking at his stats, Arcia called him to report to him that someone came into the room, making him shocked and immediately logged out of the game. When he pulled out the game gadget, 
he saw Arcia stopping Dalton, who was wondering where that strength was coming from. Arcia wore his glasses while wondering why Dalton walked in there. Then he looked at Dalton while wearing his glasses and saw that Dalton's status was horny. He walked closer to Dalton and told him that he better explain what was going on there. Dalton told him that he was concerned about his health as a guard since he had been in the game for too long, and then that girl came to him. But he just kicked Dalton's knee, making Dalton kneel and shocked. He just reminded Dalton that he told him to message him if something happens, and he has Arcia next to him always on standby, so he should give him a better excuse. Then he firmly told Dalton that he came into the commander of the brigade, and the lord deputy's room without permission then asked him why and if he was going to assassinate him. Dalton shouted that it was too far, asked him who did he think he was, and told him that he was the vanguard. He kicked Dalton's knee again while telling him that he has to convince him and called him a schmuck, making the three knights behind him shocked. He asked Arcia to tell him what exactly happened, and she replied that Dalton tried to separate her from him. He asked Arcia if she was saying that Dalton tried to drag her somewhere, and she replied that he was correct. Dalton angrily asked him if he was framing him right now and if he was doubting the vanguard because of that woman who came from nowhere. While he was getting something from Arcia, he grabbed the knife near Arcia while thinking that Dalton is a real piece of shit and noticed that the knights who had just come up there were probably with Dalton. But he told Dalton that it was a violation of military discipline and it was mutiny, so he needed to receive suitable punishment. Then he pointed the knife at Dalton's chest and ordered him to take one step forward. But Dalton still teasingly asked him if he was serious while the knights tried to calm him down. He kept it down not because he was a good person but because he wanted to stay alive, and he knew that it was somewhere Anna couldn't keep watch over him, which means he had no reason to back down. So, he told him that his ass should be the one who calmed down, and knows that it was a great time to show them. And firmly repeated to Dalton that he said to take one step forward. The scene shifts to outside, someone in a panic called Bill I am, and informed him that Adrian urgently required his presence. The night that informed Bill I am that Adrian intended to execute Dalton so they needed to act swiftly. This frustrated Bill I am because he felt like Adrian was giving him orders and he couldn't fathom what was happening. Upon his arrival in the room, a knife flew towards Bill I am, but he skillfully caught it, noticing that it was covered in blood. Adrian angrily questioned Bill I am about why he hadn't hurried. But Biliam remained silent and saw Dalton in pain on the floor. Biliam inquired about the situation, and Adrian responded that a knight harassing a girl made no sense to him. Dalton then asked for Biliam's opinion, leaving him shocked. Biliam, filled with fury, questioned the knights about their actions. He bowed to Adrian, apologized, and explained that it was due to his own shortcomings. Biliam then kicked the injured Dalton on the ground, relieving him of his duty collecting Dalton's armor, and ordering his imprisonment. He declared that the three knights who allowed Dalton in were also accomplices and would be sent to jail. William told Adrian that he wouldn't entertain any disputes as he was in charge. Adrian responded that it wasn't gentlemanly that they couldn't use the room due to the bloodshed. He decided to move to the next room and instructed the servants to clean up. Biliam wondered if this was Adrian's true nature but then smiled, thinking, it must be difficult to suppress it. Later. While playing a game and facing continuous enemy attacks, Adrian retaliated while Arcia shielded him. He noticed that the enemies kept targeting his blind spots while maintaining their distance. Their opponent was a corrupted knight named Zenith who currently had 12,800 health points out of 45,000. Their quest was lucky encounter level 5 with a requirement of level 120 and defeat the corrupted Midnight Zenith as a reward. They gained access to the sixth floor of Manuel Lucas's tower. Suddenly, Zenith pushed Arcia aside and charged toward Adrian. He told Adrian to die while launching a sword at him, but Adrian skillfully dodged in time to avoid it. This left Zenith confused, and he was shocked when he saw something coming towards him. Arcia then forcefully slammed her shield into Zenith's face, and Adrian activated his magic power, ultimately defeating Zenith. Zenith sighed defeatedly and mentioned that Adrian was just a tool for his own growth. Then, the system showed him that he unlocked the sixth floor of Manuel Lucas's tower and acquired two trillion loots, which is too much to deposit in an account or convert into online currency. It made him think that it's always great to see such rewards. The system then popped up in front of him once again, showing that he acquired Istro's staff, 
robe, armor, shield, a short sword, and an arming sword. He thought the robe and staff were the only equipment for a wizard, and the rest were for Arcia. He believed it was always good to have more gear and knew that Archduke Lucas wouldn't provide ordinary weapons either. A moment later, the knight seemed shaken and excused himself. He asked the knight what was wrong, and the knight replied that he felt a strange energy. He assured the knight that he was just checking on artifacts, so there was no need to worry. The knight replied that he understood and left, leaving him to examine the items in front of him. He then retrieved the sword from his inventory, realizing it was the fourth sword that vanguards mainly used. He knew that anyone could temporarily use vanguards' power if they charged it with an aura-like battery. Vanguard's force equipment amplified the knight's aura, and unlike mana, aura couldn't be artificially created. He guessed that maybe wizard's equipment also had that feature. He noticed that Istro's staff and robe had special skills related to aura storage, which shocked him. He figured out why everyone wanted Archduke Lucas's fate. Two weeks later, he realized it had been two weeks since he had been appointed as the representative of the Lawrence family. He led the army at the front lines against the Croizan Empire. He told the knights that he didn't need guards, to which they all replied with agreement. The tense atmosphere that felt like war could break out at any moment seemed to have diminished. They had been just sitting, but everyone was still apprehensive of him after the Dalton incident. He thought it was a good thing he had shown them who he was. However, one odd thing was Billiam's attitude towards him, which had turned friendly. He always noticed that Billiam was curious and cautious around him. He guessed it didn't really matter since he could focus on the game without any interference. Then, he looked at Arcia, who now had the status of happy. He was confused because he had never seen that before. He wondered if she was happy because they had gone out for a walk, making him think of her like a puppy. Seeing her, he realized that even a homunculus had emotions, and he still didn't know much about her. Her individuality was weak, so he believed she definitely had likes and dislikes. He covered his face as leaves flew around them and saw a beautiful view in front of him. Then, he looked at Arcia and saw that she was very happy, which made him silently laugh, leaving Arcia confused. A moment later, they reached their base, and he told Arcia that they should go for walks more often, to which she agreed. But then, a man confronted him, and he asked the man if there was a problem. Suddenly, the man shyly asked him if he would like a drink, if he didn't mind. He noticed that the man's name was Lopez, with the status of embarrassed and awkward. Then he noticed two other knights laughing behind them, making him understand what was going on. He asked Lopez if they told him to do that while pointing to the two knights behind him. However, he thought there was no reason for him to go along with it, so he walked away, telling Lopez that he had no interest in it. But then he stopped walking and asked Lopez why he became a knight. Lopez apologized for disrespecting him and said he didn't think it was necessary. However, he didn't mean it that way because it was the first time he had seen someone with more than two exceptional talents other than a homunculus. He knew that Lopez had a very high aptitude for mana and rare traits, making him wonder why Lopez was serving under other knights. But he thought it wasn't his problem. He then apologized and told Lopez that he could have been more successful if he became a wizard. This left Lopez shocked and confused as Adrian told the other knights to stop bothering him. When he arrived in his room, he thought it was a waste not to get involved with Lopez because he didn't want any problems. However, Lopez's talent was going to waste. He also believed that if Lopez could use magic along with the vanguard's force equipment, Lopez could become a magic swordsman. But he knew that having talent didn't guarantee success. Nevertheless, Lopez had become a knight at an early age, so there was a chance. If he could recruit Lopez, it would be great. The problem was Earl Otis because Alan Lopez was a knight in a different earldom. He needed Otis's permission to recruit Lopez, which made him wonder if he should bribe Otis. He thought it wasn't a bad choice considering Otis's personality. He didn't know how useful high and very high talents were, but he knew he needed to start building his influence, and now was the best time as he was away from the earldom. Also, he knew what to do next and told Arcia that they would be busy. On the other hand, Lopez was walking in the corridor when he remembered Adrian telling him that he could be successful if he became a wizard. Instead, he thought that at first, he just believed Adrian was an arrogant aristocrat, but for Adrian to think he should have become a wizard instead of a knight, he was also considering it. Then he informed his commander, Otis, 
that he came as per his orders. He walked inside the room and asked Otis if he was looking for him. He was thinking that he knows rumors are not always right, but if it's to that degree, it is a bit scary. Otis warmly welcomed him, and he saw Adrian sitting in front of his commander, making him wonder why Otis had called him. Otis told him that he probably already knew, but the man in front of him was the representative of the Viscount of the Lawrence family, Brigadier Adrian Lawrence. Then Otis told him that from then on, he would serve Adrian as his lord, which left him confused. Adrian remembered that in his past life when China lost to Korea in a soccer game, one fan asked why they couldn't find 11 good soccer players when China has a population of 1.4 billion. Then someone replied that it was because the Chinese Messi or the Chinese Ronaldo is shoveling in a farm somewhere. So he thinks that no matter how much potential someone has, it wouldn't matter if there was no system that could bring out their potential. He looked at the room full of people and asked who could have thought that so many people were on the wrong path. He saw Earl Otis's unsuccessful knight, Alan Lopez, a peasant-turned-laborer, Barbara Henderson, one of the only soldiers who could play an instrument and became a trumpeter, Eric Jones, a daring boy who got caught trying to sell adult magazines to the army, Nicole Brown, a maid from the neighboring army, Linda Noah, and more. He knows that they each have amazing talents, but those geniuses chose the wrong path and therefore achieved nothing in their lives. Linda excused herself from him and asked him if he really thought she could be a wizard because during the test it showed a negative result. He told her that the testing equipment must have had problems, but she still couldn't believe it. He noticed that Linda's manner was very high and her learning ability and intelligence were also high. He knows that to recruit Linda, he had to hand over 400000 in bribes and even a down payment, but he also knows that nobody would understand his actions right now. Being doubtful is understandable, and they are just doing what they are told because he was paying. Barbara told Linda that there was no need to be doubtful and just follow her master's orders. He saw that Barbara's physical ability was very high, and her aura was strong. Then he remembered that Barbara came with Nicole Brown to train in sword aura and had a special talent. He believed Barbara almost wasted his life by doing only labor, and he doesn't know why. However, Barbara listens to him well. Then he asked them if they chose their outfits, and told them they were not in the barracks but in the royal palace, which is one hundred kilometers away from the barracks. He noticed that everyone was somewhat frenzied. He thinks it was probably their first time in a luxury clothing store. Then someone told him that he'd pick it, and he told him that it fit him well. Eric Jones holds significant political power, his administrative power is high, and his trade is being a smooth talker. Eric tells him that he shall follow his lord's orders. He thinks Eric's abilities could be more useful and rarer than magic or swordsmanship. Then he told everyone not to look at the price tag and choose what fits them best. He knows that even if they have talent, if they aren't nurtured they are useless so they will start training outside their military bases and receive tailored education. Also, what they wear needs to fit their new environment. Hours later they had open mouths when they saw the place. They asked him if it was where they were going to stay. He replied that it was where they would stay, and the butlers and servants were already employed. So from now on, they don't need to focus on anything but their education. While he was sending money, he told them that, apart from the down payment, he would pay them right now in advance. Then he explained to them that their monthly salary is 20 million lutes, and their annual salary is 240 million lutes, regardless of their past status. The terms of their contracts are all the same. Then they all told him that they would try their absolute best to exceed his expectations. He told them that if they proved that his instincts weren't wrong, obviously their pay would increase. He understood if their development was slow, even if they gave it their all. So they should work hard to avoid disappointing him. He also told them not to make him uncomfortable by fussing or arguing, to which they all agreed. Then he told them that if someone offered a bribe to betray him, they shouldn't hesitate to tell him. If they did, he would give them twice the amount that was offered. This made them shocked and confused. He planned that from then on, that residence would be full of people recruited by him. He knew that it was his job to make it a place where their talents would prosper. Also, it may seem like wasting money, but for him, it was an investment. Invest assessment in obtaining quality human resources. Later, he was walking in the street with Arcia while thinking that when he confronts Cedric, he'll need a place to keep his mother safe, kind of like a safety jail, 
making him wonder if he should look for one before returning to the unit. But then he peeked behind him and saw someone spying on him. Arcia caught and grabbed the man's neck. Then he cheerfully said hello to the man. A few days ago, he didn't know if people found out that he was collecting what he called ordinary people, but Cedric called him directly and said that he needed to mingle with people like him. He thinks that the dumb bastard Cedric was basically admitting that he was watching his every move. While the man asked him, What is it? He just asked the man how he found him there and told him that it seemed like he teleported from the royal palace without an escort. He grabbed the knife from the man's waist while telling the man that he was pretty sure he had him detached. But the man told him that he didn't know what he was saying. He looked at Arcia while telling the man that he knew that he was the rat that Cedric planted. Then, Arcia slammed the man hard on the ground while he was asking him if he wanted to die or answer his questions. The man shook in fear when he realized that increasing his aura was doing nothing and wondered if Arcia was an aura expert. But then the man figured out that she was not just any woman, and if he didn't talk, he'd die. So he told him that he'd say anything. A few minutes later, he told the man that he got it and that he found where he was by using Cedric's rat at the teleporting office. He tapped his sword to the man's neck and guessed that Bertaud is telling the truth because of his fear, confusion, and understanding condition. It made him wonder if he should say some lies to scare them. Then he told Bertaud that he already knew about how Cedric was finding information about him. But there was something interesting. He pulled away his knife while he was telling him that he was just listening to Cedric's orders and not really opposing him. So he felt like he was just reluctantly finding information. Bertaud fearfully looked at Arcia and asked him if he is already ready to go against his master Cedric. Bertaud was about to ask him how he knew it, but he pointed his knife at Bertaud's head and told him that it was enough. Then asked if he wanted to live, to which Bertaud replied yes. He told Bertaud that he should be on his side. Then he pierced the tip of his knife into Bertaud's forehead, while telling him that he doesn't really order anything difficult. He should just give him an update every day, so he should say that he was just doing what he normally does and report that there is nothing special about him. Then he asked Bertaud if he understood, to which Bertaud fearfully replied yes. Later, in Lord Lawrence's castle, Cedric shouted and asked if Sir Metz was in jail, for spying. The man replied yes and then explained that unfortunately, Metz was caught in Adrian's room, causing many problems that made Cedric angry. He thought it happened because he had ignored his father's orders not to spy on Adrian. He had to get scolded by his father who had been trying to figure out what was happening after the war. Cedric told his spy that he didn't want to do it, but he didn't have a choice. Then he ordered Bertaud to keep a close eye on Adrian until his father's anger subsided. Bertaud replied yes without knowing that Adrian was listening to everything. Adrian smiled knowing that Cedric's remaining spies have been punished and imprisoned just like in Dalton's case. He told Arcia that conveying his lordship wouldn't be easy. The town gathering went smoothly, and Cedric recruited twenty people with innate special talents. Eric and Alicia, the former administrator of Allies and the Half-Elf would take care of the gifted academy without any problems. Adrian knew that everyone was working hard, so he couldn't just sit around. He entered the game, and saw that he was level 159. He excitedly said that if he leveled up one more time, he could become a sixth circle wizard. However, he was shocked when a system warning popped up, telling him that an emergency had occurred, and their division commander had issued an emergency order. He logged out, knowing that his current location was on the front lines, and he realized that if something had happened there, it would be a huge problem. He came out of his room and asked Miller panically what had happened. Miller told him that the Croizen Empire Sky Fortress had crossed the border, and they were currently trying to gather details, making him wonder if everything had been calm before the storm. They all gathered in the meeting room, and Otis told them that once the local forces had been ordered to stand by, they should put the troops on the Leviathan train so they could be dispatched at any time. For some time, all their resting and eating would be done inside the train. He was worried that Otis clocked out earlier, but was relieved that he was there. Then Commander Otis told them that from that moment on, spatial coordinate interference had begun across the entire front line bordering the Croizen Empire. They should not even think about teleporting because it was just suicide. While he was thinking that if Otis wasn't there, they would have had to plan all that without a commander, but it was a good thing that the Croizen attacked during the day. Then Otis looked at him while saying that from now on, 
he'll cut off all personal communication between troops except for colonel and above ranks, so they should only use a radio to communicate. He told him not to think that he was an exception, so he should be careful. He smiled, knowing that the warning was directed toward him, but he told Otis in his brain that he won't stop him from playing games. Then Otis shouted that it was a war, so everyone should be ready at all times, and they all replied yes. He stood up in silence, knowing that it was truly the war, but a moment later the system showed him that he has reached level 160 and have subjugated the name Monster Tazit, the twin head ogre. He looked at the fading ogre while wondering if it's how he hit the sixth circle and thinks that it was worth playing his game. Then he remembers Harmon asking him if he's really playing a game and told him that if he gets caught playing a game while everyone else is banned from using their devices, but he just told Harmon that he gets it and ordered him to command the unit. He feels bad for Harmon, but he knows that it is more important to him. Then the system shows that he has received 10 trillion loot and also shows him that the money he receives will be kept in the Alicia Union Bank. Then he hears something on his side and saw a huge eagle while the system shows him that he has received the subsupporter supersonic Black Eagle. He knows that there shouldn't be a subsupporter in that game, but there is the combat support eagle that an archer could have, and there is not enough information to look at. Then he logged out, thinking that he might be better and more accurate at finding information and reality than in the game system. But when he sat up, there was nothing there, so he went outside guessing that maybe it was outside. He walks outside to look around and thinks that a big black eagle will appear like Arcea did that time, and it would cause chaos. Then he searches their surroundings when Arcea notices something and points in the sky while telling him that it is there. It flew down, making the knights panic and worriedly tell him to dodge, but when it flapped its wings, the knights were thrown away, leaving him and Arcea standing still. It glared at him, making him stunned in surprise, then it bowed to him respectfully. The knight was about to attack it, but he raised his hand to stop them and saw that it was a chimera that had the bones and leather of a black dragon. It has a body that was not easily damaged even by an aura blade with a very high recovery rate, and its basic option is a suicide dive. But he noticed that it only had one skill, which is the shared vision. He patted its head, thinking that just like how Arcea gets stronger with him, he needs to know how and under what conditions it needs to get extra skills. He thinks that the condition is likely to clear a quest. He was not sure how the suicide dive was helpful, but he knew that shared vision could be helpful because it's like getting information at the speed of sound. One of the knights worriedly called him, making him shock, and asked him what it was, making him realize that he was so focused on the black eagle that he didn't notice people gathering. He cleared his throat, guessing that it can't be helped. Then he extended his hand and asked the eagle if it wants to go with him. They gently put its beak on his hand to agree and then he hugged it gently, which it accepted, making the knights confusedly ask why it wasn't attacking and if it looked like they were sharing their affection. On the other hand, he shyly wonders why he even does that really cringe acting and feels like it's going to bite him back later. After the war started, the war situation did not lead to tedious regional small-scale wars but expanded to the entire western border, which was an all-out war. Thanks to it, his brigade is making a debut and the communication network is cut off so he can't log on to his game. Suddenly, one of the knights reports to him that the Croizan Empire's platoon of vanguards is approaching, but he tells the knight not to panic and fall back to reform formations. Then, he tells Biliam to lead the vanguards, to which the knight replies yes. He calmly drinks his teeth, thinking that even though it is just a game, but after fighting the monsters, it feels like he can't die that easily. While Harmon is looking at him, he asked Harmon what it was, and Harmon replied it was nothing. But when he looked back at the screen again, he was shocked to see that the enemy vanguards were going to attack. So he immediately ordered the second battalion to deploy the energy shield. Then the battalions immediately deployed the energy shield as per his order. Then the enemy launched an attack toward the shield, and when it hit their shield, it made a loud explosion, making them inside move to their positions. He was shocked that an attack from that far away was unbelievably strong and noticed that it wasn't just a test. Also, he knows that if there is no seventh circle magician or higher, it is pretty obvious who is going to win in a fight. Then he asked the knights about the situation. The knight replied that the second battalion's energy shield was down and needed 90 seconds to recharge. 
He believed that the energy shield meant to protect everyone got destroyed in a single attack from the enemy vanguards. He mentioned this to Archduke Lucas, regretting not providing them with magic equipment. However, he knew there was no need to envy the vanguards, for if he reached the maximum level in his game, soon he would be at the ninth circle and hold the title of Grand Master at the eighth circle. Harman told him they had dodged a bullet, and if it weren't for him, they would have been in trouble. He humbly attributed it to his good luck. Glancing at his monitor again, he noticed that the enemy's attack force size wasn't significantly different from theirs. The real issue was the size of their fortress, which was small. He knew that the Croizan Empire had two sky fortresses, but they were considerably smaller than theirs, likely mass-produced for invasion. Harman mentioned that unless they had missed some information, it was the enemy's first time deploying them. Vanguards were on the ground and there were fortified fortresses in the sky. The ground was at a complete stalemate, and it seemed the variables lay elsewhere. As he watched the surveillance, he commented that it was intense. Then he saw the system indicating the enemy's weapon detachment in progress, and their bridge. Suddenly, their enemy's fortress collapsed, leaving them puzzled. Something had fallen, and their machines attacked the falling objects inside the fortress. The knights laughed thinking their enemy's fortress had been destroyed. However, he was shocked to see it overloading with magical power, leaving him confused. Suddenly, he realized something and urgently ordered them to send a message to the fortress, shouting he warned them of an imminent suicide attack. Then a piece of the enemy fortress landed on theirs, causing a massive explosion. Before the explosion, in the sky fortress, the army was panicking upon hearing about a suicide bombing. The captain ordered everyone to quickly initiate a retreat, fire anti-aircraft rounds and retrieve all personal firearms. However, Adrian noticed that it was going to crash, so he immediately used his great shield power to protect their fortress. When the enemy attacked and hit the shield he created, their fortress remained safe. Although their fortress was safe, Adrian felt sick due to the incredible shockwave. He knew that if he hadn't used the artifacts in time, they all would have been blown away. He looked up, wondering about their sky fortress, and felt relieved that it hadn't crashed because they had retreated quickly. He also realized that if their allied forces sky fortress had crashed, the remaining forces from the enemy's sky fortress would have massacred them. He then ordered the army to check the status of the vanguards and take care of the soldiers, to which they replied that they understood. A moment later, Otis happily praised him and thanked him for his hard work. Otis told Adrian that his performance was excellent that day. Adrian replied that Otis flattered him, but Otis asked him what flatter meant. Adrian explained that he meant Otis was giving him praise. Otis then told him that if Adrian hadn't noticed the self-destruction, the damages would have been astronomical. Suicide bombing attacks were attempted on other battlefields at the same time, but their unit was the only place that noticed the abnormality beforehand and successfully guarded the fortress. Otis also informed Adrian that he had told the local commander that today's victory was thanks to him, so he would receive a decent reward. Adrian thanked Otis, and Otis humbly told him that it was the superior's duty to ensure that their subordinates receive appropriate recognition when they make a contribution. Adrian smiled, wondering why Earl Otis was surprisingly reasonable. Then Otis mentioned that there were some strange rumors going around about Adrian. Adrian asked what rumors Otis was referring to. Otis replied that he heard Adrian had tamed a mysterious giant eagle. Adrian confirmed this and said that the way he communicated with the black eagle was truly mysterious. He added that he didn't know about the communicating part but found the eagle fascinating. Otis happily patted his shoulder and said that communicating was all right, as animals understanding them would be quite a wonder. Another man chimed in, saying that if it's a large black eagle, it's probably a species called Altair from the holy city Everhill. They are rare birds born with a high level of mana and are said to be able to fly for five kilometers at a time. Adrian replied that he didn't know about it but secretly knew it to be true. The man probably told them that it is said that once tamed, they will never betray their master and will not hesitate to risk their lives to protect them, making him act amazed and glad that Archmage Lucas made it based on a real-life species. Because if he had given him a flashy sub-supporter for no reason, people would have annoyed him, asking what it was so it wouldn't have been easy to manage. Otis happily shouted that if that is so, the black eagle is no different from a dog and called it a dog eagle, making everyone in the room laugh. 
He asked Otis if he could use the personal communication now that their enemy had retreated, and Otis agreed, telling him that he should consider it his reward. This made him brighten up, and he thanked Otis so much because he can finally access Chronicles Online, and there's no way he'd miss a chance to level up. Two weeks after the start of the war, someone called Bilayam, who was in the suit, told him that he doubted they would show themselves while climbing down the mountains with lots of surveillance. It could be a trap, so they shouldn't stay too close and should start fighting at a distance. To this, he replied that they would do as he said. Bilayam thinks no one would have listened to Adrian in the past. Then he asked his comrade if they heard it and told them not to blindly trust visible signals from the radar and follow Adrian's instructions. Then move while keeping their distance, to which the army together replied yes, making Bilayam notice that everyone has changed a lot in just two weeks. Later, the enemy surrounded them, and Bilayam told everyone that it was a trap. Then he ordered them to retreat while keeping their enemy in check. He didn't expect that they would come from underground, which is the radar's only blind spot. But he was glad they listened to their brigadier, which is Adrian's warning, and stayed on their guard because if they had approached without a plan, they would have been wiped out in an instant. Then he looked around and saw his comrades struggling because they were outnumbered. He thinks it was fortunate that they avoided total annihilation, but their situation isn't looking good, and they have to wait for support while blocking attacks from the vanguards, which are twice as many as their allies. Also, he knows that it will take at least five minutes for reinforcements to arrive, but it was impossible to hold out without taking any damage. Suddenly, Adrian told him to push forward, making him shocked. But then they heard a loud explosion from behind. Then someone asked them if they were all right and reported to him that ten vanguards directly under the command of Division Commander Earl Otis have arrived, making him wonder how they were already there, and if Adrian knew that would happen and requested support in advance. But then Adrian asked him if he came out for a walk and why he wasn't attacking, then told him that the enemies are having their backs toward the mountain range, making him unable to believe that computer's voice again, and really doesn't know who it is that came out for a walk. But Adrian just told him that it was not easy to get reinforcements, so they should defeat at least five units while they are at it. Meanwhile, in the meeting room, one of the men asked if they heard that under Adrian's command, they killed five enemy vanguards. Another man replied that Adrian is incredible. Not only he predicted the surprise attack but also turned a crisis into an opportunity. What's more, while other units are suffering, Brigadier Adrian's unit is steadily making contributions. Otis thought it was a coincidence at first, but with the way things unfolded, it was no longer the case. Remember, they say Adrian, the prodigy of Viscount Lawrence, became an idiot after overcoming a near-death crisis from poison. But the truth is, Adrian was a sleeping dragon who had been hiding his power all this time. Then he asked the people in the room if Brigadier Adrian is a similar age to Michelle. He told them that if Adrian's family has given up on him, he'd like to bring Adrian in, which shocked the people in the room. One of them told him that he heard Brigadier Adrian already has a lover and brought her to the battlefield. Otis asked if that was a problem when all that matters is if Michelle can become Adrian's mistress. One of the men reminded him that Adrian is a game addict. Still, he told them that it's still better than being addicted to drugs, alcohol, and women. This made the people in the room notice that Otis had already chosen Adrian as his son-in-law, and Otis won't change his mind no matter what they say now. One of the men asked Otis if it isn't better to keep an eye on Adrian for a little while longer, and the other man agreed, telling him that considering Michelle's fiery personality, if she hears about it, they would all disappear. Otis said that Michelle does have a bit of a temper which the room agreed with, so he told them to stop talking about Michelle and ordered them to send a performance report to the Corps Command. Also, be sure to include how great Brigadier Adrian's contribution was. Later, Bilayam asked him if he had a moment. He tapped Arcea's shoulder and replied that he does, but unless it's something important, he should keep it short. He noticed that Billiam's demeanor changed from curiosity and vigilance to favorable anticipation and he wondered if it was because he saved Bilayam in battle. Bilayam asked him why he's hiding his strength, making him unable to believe that Bilayam is straightforward. Then Bilayam told him that many of their vassals are worried about the future of the territory. If Cedric becomes a lord like him, there will surely be a crisis. So he believes that Cedric does not have the quality qualification to be a lord. If he has any intention of competing with his brother, 
he would like to support him with all his might. He noticed that his magic glasses didn't show any change in Billiam's condition, which means Billiam isn't lying. He knows that Billiam is one of his father's closest aides, making him wonder if Billiam perhaps received some kind of instruction in advance, or is he acting like this simply because he was his benefactor? He told Billiam that he was thankful for his kind words, but he'll pretend he didn't hear it, leaving Bam shocked and stunned. He tapped Billiam, whose condition changed to disappointment, noticing that Billiam is surprisingly naive, and he was too rash with his remarks. Because he knows that no matter how much they try to restrict the information going to Cedric, he can act hastily when there may be more surveillance systems that he doesn't know about. He also knows that it's entirely his job to get rid of Anna and Cedric so he has no intention of sharing that joy with others. Then he peeked back at Billiam, thinking that for now, he will keep in mind that there are people who are purely concerned about the well-being of the territory. Then he remembered that he heard before that he'd be awarded with a medal after what happened and wonders if it shouldn't be that big of a deal. The next day, someone told him that having made many contributions, the second son of the Lawrence family, Adrian, shall be bestowed with a second-class golden lion medal. Then the man called Kalitz van Reinhardt, the twenty-third king of the kingdom of Reinhardt, while a swarm of people were cheering for him, making him know that every piece of Vanguard's equipment is worth as much as a fighter jet. But he didn't expect what he did would be so highly regarded. He thinks Otis must have chosen him to be the figurehead to accelerate the progress of the war, and told the man that it was his greatest honor, and he will cherish it for the rest of his life. Then he tried to smile confidently while the reporter and people captured them, making him sure that Cedric will probably go crazy if Cedric sees it. Meanwhile, in the mansion of the Lawrence family, Cedric slammed his fist on the table in anger and shouted that everyone is talking about that bastard Adrian, and if he had participated in the war, all those merits would have been his. Then he asked Anna what about his father? And Anna replied that his father is staying with that lowly woman. Cedric told her that Rayford seems to be spending more and more time with that woman these days and asked her why she isn't doing anything, but she frustratingly asked him back if she should poison Rayford too, making Cedric call his mother. Shouting, Anna told him not to raise his voice and that Adrian is the reason his father is with that woman, so she thinks his father is determined to protect the woman while Adrian is away on the battlefield from him and her. He asked her if it was true that Adrian will completely cut off his ties with their family after returning from the war, and she agreed, telling him that it was the reason why Adrian must be desperate too, since Adrian needs to find a way to make a living by himself. It must be why Adrian has thought of the war as a great opportunity because if Adrian makes a big contribution, Adrian may be able to receive a title, but still, Adrian isn't even his competitor. And she told him that his mother will make sure of it making him think that everything is as his mother says, knowing that behind them is their maternal grandfather, and most of the Lawrence Viscounty is under his mother's control, so his father is merely a proxy who momentarily rules over that land until he hands it over to him. Making him wonder why and remember looking at Adrian when they were young, but Adrian is the only one getting praises, leaving him behind in the dark. He heard people saying that Adrian was a prodigy, making him pissed in annoyance and thinks that Adrian has definitely been reduced to a good-for-nothing bastard after they attempted to poison him, making him wonder how Adrian keeps getting on his nerves, and he shouted Adrian's name, who was busy waving his hand at the crowd of people. Seven weeks, forty-eight days since the war started. He happily told the vanguards to have an energy drink before they go out and pour a drink one by one. Then he heard one of the vanguards tell another man that he felt really refreshed after drinking it, and the man agreed, saying that other brigades had become sluggish as the war dragged on, but their brigade was still lively. This made him think about how precious that energy drink was, even though it was just a diluted elixir containing a single drop of that legendary medicine. He felt it was a bit of a waste, but he had to do it for the war to end quickly. Bilayam told him that they would go scouting, and he told Bilayam not to push themselves too hard. But then one of the vanguards called him and said that the division commander was looking for him, which made him wonder why again. Before leaving, he gave something to the Black Eagle, and it immediately flew away. He tiredly told Harmon that Otis had been summoning him more frequently these days. Harmon laughingly told him that it must mean Otis trusts him a lot and asked if that wasn't good. He remained silent, knowing that even though it was bothersome to be summoned by a great aristocrat, there was nothing he could do. A moment later, 
He was looking in front of him in confusion because he saw that the other unit commanders were also there. He wondered if Otis had summoned all the high-ranking commanders in the division. He thought that if it was related to the battle, Otis could have sent him a message instead, making him wonder if Otis had something important to announce that couldn't be made public. Then Otis appeared and warmly welcomed all his guests. Otis told them to rejoice because they wouldn't have to hear that sickening gunfire anymore since the end of the war would be declared soon, which surprised him. Otis told them that the end of the war would be declared soon, and the foreign ministers of both countries were currently holding a meeting. It seemed that those Croys and guys had no intention of going to an all-out war in the first place. It was a large-scale conflict, but in the end, it was a local war that was no different from an annual event, making everyone in the room sigh with relief. One man wondered why they would do such a thing, and the other man replied that it was obviously to strengthen their imperial power. He remembered that it was the same in his past life, and he guessed his nation just didn't have any luck when it came to its relationships with neighboring countries. Then he asked Otis about the vanguards who have been dispatched. Otis replied that until the declaration of the end of the war is given, they must continue that war game, making him upset to hear it because he knows that it was always the subordinates who died due to their superiors' decisions. But then Otis told him to relax and asked him if he didn't receive a golden lion medal as the spoils of war. Then he told him that his reward certainly won't be small if the war ends like this, so he should just savor that moment now. It made him smile, thinking that Otis was right, and he wonders since when has he been so virtuous. Then he cheered his drinks to Otis, thinking that instead of worrying about others, he should focus on his future since he has to go back to his family after the war ends. He needs to level up even more. The next day, Bill Iam told him that he still thinks it was a good thing, making him silent while Era is eating on the side. Bill Iam asked him what would happen if their country and the Croizan Empire engaged in an all-out war. He told him that one hundred sky fortresses and tens of thousands of vanguards would have annihilated everything, and an unimaginable catastrophe would have taken place. He told Biliam that he should have taken some more rest and asked him why he came there. Then he opened his arms to Arcia and gave a cookie to Biliam, telling him to have some of it. Biliam asked him what it was, and he replied that considering it was given by Count Otis, it should be quite precious. Biliam told him that he already felt that before but he was truly different from other nobles. Not only did he feel truly sorry for the sacrifice of his soldiers, but he would even keep guard of the command center like it while his men are resting. But he knows that, of course, he would be different from the common nobles since he was a very ordinary citizen in his past life, and he was there to wait until he can access the game. But then Bill I am told him that at the same time, he still possesses the composure and dignity of a true noble. He told Biliam that he thinks he got that part wrong, but Biliam just asked him if he wasn't drinking black tea even when he saw enemy troops rushing in, and he thinks that is impossible without absolute trust in himself. The subordinates were able to shake off the tension as they saw his composure. Also, everyone in the 232nd Independence Brigade completely trusts him. He knows what Biliam is trying to say now, and Biliam is trying to bring up again that he'll support him to be the successor and there he was wondering why Biliam complimented him all of a sudden when he was about to remind Biliam of what he said last time. Biliam suddenly kneeled down, making him surprised, but Biliam just told him that he has got trustworthy men around them, so no one can come close, and they have also checked for surveillance devices, so he doesn't have to worry. He looked up hearing Biliam's words and noticed that outside were vanguards guarding him, making him realize that Biliam is serious because all of them are from his father's side. He told Biliam that he knows that he has taken precautions, but that kind of behavior may be more noticeable. Biliam told him that it was exactly why they came there when everyone is resting. He, who was a lowly subject, Gilbert Biliam, would like to serve him, Adrian Lawrence, the second young master of the Lawrence family, as his lord from today on. He asked Biliam if it could be that the other knights outside are thinking of doing the same thing, to which Biliam replied yes, making him silent. Then he replied, all right, making Biliam look up at him in excitement. However, he told Biliam that he has a condition, and Biliam asked him what it was. He told him that he is to act normally until he tells him otherwise. Biliam asked him if it wouldn't be better to gather power as quickly as possible and suggested that even if he built up his power there right now, the size of their forces would be nothing to scoff at. 
He replied that it would be nothing to scoff at, but not enough for them to win, and he had a plan, so they should follow his orders. Bilayam bowed and replied that he will. He asked Bilayam how many knights are willing to follow him like he did, and Bilayam replied that first of all, there are five vanguards there, and the remaining knights number around thirty, so if they gather the people from the territory, their size will at least be doubled, making him think that it was not bad, and there were more people for him to work with. Then he slowly stood up while praising Bilayam. However, before he left, Bilayam told him that he had one more thing to tell him, making him confused. Bilayam told him that his father is planning to assign Sir Pesius to him, and he thinks it would be a good idea to recruit him in advance. This surprised him, knowing that Pesius was originally the vice commander of the Knight Order of Lawrence, and with his superior skills, he had virtually no rivals among all the Aura experts, with the only exception being the Knight Commander. However, he thought Pesius had already left the Order due to family political fights centered around Anna making him wonder if that kind of person is really coming back. Bilayam told him that maybe when Pesius returns, many knights who have been remaining neutral will change their minds. He knows that Pesius was a typical warrior and a very popular knight. In other words, there is room for power expansion through him, perhaps enough to be on par with Anna and Cedric's forces. So he thinks recruiting Pesius is not a bad idea at all, especially when it comes to a valuable talent that he can use outside of the family. Then he told Bilayam that he thinks he needs to meet Pesius as soon as possible and asked Bilayam if he could arrange it secretly. This made Bilayam shocked, and he promised to look into it. He came out of the room thinking that power is good. However, his top priority is not to build his own power but rather to clear the next lucky encounter quest and swore that he was going to form his seventh circle today. But he was swimming in his blood with Arcia and Black Eagle when the system showed him that he had died and he should try again after recovering his experience points. Before that situation happened where both Arcia and Adrian died in the game, he was loudly asking what was happening. Then he called Arcia to help him, which Arcia immediately obeyed. All that time, while clearing lucky encounters and reaching level 200, he never experienced death. He knows that it's normal to die and overcome struggles in a game, but if he dies there while sharing senses with his real-world self, the pain will be unimaginable. He noticed that Arcia always stood still against any enemies, but she's being pushed back right now. He always put his safety first in every fight, but when Arcia and Black Eagle were slashed by his enemy which is a death knight, everything collapsed. Then he noticed that it was not just an aura master because the enemy also had a named boss with quest buff and an abnormally strong body, which means that one is on a different level. The last thing he saw was the system showing him that he died and he should try again when he recovers his experience points. Then the system showed him that he was being resurrected in a nearby village. He was sitting and enduring his pain. He thinks that the senses sharing system is problematic because he can't even twist in pain since people are everywhere. He realized that it was too easy until now. Then he used his resurrection scroll, and the system showed him that his support, Arcia, had been revived. Arcia apologized to him but he just asked her if she was okay and if it didn't hurt her. She replied that it did, but her senses in the game are far lower than his, so she can hold it in. He sighed in relief and thanked goodness that she was not badly hurt. Then he remembered that he recruited her without thinking because of her tanking stats, but as he got closer to her, he was embarrassed, hiding behind her small body. So he swore that he would try to change his combat style and thinks that if she was enduring his pain, but then he told himself that he would have to change it, in the end. He realized that fighting the Death Knight showed him a clear limit to their combat style. Arcia blocks the enemy's movement, and Crowy, which is his Black Eagle blocks their sight or sneak attack to support Arcia, and he does massive damage from the back with magic. It worked out since they are overgeared, but it has a limit against enemies like Death Knights who can constantly keep up with Arcia. The problem is the long time between each attack. His casting time is delaying the main damage, which means the only way to keep away enemies between casts is Black Eagle's tackle. He looked at Arcia knowing that her defense worked against the Death Knight, and she ended up overpowered by him. But she can surely block one attack, and if there was one more DPS that could support her while he cast, their current combat style would work. But he knows that he can't drag someone else into the lucky encounter quest, so the only solutions he can think of now are three. 
One is to use low-level magic circles to reduce casting time and increase your firing rate. Two is to use Crowy as a fighter instead of just his hit and run support. Three is for Arcia to stop using only a shield and start using a sword to deal damage. Then he realized that the first option was weakening himself, so it was best to change things with Arcia and Crowy. He planned to look closely into it while recovering his experience points. He told her that it wouldn't be easy, but they should give it a try. Arcia agreed. However, in the second battle against the Death Knight Pascal, the system showed him that he died and needed to recover his experience points to try again. This made him frustrated, and he asked how it was even possible. He resurrected Arcia once again, and she apologized to him. He told her not to apologize because it was his problem. This time he tried using Arcia and Black Eagle more actively in the fight, but Crowy had a hard time facing the Death Knight directly and died within a minute after the fight started. He died within three minutes, and Arcia followed after a minute. He thought the biggest problem in that fight was probably Crowy dying too quickly. Crowy couldn't deal much damage to the target, but the diversion helped. This means that to maintain their combat style, Crowy's survival is necessary. He wondered if he should make and equip Crowy with a chest plate. Then he thought he would have to try something and reassured himself that there was no need to be nervous because things that are not working will eventually work. Also, it was just a test to reach the seventh circle. Still, in the third battle, he died which made him punch the wall continuously in anger. He said it wasn't too bad, it was made in a hurry, but it did its job. It allowed them to fight the Death Knight Pascal longer, which allowed them to see his pattern. He told her that they started to see Pascal's patterns, which was good, so they should try again after recovering their experience points. She agreed. In the fifth battle, Pascal couldn't believe them and asked if he was fighting against a bunch of acrobats. Pascal told them that it was real talent to be able to amuse an undead like him and asked why he didn't change his approach. He just told Pascal that he must be confused and asked if he had heard about the human bomber. Then Crowy lifted him up, and he attacked Pascal using his magic, and he also shouted at Pascal to die while continuously attacking Pascal. Pascal blocked their attacks using his sword, while Arcia was running toward him. He laughingly shouted that it was nice without noticing that Crowy was exhausted. Crowy slowly fell to the ground with him, making him confused. Then Crowy put him down in front of Pascal. He told Pascal that it was nice to see him down there, and he fearfully greeted Pascal while Crowy collapsed on the ground, exhausted. Then Pascal killed him, and the system showed that he had died. In the ninth battle, he noticed that they tried different formations this time. Pascal asked him why a wizard was in the front line, and told him that it was fun but he noticed that this time the damage dealt went up by much more than last time. Casting magic while dodging Pascal's attacks was the biggest problem, but he managed to last 25 minutes, so he thinks it was possible. He planned to try again with items focused on their reflexes rather than casting and tried to be an evasive wizard that no one wants to be. Then the system showed that he died once more in the tenth battle. He was dodging while using his magic to attack. Pascal attacked him, but he avoided it. When Pascal went on a rampage, he managed to slip through his attacks. Then he used his magic power together with Arcia to attack Pascal. They hit Pascal, but when Pascal raised his sword and swung it at them, they were both thrown away, defeated. But he smiled, thinking that it was it, and that battle gave him assurance. He tried to be an evasive wizard, and it decreased his damage, but allowed him to survive on his own, which allowed other members to attack freely resulting in a 62-minute long battle. Damage dealt to the Death Knight by 84%, so he knows that he can do it if he keeps trying. He took off the game device and noticed that he had exceeded the connection time limit. He stretched his body while telling Arcia that he thought it would be over after reaching level 200, but they were being held back at an unexpected place. But then he felt something on his shoulder and told Arcia that he felt like the world is moving slower and asked if he was sick. Arcia replied that he experienced and repeated death and resurrection many times, so she thinks it was normal for his sight to change. He asked her if she was the same as he, and she replied that she can't really tell, but she felt that she was stronger because her body's strength is the same as yesterday, but she feels like she was way stronger than before. She told him that it was the strength that was only obtained through experience. He thinks he was used to it now, 
but Arcia's response was definitely not from an artificially created homunculus. If time passes and she experiences much more, she will be no different from a human being. She asked him if he had any orders, and he replied no. Then he told her that he was going to sleep, so she should rest too, and they should try again when he can get back on, to which she replied yes. In their twelfth battle, the damage dealt to the Death Knight is 75%. In their thirteenth battle, their damage dealt to the Death Knight is 85%. In their fourteenth battle, their damage dealt to the Death Knight is 91%. In their fifteenth battle, their damage dealt to the Death Knight is 89%. In the sixteenth battle, their damage dealt to the Death Knight is 93%. In their seventeenth battle, their damage dealt to the Death Knight is 98%. And in their eighteenth battle, their damage dealt to the Death Knight is one hundred percent, which means they defeated Pascal. He smiled tiredly, raised both hands in the air because of excitement, and told his team that they had won. Then the system showed him that he completed the Lucky Encounter Quest Level 7. Then they entered the eighth floor of Manuel Lucas's Magic Tower, and he noticed that the seventh floor alone was several times larger than the previous floor, but that one is the size of the Royal Library. Then he asked if most of those decorations were made with game graphics because it was good, but then someone told him that they were all real, making him shocked. He immediately swung his staff toward that someone, wondering if the test to achieve the seventh circle is not over yet, but Arcia smilingly told him that it was fine, so he put down his staff, unable to believe that Arcia would smile like that. Then he looked at the man in the center of the magic circle, and wondered if he was a fairy or a grandfather one. Then he wondered if he was a new supporter but was confused about why he looked so familiar. But then he figured out something and shouted to ask if he was Archduke Lucas. But the old man replied that his name is Chester and he was the manager of the fate and also a trace of Manuel Lucas, making him confusedly wonder what he meant by the manager of fate and more than that what he meant by trace. Chester explained it simply. He was an artificial intelligence created by replicating Manuel Lucas's memories but he was focused on a trace of Archduke Lucas. He thinks that even if it was a clone, he encountered a being who is no different from his savior. Let alone be happy, his head is complicated, and it would be great if Chester showed favor to him, but if it's the opposite, it'll be hard for him to respond, since at least in the Hollywood system, he would be an omnipotent being no less than a god. He sweated, wondering if Chester was going to take back what he gave him but Chester told him that there's no need to be that nervous. He told Chester that to think he'd be able to have an independent conversation like this, he doesn't seem like a program made with artificial intelligence at all. Chester replied, of course. Then he explained that he may not have a soul, but he does have data containing a person's life. He told Chester that although Lucas's body couldn't win against aging and died, at least his spirit remains in that virtual world. In a sense, it was eternal life. Chester told him that it can be seen that way, which is why Manuel Lucas created the Hollywood system in the first place. But that system isn't perfect because memories that were turned into data may be lost in the transfer or deteriorate. Also, more than anything, he can't see him as being alive because he just exists like a specter. Manuel Lucas thought it, even if a clone memory had consciousness, it was not his true self. If he was interested in eternal life through memory duplication— Lucas wouldn't have wandered around in virtual space like this but would create a homunculus like Garcia and engrave his memories there. He had a suspicion that Manuel Lucas's ultimate goal was to take over his body, but he was glad that it doesn't seem to be the case. He asked Chester if he may ask him why he appeared then he told Chester that honestly, he was flustered by the difficult situation on the previous floor, and he wondered if there would be any restrictions or compulsory duties given to him. Chester slid down his staff and a system appeared in front of him, showing him that he has granted the usage of Hollywood system administrator authority for five times. Chester told him that the fate that he acquired is Manuel Lucas's everything, so naturally, various authorities are included in it, and there are limitations, as the fate hasn't been fully resolved yet, but he will be able to exercise his authority as he wishes in the future. He asked Chester what he can do with it and Chester replied that he will be able to exercise administrator authority over all programs based in the Hollywood system, which is a virtual reality system, making him shocked because he knows that the Hollywood system only exists with features of virtual reality and is similar to Earth's internet. 
In other words, it means that he can control all the information connected online as he wants. But then, Chester told him that he must adhere to four rules when exercising administrator authority. First, administrator privileges cannot be used for Chronicle Online, which is bound with Lucas's fate. Second, he is prohibited from directly accessing another person's brain. Third, he is prohibited from stealing other people's property. And fourth, he was prohibited from exercising authority that directly has a negative impact on the world. He was wondering what it was since Chester said rules, but he realized that it was pretty logical. Then he asked Chester if, by any chance, it was also possible to launder the source of wealth acquired through fate, and Chester replied that it was not difficult because there are a few methods. But what he recommends is to create investment and stock trading records in the online currency market. Then he asked Chester about the possibility of getting caught through investigation, and Chester replied that the probability of detection is extremely close to 0%. It was not just about manipulating the ledger, but it was about revising all the relevant information and making it appear as if it was a completely real event based on the records. He told Chester that he'd like to use administrator authority, and Chester replied that he understood. Then explained to him that the current assets held are 12.625 trillion loots, and his assets increased the moment he opened the treasure chest on the eighth floor of the magic tower. Then he asked him if he would like him to organize it too, to which he replied yes. Then Chester asked him if he had any additional requests. He told Chester that Arcia needs a legitimate family registered, and while they were at it, it would be better to put her as coming from the holy city Everhill. Chester told him that it was possible and he shall make a family register that says all Arcia family members died, and she was currently an orphan, making him notice that Chester was no different from a genie from the magic lamp. He asked Chester if his role is to give him the administrator authority and help him process it, to which Chester agreed with him. Then he asked Chester why Archduke Lucas is going to that extent, and Chester replied that it was his way of expressing missing his hometown and consideration so that he doesn't live a bad life as he did. This made him wonder what Chester means by so he doesn't have to live a bad life like Lucas did, because those words don't suit someone who is called great. He knows that if Lucas isn't in that world, if Lucas isn't an earthling like him, and if Lucas didn't leave his fate for a future generation, his life would be more pathetic than now, and he wouldn't be as bright as now. So, bending on his knees, he thanked his master for everything. But Chester told him that he was not Manuel Lucas— but he noticed that the corner of Chester's mouth seemed to tremble slightly, but he wonders if he was mistaken. Then the system showed him that he had acquired fifty trillion loot and acquired Sky Fortress Icarus. Also, the Seventh Circle has been created. Meanwhile, in Archduchy city of Nikhen, the former vice-captain of the Knight Order, Pesius asked the person if he said Adrian and if he heard it wrong. Bill I am told him that he didn't hear it wrong, and they believe that if Adrian takes control of the territory, it will develop even further than it is now. Then he asked him if he didn't intend to support Adrian's move anyway, but he just asked Biliam back if he thinks they are the same thing. He thought he was standing up for the Lord, which is Rayford, but if he had known he was asking for a private talk to push for an immature child, he wouldn't have met him in the first place. But Biliam with a clam posture, told him that Adrian is gifted. He told Biliam that he did hear that Adrian was a bit impressive in the war but asked Biliam if he thinks that the object of trust is too small to believe and act on. Biliam just laughed, making him confused. Biliam apologized to him and explained that he wasn't laughing at him and that he just remembered that he was in a similar position to Adrian not long ago. It seems like he thinks Adrian got lucky with that one and is still the same as always. He asked Biliam if he meant that Adrian has changed, and Biliam replied that he certainly hasn't. Rather, what is known to the outside world is only the tip of the iceberg, and unlike him who heard about Adrian's expertise through others, he was someone who heard Adrian's instructions directly and put them into action. Also, he did hear say that Adrian is one of the greatest geniuses in that country, but he won't know unless he experiences it himself. And even the knights who lined up behind Cedric followed Adrian during the war. He told Bill I am that he was completely devoted to the second young master and Bill I am replied that he had no other choice but to be devoted to Adrian. Then he told him that he won't know unless he experiences it himself. He thinks that the story was that Adrian, who was a prodigy, took poison and became a boy of mediocrity at the age of seven. 
In other words, Adrian decided on a way to survive at a young age and put it into practice. Until recently, even if we set aside Adrian's intelligence, which Bilayam boasts about, he has no choice but to acknowledge Adrian's patience and perseverance. Then he asked Bilayam what he wants, and Bilayam replied that he wants to persuade the vassals who are maintaining neutrality and leaning power balance toward the second young master. He told Bilayam that it was a huge task, but it was interesting. Bilayam told him that he made a great decision, but he asked Bilayam what he means when he hasn't decided yet, and shouldn't he meet Adrian before making a decision. Bilayam smilingly told him that Adrian said he was going to visit soon anyway, and he heard that Adrian is coming soon, so he should let him give Adrian a call, making him notice that everything was done according to Adrian's intentions. Bilayam told Adrian, who was on the other line, that they were done talking, and he thinks he can come in now. Pesius is thinking that a young master who has been living for revenge for over a decade, and he'll have to see for himself whether Adrian is truly worthy to be followed as Bilayam says. But then the line on Billiam's call got disconnected, making Bilayam awkwardly laugh and shyly check his connection, wondering why Adrian isn't picking up the call. Then they felt a the strong power of mana, and Pesius noticed that it was unmistakably a mana signature of space leaps. Moreover, with that amount of mana, he was certain that it was a teleportation of the seventh circle. When he was about to ask what on earth was going on, Adrian, with Arcia, appeared, and he told them that judging by their faces, they mustn't have an idea that they were under siege. Bilayam looked confused at him, but he just told them that he does understand because they are people covered with artifacts throughout their entire bodies. Then he ordered Arcia to get rid of them, which Arcia speedily obeyed. Then she came back with a bloody sword and told Adrian that five assassins have been defeated. But he just asked if his expectations were too big because he heard that both of them are the strongest men in their territory, but to think they didn't even notice the assassin's approach. Pesius wonders what in the world is the situation and who is that monster with the laid-back expression beside Adrian. When he was about to ask Adrian, he cut him off by saying that he has been dreaming of revenge for thirteen years since the day he took the poison and asked them if they would come unprepared. He also told them that he needs to at least have an Aura master as a guard, making them both shocked. Pesius remembered his words that he'll have to see for himself whether Adrian is truly worthy to be followed and realized that he has been acting too presumptuous because that person isn't someone he can dare to figure out. They silently gazed at each other for a moment. Then he turned his attention to Pesius and noticed that Pesius was forty-three years old. He was a member of Reinhardt Kingdom's Free Knights. His talents included a high aura, strong physical abilities, moderate learning aptitude, and average intelligence. His traits were marked by conquest and leadership. Their relationship was friendly and allied, and his demeanor appeared astonished, scared, and anticipative. Pesius inquired if Anna had sent them, to which he replied affirmatively. While telling Pesius that he must have many questions, he snapped his fingers, and immediately the corpses on the ground vanished, and the damaged surroundings were magically repaired. Bilayam was amazed to see the bloodstains and corpses disappear but Adrian assured them not to dwell on it, explaining that it was merely a fifth circle magic spell. He then suggested they relocate, and with a touch of teleportation magic, he swiftly transported them, leaving them in awe as this was a seventh circle spell known as teleport. Lua's kingdom was an ally of Reinhardt kingdom, known for having a significant number of grand wizards. Following the four empires, if anyone were to name the most famous wizard among them, the anonymous answer would be Duke Kine Riverdale. He was not only a grand wizard but also a renowned teacher who successfully trained six seventh circle wizards. However, many believe that the greatest wizard of all time was Archduke Lucas while the title of the greatest teacher belonged to Duke Kine Riverdale. Pesius asked if his magic teacher was truly Duke Riverdale. However, he was told that Riverdale had passed away a year ago. He replied that he knew, but because Riverdale had taught him, he could learn without any problem under Anna's surveillance. Pesius still couldn't believe it, knowing that he had spent most of his time in the game. Then Pesius figured something out, making Adrian smile, and he told him that he was right. He explained that the only place he could act without any restriction was the virtual world. Riverdale taught him in both the real world and the virtual world, taking turns. However, he knew it was all a lie because the Grand Wizard appeared out of nowhere. 
Anyone would doubt if a twenty-year-old reached the seventh circle. The best way to prevent it from happening is by having the title of Duke Riverdale's disciple. Pessius told him that Riverdale was indeed creative, and it was a brilliant way to teach. He knew that he didn't just lie without any preparation. He had a platinum plaque and a hologram picture of Riverdale and him, but none of those were real. He asked Lucky Encounter Admin Chester to create them in reality to use them as his alibi, just like the one he was holding. There were many traces of Riverdale and a record of him having a secret disciple that no one knew about. So the Riverdale family or his other disciples would trust him when they find him. He wished he could say he was the heir of Archduke Lucas, but he knew that people wouldn't leave him alone for the rest of his life. Then he told them that Arcia and he could handle Anna and Cedric, so there was no need to try too hard to expand their influence. Pessius asked him why he had called him there. He replied that he had no plan of letting him go, making Pessius shocked and confused. Then he told Pessius that he had something else to do for him, and asked him if he could see his left hand. Their digital watches touched each other, and the system showed the number two online currency account. The system asked him if he would like to share his 20 billion loots in the number two online currency account, to which he replied yes. Pessius was shocked by his action, but he just told him that he wanted him to create a group that would obey his orders and gather the intel. He knew that the jobs that the group is going to do will be dirty work, but it is required to aim higher, and it was cruel to ask a knight to take the job. Pessius told him that since they were likely to go against Margrave Raven, he believed they did need a group like it but asked him if he was sure because he believed it wasn't easy for him to save up that amount of money. He told Pessius that he has a talent for investing and that 20 billion is a lot but not enough to worry about, making Pessius react that it was amazing. But he just stood up, knowing that Pessius would faint if he mentioned that he had 3,000 times the amount of money he just showed him. Then he offered his hand to Pessius and told him that he is going to push Cedric off his spot and inherit the family then have the power that no one can disrespect in that nation, and asked Pessius if he is with him. Pessius looked up at him and bowed down, accepting his hand, while telling him that he had his loyalty. Meanwhile, the scene shifts in Anna's room. She asks her butler if he means five expert assassins who disappeared without any trace, to which the butler fearfully replies yes. She asks him if they didn't say they can kill anyone except an Aura Master or Grand Wizard to which the man replies yes, because their ability is capable. She throws her wine glass at the man's head and furiously asks why it is happening, but the man just bends his head down. She asks him where Pessius and Biliam are, and the man replies that Biliam returned to his unit, and Pessius's location is unknown. She tells the bleeding man that Pessius is alive because Biliam would report to her husband if Pessius died and thinks that if those are together, and planning something— they are definitely aiming for her. So she should have watched over the situation a little more. Then she remembers Rafer telling her that he would like her to stop watching over Adrian and Sylvia, making her pissed, knowing that she had no choice but to listen to Rayford because if she pushed too hard on Rayford, things could have gotten worse. But she was pissed to hear a report that Adrian's performance is beyond expectation. Adrian is sharing his reward with his comrades and superiors, but Adrian will be getting a title when the war is over, and Bill I am said he wants to be on Adrian's side, but Adrian declined Billiam's offer. Also, there were more knights who wanted to support Adrian, making her think that if Bill I am and Pessius get together, they will be unstoppable. So she can't let them do what they want. Also, she can't allow Cedric to have a competitor, so there's no time to keep promises anymore. The man asks her what she would like to do with the Assassin Guild and tells her that they promised to send more people to ensure they complete the job. She simply asks the man if she should just kill Adrian, which shocks him. She asks the man why they were so scared when it seemed like the easiest solution, so she didn't need to think too hard. But the man warned her that if she did it, there was no turning back with Rayford, and Adrian was gaining everyone's attention. However, she interrupted him by calling him and asked him how long he had worked for her. The man replied that this year would be his thirtieth year. While she grabbed a bottle of wine, she walked toward him, telling him that if he had worked for her that long, he should know she hated being lectured. The man fearfully apologized to her. She poured the wine on the man's head and asked if he thought she didn't know that. She told him she was doing it because there was no other way, 
making the man shake in fear, knowing he had made a mistake. She asked the man if he thought he was smarter than her, and he shakily said that he kept going because of remorse for Adrian. He kneeled on his knees and begged her to forgive him because he just pitied Adrian. She asked him if he said pity, and he replied yes, nothing else. She smiled and told him that if that was the case, he could frame it differently, making him confused. But when she told him it wasn't an ordinary person dying, it was the pitiful son of a viscount, someone had to take responsibility, and he did it as his way of showing loyalty without her knowing, crushing his world. Then she sweetly asked him why, and if he didn't want to. The man replied while shaking that he understood, and she should leave it to him because he'd prove his loyalty. She laughed and told him she liked his response, then walked away, telling him to get it done this time, and if they failed again, they would be the ones dying. The man realized that Anna is abandoning him after working for her for thirty years because he misspoke, and he thought it was too late to go back. If Adrian could overcome it, maybe he could find a way out. Meanwhile, in the battlefield everyone raised a glass of wine together, and Otis was proudly talking with him. The people cheered, raising their glasses while congratulating the victory of the 23rd Division. One of the men told them that they could finally go back, and the other replied that he was relieved that the end of the war had been declared safely. Otis told everyone that he never thought he would receive recognition thanks to Adrian, and that he was looking forward to the commendation ceremony. One of the men happily replied that Otis was right, and thanked Adrian because his standing in his family had risen. The other men assured him that he would be the heir of his family, so he should visit them many times because they would welcome him with open arms. He knows that they are getting credit for what he has done, so it is normal, and he thinks that if he had taken all the rewards himself, it wouldn't have happened. Then he told everyone that it was all because Otis had trusted and supported him with great wisdom, making Otis laugh and telling him that he was a humble man. But then Otis told him that it could have been better for him if the war had continued for a little longer, making him wonder what he meant. Then Otis told him that if the war had continued and he had earned more recognition, he could have become a lord, but with what he has right now, the reward will be limited to only him. Hearing this, he understood what Otis meant because he knows that there is a big difference between inheriting a title and earning one on his own. No matter how high of a rank he achieves, he doesn't have earldom. He can't pass on his title. He told Otis that it was okay and that he didn't fight expecting something. Still, Otis told him that it was a shame because he has so much potential, but he doesn't have the environment to fully express himself. He just keeps silent, knowing that he'll be the rightful heir of his family once he pushes Cedric away. Otis told him that it makes him feel sorry, and he told Otis that he shouldn't worry about it because it was really okay for him. Then Otis cleared his throat and told him that maybe he could get engaged to his daughter, making him shocked. Otis shyly told him that he had one daughter, and if he would like, he could make it happen. This made him wonder why all of a sudden, and he thought it was a little too much. So he thanked Otis for the offer and told him that he'll think about it. Otis excitedly told him to think about it, and that he'll always welcome him. He wondered if Otis's daughter was the one known for being a maniac, but he thought it was not his problem anyway, and wondered if it mattered when he could finally go back. Then he told Anna and Cedric in his mind that when he gets back, things they would have never expected would happen. The day after Reinhardt's and Croizen's war ended, the provincial army was disbanded right away. Evans shook his hand and invited him to visit his place any time since he was always welcome. After a brief farewell, the ship closed and began flying in midair. Later, he logged into the game and felt exhausted. He was leveling up rapidly in the game whenever he had some free time. He knew that the level requirement to challenge the Lucky Encounter Quest Level 8 was 250, and his current level was 202. However, it had been almost 10 days since he reached level 200, and he felt like he hadn't been making progress at all. He thought their combat abilities had improved significantly since the battle against the Death Knight. As they became stronger, the monsters also grew stronger. The experience point cap had gone up as well making it impossible to level up at least once a day like before. He knew it wasn't just his problem because the party that had just slain that monster also needed at least a party of five. This made him wonder if he should look for a new party member, but he thought he couldn't do it. 
It was best to avoid attention since he had the lucky encounter ability, and he preferred to progress slowly and steadily toward reaching the max level. So he planned to take it as a lesson and a valuable experience. When he was about to say something to Arcia, he noticed that she wasn't moving, prompting him to ask her what was wrong. Then Crow landed behind him. He asked Crow what was happening, and it tried to explain something while flapping its wings. He looked back at Arcia in a panic, wondering if something had happened outside. He immediately logged out and saw Arcia fighting with someone, which surprised him. He closely observed her fighting and realized that it was a battle. He quickly used his great shield to protect himself and stood by Arcia's side. She told him that they were assassins similar to the ones they got rid of last time. He asked since when assassins use four swords, and she replied that she was not sure about it, but they are armed with force armor and swords with a total of three. He walked closer to her while telling her that it was too clean there, considering there were three vanguards trying to kill him. She told him that Bilayam was ready for any attacks and that Bilayam stalled their vanguards. He was relieved that they had five vanguards, so it shouldn't be too hard. But then Arcia looked up while telling him that, however, she didn't think that one would be so easy while the ceiling of the room was collapsing. Then they saw red eyes staring at them, and he noticed that they were armored golems. He guessed Anna changed her target to him from Bilum and Pesius, but he honestly preferred it too. Then he grabbed something from his inventory space while calling Arcia and threw a sword at her, asking her if one force sword should be enough for her, to which she replied of course. Then he grabbed his Istro staff while Arcia held her Istro arming sword. The golem pointed its sharp claws at them and jumped down to attack them, but he just said that it was pitiful and told them that they had chosen the wrong target. Circles appeared on his shield spell, and he used his flame blast to attack the golems. The force of his attack got out of the ship, making a huge hole in it. Then he flew out of the hole. He told Arcia that they should go, to which she replied yes. On the other hand, inside the ship, one of the enemies told his captain that it wasn't right, and they had to back off, making the captain's enemy wonder how when they should have been done by now. Suddenly, huge explosions appeared near them, throwing the enemy with the monsters away, and the captain's enemy was furiously sweating in pain. Then shouting, he asked why is that kind of monster hiding in the Lawrence family? He flies closer to his enemy while attacking them with his magic, and Arcia was in the front, busy attacking the monsters. The captain's enemy heard his people shout, outing that they couldn't run away to kill the archmage because he was interfering with their teleportation. The other replied they couldn't because there was an aura master next to him, before shouting in pain. The captain's enemy was going nuts because of the situation they were in and thought that the archmage was not enough, but there was even an aura master. Then the captain's enemy ran away while shouting to his people that they were all on their own now, getting Adrian and Arcia's attention. A moment later, he used his magic power to stun the captain's enemy on the floor, while Arcia was running toward him. Arcia cut the captain's enemy's hand, making him shout in pain. She swung her sword backward and attacked the captain, and was close to beheading the captain's enemy. But then Adrian told her to wait and not to kill that guy, so she stopped in time before her blade cut off the captain's enemy's head. He got down on the ship to walk closer to the man and told him that there was no use trying to escape, making the captain's enemy wonder if they were completely annihilated because he thought it was impossible. He was about to suggest to the captain's enemy, how about we help each other? But then he noticed the captain's enemy doing something and shouted to Arcia to stop the man while running toward them. When Arcia checked the captain's enemy's pulse, she told him that he was dead, and it looks like he chewed the poison hidden in his molar teeth. Adrian was amazed to think that it was really how the assassins died because he thought it would only happen in novels. Since he didn't have a lot of experience dealing with assassins, he took their determination lightly. Then he heard the vanguards noisily behind him asking Bilayam if he was already aware of it and begging Bilayam to say something. Bilayam opened his helmet and told the vanguards that Adrian is Duke Riverdale's disciple, making the vanguards shocked. The vanguards panicked and told Bilayam that Adrian must have been under strict surveillance all this time, and what is more, Adrian usually played games all the time. Bilayam replied that Adrian was able to train without any restrictions in the virtual world. Adrian said that his teachings were conducted between reality and virtual reality, so the theory classes are also available online, 
yet they didn't even know it, and not just them, but everyone in the family looked down on Adrian. Bilayam also told them that they all know how amazing Duke Riverdale was, but he thinks Adrian was able to become like him because he was special, the young genius of Viscount Lawrence. It was said that Adrian had lost his intelligence after taking poison but had been making plans for the future while lowering himself and deceiving everyone around him to survive. Bilayam told everyone that the tide had turned, and surely they were not thinking of dying on a sinking ship. Adrian noticed that Bilayam was pretty good at influencing others, and Bilayam told everyone that they would arrive at the estate soon, so they should behave themselves so as not to be a nuisance to Adrian, to which they all replied yes. Later, Sylvia is crying while running toward Adrian and hugged him tightly, asking if he was all right and if he wasn't hurt anywhere. He told his mother to calm down because he was all right. Rayford told him that he had worked hard, and he thanked his father for the compliment, but he knew that in any case, it was totally normal to hold a parade in celebration of him receiving the medal on the battlefield, but it was too quiet. Rayford apologized to him because he should have given him a grand welcome. He told his father that he was okay because he was not into noisy events anyway, but he thinks it must have been Anna and Cedric's doing because who would bother to hold a parade for someone who was going to die anyway. Rayford told him that in exchange for it, they had prepared a grand banquet so they should celebrate his return with eating and drinking. But he just looked up and saw his fortress in energy-saving mode, making him smile inside. In their mansion, there were a swarm of different dishes on the table, and Bill I am, Harmon, and others told him that it was their greatest honor to fight alongside him. Harmon bowed his head to him and told him that he was able to come back alive thanks to him, making his father tell him that he had learned how to win people's hearts on the battlefield. Suddenly he heard Cedric shudderingly call his name in anger and saw that he was with Anna and others. He bowed his head to them and told them that it had been three months since they last saw each other, making Cedric have no other choice but to welcome him back. But he noticed that Anna looked like she'd seen a ghost. More importantly, he noticed the guy behind Anna and wondered what was up with him because he saw that the man's name is Morris Gus Heyer, and his condition was relief and joy. He heard that Morris had been working as Anna's right hand for over thirty years, yet he had a favorable impression of him. He thought that if he could convince Morris, he should prove to be quite useful. But then he saw someone walking toward him. He noticed that the man was Commander Crone Dyke, who was an aura expert too, with doubt and distrust conditions as he expected from a knight commander. His specs are excellent, still he couldn't believe that his characteristic is authority-based management not combat ability. He knows that Anna and Cedric aren't even worth looking at, and it angers him that he was fooled by those individuals. But Cedric told him that as someone who carried the last name of their family, he has done quite a good job, even though it was not that big of a deal. He should still compliment him. He just smiled, thinking that they were full of bullshit. He'd love to send their heads flying right now, but he was going to find some justification first. Those bastards have made him suffer so much that he wouldn't simply grant them a clean death. He was going to push them into a swamp so deep that they can't ever escape from and strangle them when they are in despair. Cedric asks him if it feels good to be complimented, and calls him a crude person. He asks Cedric if he really thinks he'd be happy hearing his praises, knowing that it doesn't mean he is going to tolerate all of Cedric's actions because it would make him too much of a pushover. Then he told Cedric what he meant. It was just ridiculous how he was talking as if he was capable of doing anything, making Cedric shocked. What he wants is to create an atmosphere and use it as his justification, a justification that they deserve to face consequences. So he tells Cedric that if he had led those people to the battlefield, they would have been completely wiped out. He has already imagined him ignoring tactics and getting himself killed after charging forward recklessly. Cedric calls him a bastard and asks him how dare he but he just continues by asking Cedric if people should know how to use their heads more as they get older. He told him that to think he is naive enough to regard his smile as him being happy is the reason why his vassals call him a moron and an imbecile, making Cedric's face turn red in anger. When Cedric was about to tell him something, he cut him off, acting like he remembered something, and asked Cedric if could it be that his ignorance came from his maternal side. Suddenly a glass of wine falls to the ground because the waiter accidentally tripped, making the tension even darker. 
Anna was on the brink of anger, but he playfully said to Anna that if she had something to say, she should say it directly and stop pretending to be elegant because it doesn't suit her. Suddenly Cedric burst into laughter, which shocked everyone. Cedric drew his sword while telling him that he had become even ruder after returning from the battlefield and that he didn't even know what fear was anymore while pointing his sword at him. Sylvia fearfully told them that Adrian must be tired after coming back from the battlefield and looks tired, so for now, they should take that sword away. Then Rayford shouted at Cedric, asking him what he was doing on such a happy occasion and if he wasn't going to put that sword down immediately. But Adrian just apologized to his father because he needed him to keep quiet and watch. Cedric moved closer to them while saying that he had manipulated Adrian, and he understood why he suddenly acted this way. It must be due to that rebel's instigation. Then Cedric angrily asked how dare he try to overthrow their family, and told Biliam that he must be out of his mind, making Biliam shocked and pointing at himself to ask Adrian if it was him. But Adrian shook his head no. Cedric still told Biliam that persuaded Adrian to try to break the family apart. Anna, who was acting, said that it was absurd and asked Biliam if it was true. But Adrian knew that they were the ones being absurd, and he couldn't believe that they would interpret his intentions that way. Cedric ordered the knights to capture the rebel Biliam immediately, but no one obeyed his order, and their surroundings were just quiet. Cedric asked the knights what they were doing and told them to hurry up and carry out his order. One of the knights told Cedric that if he wanted to capture Vice Commander Biliam, he should do it himself, making Cedric shy and angrily asking the knight named Berto what he was saying. While Adrian tried to hold his laughter hearing his laughter, Cedric's surroundings turned black, and he snapped in anger and shyness at the same time, so he ran forward to attack Cedric with his blade, shocking everyone. But then someone grabbed Cedric's hand, and it was Arcia, who was busy eating a huge chicken drumstick. He furiously asked what was with her and told her to let him go, while wondering how she was so strong. When Cedric was about to tell her to let him go again, she hid his face with chicken, making him collapse and slowly fall down. Anna, Crone, Bill I am, Rayford, and Sylvia were shocked to see it. But Adrian was watching in joy. Then Cedric fell to the ground, making everyone silent. He looked at Cedric with a smile, thinking that after Cedric acted all proud, he ended up being grabbed and beaten with a chicken leg by a woman half of his size. Crone walked forward and told them to stop because it was enough. Then Crone drew his sword and told Adrian that he kept crossing a line he shouldn't cross. Adrian thought the knight commander should draw his sword as if he were protecting the king as a royal guard. He asked Crone if he wasn't the one crossing the line right now. Then he told Crone that Cedric had done so many things over time that he couldn't even remember or he simply had no shame. This made Cedric angrily ask Crone what he was doing and shout that those people dared to harm him, so they deserved to be killed. Crone told Cedric that, of course, they must die, and Cedric shouted in agreement. But Crone then told Cedric that as a vassal, he couldn't harm the second young master, who is a member of the Lord's family. This made Cedric furious. However, Crone pointed his sword at Arcia, who was peacefully eating the chicken leg, and said that it was a different story with her. There was no room for consideration for a commoner who dared to raise her hand against a noble, so he would proceed directly to judgment without a trial. Crone raised his sword and asked Arcia if she thought she was a noble just because she was a noble's lover. But when he was about to strike her, Biliam and the other vanguards pointed their swords at Crone. Crone asked Biliam what he was doing and told him to step back immediately. But Biliam said that he wouldn't have drawn his sword if he was going to back off. At Crone's words, he warned Crone to step away from Lady Arcia immediately. Crone asked if he said Lady Arcia and found it strange because he could see people from Cedric's faction too. Also, most of those individuals would prioritize profit over loyalty. He wondered why even such cunning individuals were willing to follow Adrian, making him think that something didn't seem right. Then a lot of knights appeared and Cedric immediately ran toward his mother. Adrian noticed that reinforcements were there and wondered why Anna, who had always been sensitive when it came to Cedric, was so quiet, and if she had gathered the knights over the phone. Cedric teasingly told him that there was no use in regretting now, and including Bill I am, all of them will be thoroughly punished for their crimes. 
He furiously told the knights that they were in the presence of the Lord and asked them how dare the knights of the Viscount stand on the opposite side of their Lord. But Cedric just ordered the knights to subdue those troublemakers immediately. Then the knights ran forward and pointed their weapons at them, making him realize that in terms of numbers, their expeditionary forces had more soldiers, but they were not armed properly, whereas Cedric's faction had more than ten armed soldiers, and their equipment was overwhelmingly better. So if a full-scale battle broke out, it would be a one-sided slaughter. Suddenly Crone asked him why he did such a useless thing and told him that it seemed like he was still drunk on his victory, forgetting his position. Then he told him that his family's system could not be changed, and because of his recklessness, the only people who ended up seeing blood were those guys. Also, he wouldn't be killed immediately, however, even if he lives only hell awaits him, a life that is even worse than it is now. But he just keeps quiet. Rayford shouted at him to use the artifact while Sylvia was apologizing in fear. Cedric teasingly told him to run away, no matter what. Crone told the knights on their side to be ready to attack, which the knights pointed their weapons at them. But he just called them foolish individuals. He told the knights on their side that they were rebelling, and those troublemakers were trying to harm the Lord, so they should protect the Lord, and the knights on Adrian's side replied yes immediately. This made Crone wonder what the hell those guys were doing. He told Crone that anyone could tell the ones committing treason were them, and they should put an end to that boring act. Then he removed the illusion magic and ordered Arcia to bring those three to him and take care of the rest, to which Arcia replied yes and disappeared. Anna and Cedric were shocked to see the knights surrounding them being killed rapidly. Also, the knights behind Crone were easily killed without a trace of who the killer was, making him fearfully confused. Suddenly, Adrian appeared behind Crone and asked him what he had just said to him. Then he slapped his staff on Crone's face while calling Crone a traitor and told him that he required discipline. Crone shook in fear, knowing that it was impossible. Then he noticed that the woman just now is an Orem master and wondered if that game addict Adrian just deals damage to him. Crone shouted to his people that Arcia was an Orem master and ordered them to get into a formation centered around the armed knights and face her. Also, they should keep calm and be able to deal with her. Adrian told Crone that he couldn't believe that he still managed to give instructions to his subordinates in the midst of all of it, but he expected it from a knight commander like him, even though it was not going to change anything. Crone asked him what the hell he was, but he just asked Crone what he meant when he was a teacher who would teach them a valuable life lesson while increasing his agility physical strength, mana, and defense. Crone knows that wizards can use magic two classes lower than their level without casting, which means that if they are a seventh circle wizard, they can use fifth circle magic without any casting and a skill that proves their existence as an archmage, the skill that allows them to overwhelm the wizard killer vanguard, so the moment they become archmages, the so-called weakness of a wizard almost disappears. Adrian used his memorized cast saved magic and attacked Crone with his flame blast, making Crone shout in pain. After that, he walked closer in front of Cedric and who fell to the ground in shock. He told them that he thinks they will have a lot of fun from now on and asked them if they don't think so, while Crone attacked him from behind. Crone, who was burning, called him a bastard, but he just moved to the side to avoid Crone's attack. He told Crone that he should have stayed on the ground and asked him why he got up, making Crone look at him in anger. Anna and Cedric shook in fear when they saw him attack Crone. Then Crone fell to the ground. They both wondered how it could be and how Adrian Lawrence could become an archmage, but he just smiled at them, making them realize that they were screwed. Later, in another mansion, a man angrily slammed his hand on the table. He is Anna's father, Raven Margrave furiously asked how that bastard Adrian dared to do those deeds to his precious daughter and grandson. The men showed Raven what happened at Adrian's mansion using a device, which made Raven furiously ask, What the heck is this? One of the men explained that the video is constantly spreading on various portals and platforms. By tomorrow, most people will become aware of the situation, and some even speculate that Cedric Lawrence and Anna Lawrence's acts of treason were done with his support. Raven told them that the things those commoners say in the virtual world don't mean much, but the man informed him that even among the nobles, some support those speculations. Raven arrogantly asked the man, So what? 
he told them that the best those people could do was file a few complaints. Raven thought that no matter how valuable an archmage and an aura master are, winning a war can't be done with just one or two superhumans. What's more, helping those two means opposing him, who possesses military power equal to that of a duke and marquis combined. He knows it would be troublesome if someone of his title, a duke or a marquis, sided with Adrian but that is highly unlikely since they are the ones who would least welcome the emergence of a new rival. The man told him that the royal family may intervene. Raven replied, It's obvious because a young archmage and an aura master would draw people's attention. However, he added, Only if it was the truth. Making the man shocked and confused. He told the man that they can just turn those two into swindlers, and as long as no one believes they are an archmage and an aura master— there will be no problem. He asked the man if there was any guarantee that it wasn't an artificially created video in this age and time. Then he suggested, We can just announce our position like saying the video was fabricated. But the man warned him that once they had it authenticated, it would be over. Still, he insisted that they can take care of it before they have the video authenticated. He furiously told them that through that video, they were exposing that he was behind Anna and Cedric and those commoners were acting exactly as they wanted them to. They were only trying to get a justification for what they truly aimed for, his war. The man fearfully replied that it was impossible and asked if they were out of their minds, wondering if they were thinking of picking a fight with the Margrave. But he just asked the man how much their Margrave forces could be mobilized in a territorial war. One of the men replied that it was about half of their total forces. For their territory— they can mobilize three sky fortresses and 150 vanguards or two sky fortresses and 200 vanguards. He asked what forces could be mobilized right now, and one of the men replied 200 vanguards and one sky fortress. He told them that it was enough and wondered how a brat who is still wet behind the ears dares to provoke him. Then he declared to everyone, It's war, and I will make Adrian regret it. Meanwhile, in Adrian's mansion, he scratches his ears thinking they must have checked the video they released by now and are preparing to attack because his ears are itchy, so they must be talking about him. He knows the relationship between Anna, Cedric, and Raven Margrave is inseparable. His blade of revenge is only complete when it reaches Raven Margrave. However, to solidify his position, there are conditions that must be met in advance. The lady introduced herself to him as the daughter of Kyne Riverdale, Olivia Riverdale. He knows that Duchess Olivia is an archmage belonging to the Lewis kingdom, and she was the daughter of the famous Duke Kyne Riverdale. While she is said to be the closest to the Eighth Circle, the archmages in the Lewis kingdom, her existence is equal to that of the patriarch of the Riverdale family, to which the six archmages belong. Unlike him, who gained strength through lucky encounters, Olivia is a true genius who reached the Seventh Circle at the age of twenty-two. She gave the ID to the men with her, and told them that it looks real to her. Then the other men told her that it definitely seemed real, making him exhale in relief. He asked her if it meant that they had acknowledged it, but she told him that, however, she was only saying it looked real, as it's completely possible to forge that platinum plaque in the first place. She attacked him with strong pressure, making the glass on the table shatter into pieces. He notices that they are putting pressure on him by resonating with each other's circles, making him feel heavy and in pain. So he uses his magic power to make them stop, making Olivia surprised. He angrily asked them what the meaning of it is, but she just told him that it was incredible. While the men were cheering for him, she told him that it was nothing much, and they just wanted to test his skills while recovering the shattered glass cup. But he told her that surely she would have been able to check it without resorting to something like this. She told him that having seven circles doesn't mean everyone is the same, and she just wanted to measure his exact level. He thinks, although Olivia looks delicate, her methods are quite tough, and he asks her if he has earned her acknowledgement now. She told him that she still had many questions, but there was no reason to turn away a genius archmage who claimed to be her father's disciple and was helping her family expand their influence. He notices that Olivia doesn't care much about whether or not he is real, and he feels like she is just welcoming another archmage. This makes him think that she has a sensible way of thinking, and he asks her what if he turns out to be a bad guy who will cause her family to suffer losses. 
She told him that turning their family into his enemy is no different from asking for death, and she doubts anyone can afford it. Also, they have already confirmed his identity because they don't take in just anyone. This makes him smile and think that since he has received their recognition, there is no reason to argue anymore. Then he told them that he'd like to make a request. The next day, Raven asks his butler how much longer it will take to deploy the troops. The butler replies that it will take at least one more hour. Raven asks if it can't be a little faster. However, a panicked man calls him from behind and tells him to take a look at that video. This makes Raven angry, and he asks what is it this time. He then sees Olivia in the video announcing that she'd like to make an announcement. Today, she officially announces that the young master Adrian Lawrence, a disciple of the former Duke of Riverdale, became an archmage of the Seventh Circle at the age of twenty. She also tells everyone that Adrian is a rare magic genius and a talent expected to achieve the Eighth Circle. Riverdale will do their best to assist Adrian and spare no effort to support his growth. Raven realizes that Adrian is already one step ahead, as if Adrian had read his thoughts. The butler tells him that he can't believe Riverdale would appear, and at that rate, the royal family will undoubtedly intervene. But Raven is more upset to hear Olivia saying that if anyone tries to harm Adrian, they at Riverdale will take it as an act of antagonize against them. Raven furiously slams the video device on the ground and catches his breath for a moment. Then he tells men that they are moving as scheduled. The butler asks him what he said, but he just asks his butler if he didn't hear him and tells him that they'll be moving as planned. The butler tries to remind him about the royal family, but he cuts his butler's words by asking, what about them and if they catch up on their expedition and order them not to attack Lawrence's territory? The butler tells him that it's not about that, but the risks are too high. Still, Raven tells him that it's fine as long as they achieve their goal, and they can overcome it no matter what. The butler tells him that Riverdale is behind Adrian, so he thinks they should stop their expedition. But Raven angrily tells his butler that it doesn't matter because they are foreigners anyway, and moreover, he's sure Adrian will be relieved that they won't be able to attack him, so their surprise attack will be even more effective now. He orders his people that they have to finish the preparations and deploy their troops as soon as possible and asks if they understand it, not noticing Crow on top of them. The butler replies that he understands and they will speed everything up even more, but with a shared vision of Crow and Adrian, he sees his enemies' every movement. Before the video Olivia asks him if he wants her to hold a press conference, and if that's really all he's asking for, he replies that it's correct. She tells him that she understands the situation he's in and that if he wishes, she could provide further support for him as a fellow disciple. But he tells her that she just needs to reveal that he is the former Duke of Riverdale's disciple and an archmage, and that he doesn't need anything else. This makes her confused, and she asks him why. He smiles, remembering it, stands up, and tells Arcia that it's time for them to go. He thinks that when it comes to exacting revenge, he doesn't want to rely on anyone else's help. He wonders if revenge is for the sake of self-satisfaction so he knows that everything must be done according to his plan and under his leadership. Those guys are his prey, so he doesn't want to share the joy of hunting them with others. On the other hand, Adrian's men are in underground. The knights were panicking and shouting that the prisoners had escaped. The knights ran around searching for them, asking if there were still people following those two after all that happened. They shouted that they could still be hiding in there, so they should search carefully, and he'll go up and ask for help. Without noticing, Anna sneaked behind them, walked upstairs with Cedric and another man, while holding a key in her hand. The Sky Fortress slowly got closer to the mansion, and Anna, Cedric, and the other men rushed up toward it. Anna told them that it was the same as dead living it, and her father won't leave them be. Cedric asked her if she was really doing it, and she furiously asked him what else she was going to do when they couldn't live like this, to which he replied that she was right. She told him to shut up and keep up. A minute later, they arrived at the top, and then she looked up and saw the sky fortress. She raised her key in front of it, and the system asked her if she would like to enter the sky fortress, to which she replied, Entered. They were all summoned and transported inside. She immediately took off her coat and swore that she'll make sure Adrian dies. Then she furiously asked Adrian if he thought she'd stay down, 
and told him that she can destroy him and the Visconti with that sky fortress. Then she entered her key and told it her name, making it verify everything completely. The system asked her if she was trying to activate the sky fortress under threat because its biorhythm was unstable at the moment, to which she replied no, and it verified her answer. The system showed her that sky fortress Janet activation was complete and welcomed her as admin. She immediately ordered it to prepare the main cannon firestorm, target Visconti, and fire as soon as possible. But then Adrian covered her mouth in time to avoid it. He told her that she acted perfectly as he predicted and thanked her for unlocking the security for Sky Fortress, making her panic and wonder when Adrian got in. Then she heard her men being dragged, and Cedric being beaten up easily by Arcia. Adrian told her that attempting to shoot Visconti was Sky Fortress, her crimes just kept on stacking, and that Raven Margrave's troops were almost there. So, she and his brother will have to protect that land with their own bodies. He also told her that it was what he wanted to see, and that if she is guilty, she is supposed to be anxious, and asked her if she thinks criminals can be proud. Then he threw her away on the floor and told her that there were too many security measures in the Sky Fortress, but she did a good job unlocking them, and now he can do what he wants. She told him that she was not sure what he was trying to do, but they should calm down and talk because she thinks they were all heated. However, he just clicked the Sky Fortress systems, knowing that he was not the one who tried to blow up the Visconti. She orders Arcia to stop hitting Cedric and drags him over there, to which Arcia replies yes. Then she throws Cedric next to Anna. Cedric asks him what he's doing when they are brothers, but he just tells Cedric that they are brothers in his ass. Then he uses his great shield to lock them. Arcia asks him what they should do about the knights, and the knights tell him that they have committed a crime deserving of death but beg him to have mercy on them. He tells them that they seem like Raven Margrave's people, so he'll send them there. Suddenly, the ground beneath the knights collapses, and they all fall out of the sky fortress while he's telling them that they should have the honor of becoming fertilizer for Earldom Raven. Then Adrian tells Arcia that he forgot to upload the video and orders her to edit the video for him. She walks toward him and asks him if he's going to upload more videos. He replies yes and tells her that it's not a bad idea while Cedric and Anna are trying to escape on his shield. Then he tells her that he's going to use the media platform for political purposes. Meanwhile, in Raven's mansion, he sees the news of Anna and Cedric stealing the Sky Fortress and trying to kill Visconti Lawrence. Then he sees one of the comments that he forcefully sold the retiring Sky Fortress to Lawrence's family and gave the admin authority to his daughter, which means it's all his fault. After reading it, he asks his butler if he can kill every commoner who commented on it, and his butler replies that it's possible but won't be easy. The website is under Alicia Union's jurisdiction, and they don't reveal users' personal information unless it's for a serious crime. He angrily says that those Alicia folks are stubborn. Then his butler calls him to report that one Sky Fortress and two hundred vanguards are all ready to be deployed. He tells the captain that he better not fail, and the captain replies that he'll keep it in mind. Then he angrily orders them to move forward. The mages begin to use their teleportation magic circle to teleport the vanguards and Sky Fortress. Slowly they disappear, leaving him with his butler and men behind. He thinks he should have gone there himself, but Anna who is trapped inside the shield, shouts at his father not to come. A minute later, a circle of mana teleportation appears above Anna's sky fortress, and he feels it, shouting that they are there. Then he orders to start the mana surge, making the fortress release an electric power. Cedric crying asks him if he can hear him and apologizes to him, then begs him to forgive him and Anna. She shouts at him asking what he's doing. He replies that he's using what he learned from the war and tells her that it's called a suicide bomb. Anna and Cedric are shocked. He says goodbye to them teasingly while raising his glass of wine, and a huge explosion like fireworks can be seen in the sky while he peacefully drinks his wine. He thinks some might say revenge is meaningless, but he totally disagrees because alcohol never tasted so sweet like that. Then he tells Arcia that they should make a wish. Arcia asks him what wish and he replies that they are supposed to make a wish while watching fireworks. The date is August 15, 2019, in the Age of Magic. He has erased Anna and Cedric, who have been causing him trouble in that world, 
and now he has earned his absolute freedom. Meanwhile, in Raven's mansion, Raven and his men were silent in the room, waiting for updates on their troops. He angrily asked them why on earth he can't reach them and if the operation isn't supposed to be finished already. One of the men starts suggesting it might be a communication failure, and the other replies that they must have contacted them through personal devices. Then another asks if it's because the large-scale teleportation was carried out too hastily, and if he means a space disconnection as it might be the case. He asks them about the spies they previously planted, and the man replies that they haven't been able to get in touch with any of them, considering the fact that it happened right after those individuals took Anna into custody. He suspects the information has been identified, and the spies are arrested. He furiously asks the man if he's kidding him, but the man replies that if it's not the case, he can't think of any other possibilities. Perhaps the whole situation was planned in advance, making him angry and wondering since when it was all planned. He also thinks if it's true, he wonders if he has been played by a brat who is his grandson's age. Then he tells them that apart from the Lord's castle, at least one person must be in contact with them in a regular residential area. One of the men replies that perhaps it was the effect of the space disconnection, but there was no connection to the general communication either. Suddenly, a man panicky calls him and tells him that he was looking for online articles related to Lawrence's territory, and the article was posted three minutes ago. Then he sees a video of a huge explosion and vanguards protecting the place. The vanguards are attacking their fortress that was transported to the place, making them explode one by one and shatter into pieces. The room is silent as they watch the scene, and his butler explains to him that according to the article posted along with the video, an evacuation advisory was issued about an hour ago, and all residents of Viscounty Lawrence were evacuated. It also said that while the communication was completely cut off, a huge explosion suddenly occurred in the sky. They have confirmed that the communication was restored a while ago, and there was also an announcement released from the Lord's Castle. This makes him snap in anger, and he destroys his table using only one hand, shocking and stunning his men. Then he throws a vase near him and his chair at the men. He silently looks at them for a moment, and asks how many additional troops can be deployed right now. One of the men replies that 75 vanguards or 25 vanguards and one sky fortress can be deployed, and any number beyond that would violate the law. He knows that if the previously dispatched troops had the strength equal to five sky fortresses, they must now have the strength of only 1.5 judging from the video. It's clear that Adrian sacrificed his sky fortress to carry out a suicide bombing attack, so no matter how old the sky fortress of Lawrence estate is, there's no way their forces would be intact if they got swept away from close range by a suicide bombing using a surge of mana. This only means one thing, Adrian was perfectly aware of their movements. However, he thinks Adrian still can't do the same thing twice since they no longer have a sky fortress to blow up. The man tells him that unfortunately that number is not enough to overwhelm the power of Viscounty Lawrence and an emergency message has just arrived from the royal family stating that the use of force against the Viscounty of Lawrence is prohibited. This shocks him, but then he laughs loudly, making his men fearful. He asks if it's the price he has to pay for looking down on that bastard. He thinks it's possible to recover from the damage, but they won't be able to do it right away. It costs around 15 trillion to build one sky fortress and at least 50 billion for one set of vanguard force equipment so they need as much as 30 trillion for damage recovery alone. He can't believe that the power of their family developed for generations has collapsed due to a small mistake. He asks his man if he said that communication with Viscounty Lawrence has been restored, to which the man replies yes. Then he orders the man to get him on the phone with Adrian immediately. The Black Eagle is the same as Arcia, a supporter, but its basic method of use is completely different. While Arcia is a multi-purpose existence like a human being, the Black Eagle is an auxiliary supporter strictly focused on support. Its first skill is shared vision, which helps him a lot. He tells Raven that he can't believe he would be shameless enough to call him, and Raven acknowledges his ability because his trick worked well this time. However, Raven warns him not to think his luck will continue next time. He tells Raven not to worry because his revenge will only be complete with his death and the fall of his family. Raven asks him what he means by revenge, and he tells Raven that he may not know it, 
but because Anna and his elder brother Cedric loved the Sky Fortress so much, he let them stay inside. He bets they must have been satisfied as he even held such an expensive cremation ceremony for them. Raven told him that just because his strategy worked once, he no longer knew how scary that world could be. But he responded by saying he didn't know about anything else. He simply wasn't scared of Raven. Raven vowed that he would never forget today's humiliation and would definitely pay him back a thousand times. This made him smile, hearing how Raven only gets mad at insults directed at himself. He guessed that Raven must have put Anna and Cedric's death behind him, making him seriously think that those two were so pitiful after acting so proud. In the end, it seemed they were nothing but tools. Then he asked Raven if he was currently on the 80th floor of the Lord's Castle, and Raven asked him what he meant. He told Raven that he had prepared a present for him, and it should have arrived by now. While Crow was outside near the castle, he asked Raven if he had heard about memorization magic and explained that it was a magic skill to avoid casting time and allowed him to store ten magic spells at once. He asked Raven what it would be like to have ten seven-circle magic spells memorized which are cast at once, and if he thought it could even break through the Raven Lord's castle shield that he had been so proud of. Then Raven saw Crow in front of them with ten circles of magic, leaving him and his men open-mouthed in shock. He told Raven that the present he sent him was ten rounds of seventh-circle magic blaze blast. Crow swung its wings forward, releasing the magic circles and attacking the castle. He laughed heartily while hearing the men panicking, telling Raven that the barrier of the Lord's castle was on the verge of breaking and begging Raven to use Blink or Teleport to quickly get out of there. Then he heard Raven angrily shouting his name, but he teasingly told Raven that he would pray for his safety and hung up the call, excusing himself. He stood up when Bill Iam called him and reported that, as he ordered, they had gathered the reporters in the conference hall. A moment later, the maid who was whispering behind his back before was fearfully bowing their heads to him as he walked past them. He looked at one of the servants and remembered that among the maids and servants of the Lord's castle, there was no one who hadn't looked down on him. He walked past the servants and maids trembling in fear, thinking it was funny how they were all afraid of him. He knew it was time for him to say goodbye to his past of playing a dumbass because the second act of his splendid life had begun. In the news, it was reported that young Master Adrian Lawrence held a conference about the Sky Fortress suicide attack incident. It was revealed that Raven Margrave secretly deployed one Sky Fortress and two hundred vanguards, all of which turned into ash in a split second. Some blamed Adrian for copying the tactic used in the war with the Croizan Empire, while others acknowledged that this was the result of great predictions in information warfare. Adrian emphasized that none of this would have happened if Raven Margrave had not planned his malicious attack, stating that he did what he had to do to protect his land. Raven Margrave's castle collapsed, and Raven survived but took massive damage from an unexpected counterattack. The most prominent headline was young prodigy Adrian Lawrence shuts down Raven Margrave. The Post asked viewers for their thoughts on the news, and the commentators shared various opinions. Some believed that the sky fortress of someone else's deserved defeat, while others praised Adrian's intelligence and saw this as a new era for the Reinhardt kingdom. There were also those who viewed it as a typical noble family feud and more. He smiled as he read the comments, thanking everyone for their support and expressing his gratitude. He told them that he would never forget it, and this made him excited as he realized he had reached one million followers in just a day, becoming an influencer. Bill Iam expressed his concern about people blaming Adrian for bringing down a renowned noble, but Adrian dismissed it, saying that he wasn't backing down anymore. Bill Iam remembered that Adrian had lived his whole life being suppressed, but now he seemed determined to take control of his destiny. Adrian noticed that the Raven Margrave incident had caused controversy both within and outside the country, with articles criticizing him as well. However, despite the Raven family's solid reputation, public opinion was biased in his favor, leading even those on the neutral side to join his cause. It was as if the entire nation was on his side, and public opinion was in his favor. Adrian knew that commoners were essentially slaves to nobles but he felt different because he could benefit from the people's support. He has to prove himself that he is different from those people, and he'll do it by constantly communicating with them. He thinks discrimination toward commoners from nobles is a structural problem in Rondel, 
not because commoners are worse than them, and most of the talented people he found were commoners too. Suddenly, Rayford called him and told him that an order to appear came for him, making him shocked. Then he read that Arcia Klein and Adrian was ordered to present themselves at the board of inspection, making him notice that it was short but forceful. He can think of three things from it. First, Raven Margrave's play. Second, High Noble's plan to tame them. And third, the Royal Council's plan to tame them because he knows that they wouldn't send an order if they wanted to be friends with them. Bilayam asks him if he has a plan, and he replies, of course. Then he asked his father what he thought nobles liked the most and his father replied, money. He told them that he agreed with it, and that he was going to change their opinion with money, so many nobles would be interested, even the royals. Rayford told him that he would like to have more explanation on his plan, and he replied that he earned some money from investing, so if he paid tax on that money, it would surely change their minds. His father asked him if he meant covering the issue with another issue, and he replied, yes. His father and Bill I. M. were silent to hear his words making him notice that they don't seem to be happy about it. But he thinks it was better to show them, talk, and shows his balance of loot, making them all shocked. Bilayam excitedly shouted that it was amazing and couldn't believe that it was what grand wizards do as their hobby, and asked him how he could collect sixty billion loots. But he told Bilayam to look carefully because there were four commas, not three, making Bilayam confused and unable to believe that he had sixty trillion loots. He told them that he got lucky, but Bilayam panicky asked him if he saw the future or if he was reincarnated, but he just told Bilayam that it was a funny joke. His father told him that they would go crazy. He asked Rayford how much he thinks the tax would be, and Rayford replied that at least one-fifth of it would be tax. He thinks if it was one-fifth, then it was twelve trillion, and told them that he heard if a noble pays a hefty amount as tax, the royal guild will grant tax exemption. Rayford replied it was right and that if he used merchants that the royal family operated, he would get tax-free on half of the tax he was paying, making him think it was good because he already planned on using some money, and he'll give to use one-fifth after all. Rayford asks him if he has something else he wants to buy, and he replies yes. Then he told his father that he was getting more sky fortresses and vanguards. The next day, the reporter told the news that Adrian Lawrence had finished reporting taxes for the money he earned from investing, and that the amount of money he earned is said to be sixty trillion, which shook the noble society. Meanwhile, Otis was happily laughing and told his family that Adrian, the crazy man, sure knows how to surprise people. His wife asks him if Adrian is the staff member he told her about, and Otis replies yes but he can't call him his staff anymore since Adrian will be getting the title of a grand wizard for reaching the seventh circle. Otis told his wife that he wanted Michelle to get to know Adrian, but he became too big of a person within a few days. His wife asks him if he can't still make something happen because she would love Adrian as her son-in-law, and Michelle told her parents that Adrian's face was her type, but she didn't want to be a person who benefits from a partner because she was going to earn her authority on her own. Her mother asks her how, and she replies that it'll be easy once she finds Archduke Manuel Lucas's fate. Her mother pulled her ears while angrily asking her if she's still not over it, and when she's going to grow up, but she told her mother that it was possible. Then Otis made it sound like he realized something, making his wife and daughter stop and ask him why. He replied that it all makes sense if Adrian is the one who found Archduke Lucas's fate and Adrian's boldness all makes sense too. Michelle told her father that the Riverdale family accepted Adrian as one of them, but he told them that it was perfect for Adrian since he doesn't have a strong presence, and he can hide under the Riverdale family because Adrian is the type of person capable of perfectly hiding himself until he reaches the Lord Wizard status. Michelle told her father that the Royal Guild also confirmed that all of Adrian's money came from investing, and he replied that maybe there was a deal between the Riverdale family and Reinhard Royals. She asks her father if he likes conspiracy theory novels, but then the reporter says that there's breaking news, and the public priest just announced that they found Manuel Lucas's lucky encounter, making Michelle angrily shocked. Meanwhile, in Manuel Lucas's tower, Adrian says that it would be so much easier if he could just absorb research books like the skill books because he knows that tomorrow he needs to attend an inspection with Arcia, and then the day after that he should attend a party held by the royals. Another day after that, he needs to go look for sky fortresses and vanguard gears, 
so he can't stop leaving because he's busy, so he logs in every second he gets. Then he throws the books next to the other books he has done reading and goes to the shelves to get more books, knowing that there is less than 1% of military research in those thousands of books of research. The weapon Archduke Lucas invented changed the way of war, but still, Lucas is against war. Also, the research Lucas spent most of his time on is dimension teleportation. He knows that Lucas never married, never had a disciple, and spent his entire life researching his way back home. So everyone says that Lucas is the one who changed the world, but the truth is that Lucas missed home. The reason why Lucas left traces showing he is from Earth is probably to meet someone from his home, but sadly, it happened after he passed away, and Lucas's legacy became his hope. He wanted to go back too, but he was not dying to go back because he didn't have the ability, and his mother was there, so he guessed it'd be cool if he could wander around two worlds. He wonders if maybe Lucas wanted someone else to finish his research, and maybe Lucas wants him to go back because Lucas couldn't. He told Lucas that if it was what he wanted, he would, and he would try his best. Chester tells him that he knows how to respect, and he replies that he is just a normal person, so he thinks his reaction is normal, making Chester say that he is a humble man. He told Chester that he was going to look for him since he had a question, and Chester told him to go ahead. He asks Chester if they won't catch them laundering money, and Chester replies that there is a slight chance. Then he explains to him that if they look for every single investor in that entire world and combine them all, they will see there is more money than actual trades, making him relieved, knowing that no one would do it. He thinks it is a good idea to cover the Raven Margrave incident with money, but there is too much attention on him because he was the Seventh Circle Grand Wizard and has Arcea, who was an Aura Master so if anyone finds out he was the one who found Manuel Lucas's fate, there is a higher chance of him losing what he has. So he plans to make sure to keep it a secret. He told Chester that it was just his confirmation, and he'll ask his actual question, knowing that he thought of a plan, and it was a fake lucky encounter. Then he asks Chester how the fake lucky encounter operation is going. Meanwhile, outside, people were cheering for Louis Fairmont and calling him the Prius Republic's national hero. A swarm of people filled the streets, cheering for him, while in the top of the car, and had a lot of bodyguards in the side. He waves his hand to all of his supporters. Louis Fairmont, the fake lucky encounter possessor, smiled while telling everyone on his mind to keep cheering for him because he was their savior. Louis was 29 years old that year. He was an intelligence agent for the Prius Republic and the son of President Cartro. He is the second-generation tycoon who shamelessly takes advantage of his father's name. The fake lucky encounter possessor operation is to make someone act like the possessor of Archmage Manuel Lucas's lucky encounter and divert the world's attention away from Adrian. Through that operation, Adrian can shake off any doubts people may have about him and gain some time until he reaches the ninth circle. He tells Chester that although he doesn't feel sorry at all for putting a bomb in Lewis's hands, it bothers him to leave Archmage Manuel Lucas's name to someone like Lewis. Chester told him that there was no helping it, and he wasn't strong enough to protect the lucky encounter on his own yet, so he thinks it was a smart response. He knows that the Prius Republic is considered one of Rondell's four major empires, and it is almost the only country that advocates democracy and elects its president. But in reality, corruption and collusion between politics and businesses are fundamental and prosecutors and the media are the government's tools, so it is no different from a dictatorship in which the president has been in power for as long as 14 years. He asks Chester if it will increase President Cart's approval rating even further, and Chester replies that it is possible. But the situation in the county would not have changed whether or not the news about the lucky encounter existed. He told Chester that other than Lewis and Cartro, he hoped that no one else would become a victim of that incident. But Chester told him that sadly, a diplomatic war involving many countries would begin, so it would be difficult to avoid damage. Still, when the bomb named the fake lucky encounter possessor explodes, it'll be difficult for Louis and the president to be safe in the long run. His action will likely bring about change in the corrupt Fairmont regime. When they take the future of that country's citizens into consideration, it was a very good operation. He told Chester that in the event innocent victims arose because of that operation and asked Chester if he could identify them. Chester told him that originally, he would have said no, 
but he would accept his request this time since the reason he had to go that far was because of their lack of consideration. He can't believe that Chester readily accepted it, even though he asked him just in case, and asked Chester what he meant by a lack of consideration when it was not the case at all. But Chester told him that still that is truly unexpected. To think that he cares this much about other people's lives. Then Chester asks him if he didn't burn down Anna Cedric and Raven Margrave's force without hesitation, and he replies that it was because they were his enemies, which is a different story. Chester told him that it was a good mindset to have, and they must prevent innocent casualties while showing no mercy to their enemies, making him think that in times like this, Chester seems just like a human, not an artificial being. He wonders if he will be able to create beings like Arcea or Chester, just like Archmage Lucas when he achieves the Ninth Circle. Chester told him that he still had one last administrator privilege left, and asked him if he didn't want to use it yet. He replied, not yet and that he would save the last one in case of an emergency. He told Arcia and Croy that they should go hunting while thinking that he was currently level 205, and it looked like it would take a while until he reached level 250, the first condition of the eighth lucky encounter quest. The next day in Lawrence's mansion, the servant asks his friend if they heard that Adrian said he is planning to purchase five sky fortresses this time. His friend asked the servant back if it was possible when the maximum number of sky fortresses of Viscount and Baron can possess is limited to one. But the servant called his friend an idiot and told him that Adrian must have made that plan while keeping in mind the fact that he and Arcia would be bestowed the Earl's title. The knight told the other knight that Adrian even planned to meet the military limits of Vanguard Force equipment. Then the maid asked the head maid if it is okay for one family to have so many lords and the head maid replies, of course, since the titles were given based on their merit, and asks what they are going to do if those kinds of talents move to a neighboring country because they were treated poorly. The head maid also told the maid that Adrian is not just a new great noble in name, but someone who will be equipped with corresponding military capability. In other words, there is a new power in the Reinhardt kingdom. The conversation of the maid was interrupted when they heard a jingle sound. One of the maids told the others to wait, and that they should pause their conversation. One of the maids asked her why, and she replied that Arcia had just called, so she had to go quickly. The other maids asked her what she was talking about when it was her turn this time, and the other maid wanted to go too. But the maid who was walking first told the others that there was no chance, and she was in charge of Arcia today. She walked with the trolley of food feeling angry about how the other maids had crossed their senior because most of the servants working at the lord's castle were from Anna's side. Now that Anna has passed away, they feel like they are walking on thin ice every day. Although the people of the Lawrence family don't want to see their young master's face because they committed many sins against him, they don't want to quit their jobs that have a good working environment and a guaranteed future. As a result, they argue with each other to see who could come and serve Arcia, which was relatively less burdensome. The maid put the pancake on the table and shyly looked at Arcia, knowing that contrary to Arcia's fearsome or a master title, she has a gentle personality and often shows a soft smile. The maid looked at Arcia, thinking that Arcia came from the same commoner background as she did. But it's truly incredible how she rose all the way to the rank of an earl with her power. Arcia asked the maid if she wished to say something to her, and the maid, shuddering, asked if she may ask her a question if she doesn't mind to which she replied that as long as she can answer it. The maid asked her if Adrian fires the castle's managers, and she replied that Adrian is a good person, and he absolutely hates it when others have to suffer because of him. However, Adrian is cold to those whom he deems his enemies, and asked the maid if she is Adrian's enemy. The maid fearfully looked down because of her gaze and replied, Of course not. So Arcia smiled and told her that if that was so, it was fine. Then the maid barged out of Arcia's room, making Adrian, who was outside, confused. She fearfully looked at him and ran away while apologizing to him and Arcia, telling him that he had arrived. He asked Arcia why the maid was acting like that because she seemed terrified, but Arcia replied that she didn't know. That day a rumor spread that Adrian never forgets favors and spite, and that Arcia hates people who look down on her lover. Lopez awkwardly asked him if they could really follow him to the royal castle, making him confused and asked Lopez what he was talking about. 
Lopez replied that it is just that Eric and he are still lacking. Then he remembered swearing that when the war against the Croisan Empire was in full swing. Besides leveling up in the game, there was one thing he was preoccupied with, discovering talents with great potential using his magic glasses. Eric calmly told Lopez that he didn't think Adrian would summon them for no reason and that Adrian must have a plan. Adrian explained that he called them because he wanted to give them a little more experience. Currently, there are four vanguards who act as escorts, along with Lopez and Eric, who are members of the Institute for Gifted Talents. They are heading to the royal castle to be investigated by the Audit and Inspection Board for Nobles. He told them that they would probably see many nobles in the royal castle today, and if they were lucky, they might even be able to see the royal family. So they should pay close attention to the individuals leading that country. It's what they have to do today. Lopez shyly replied that he would do his best, making Adrian notice that if Lopez wanted to rise up in the future, he must learn to be a little bolder. The knight informed them that they had arrived at the teleportation gate, and Adrian told the knight to depart immediately, to which the knight obeyed. They departed to the place with huge buildings. Lopez was amazed to see it, but he just silently looked out the window and knew that they had arrived at the capital of Reinhardt's kingdom, Liano. A moment later they were met by the maids who were amazed to see him with people, telling him that he looked much better in person. In the royal administrative building, the nobles were cheering for him and Arcia. The man told him that they both were very popular, but he just shrugged it off, saying the media hyped them too much. The man mentioned how crazy things had been lately because of them, making him notice that it wasn't crazy in a good way. He informed Adrian that, as expected, the major power class didn't like it, but he was famous among the non-inherited nobles, having earned his place through his own work. The man's name is Baron Harris Walker, a high-ranking administrator and a noble inspector leader. Baron possesses exceptional intelligence, high administrative power, strong leadership abilities, and a high learning ability. His defining trait is integrity as a leader, and his relationships with others are generally friendly and neutral. Currently, he feels mentally exhausted and skeptical, wondering why he possesses four high-end talents in the integrity leader trait. He called Baron, who immediately bowed and apologized for talking too much. Adrian, however, handed Baron his card, telling him that it wasn't about his chatter and insisted he take the card. Baron asked why he was being given the card and whether it wasn't his own. Adrian explained that when he becomes a viscount, he plans to appoint a talented administrator to manage his territory. If Baron is interested, he should call him, as he'll ensure he receives the best treatment. This left Baron stunned and confused. A few minutes later, Baron informed them that they had arrived at investigation room number one. He explained that only Adrian and Arcia were allowed in that room, and the inspection would take around two to three hours. He suggested that their servants wait in the lobby. Adrian then told Bilayam and his scholars that he preferred they go on a tour around the area, and he would let them know when he was done. He also offered a generous allowance of three million loot. Lopez asked if he was sure, and he reassured them, stating that it was just a perfunctory inspection, so he'd be fine. Bilayam, his scholars, and the vanguard saluted him and wished him to stay safe. He agreed and told them to ensure that everyone had a good time as well. Baron whispered to him, cautioning him to be careful as he wasn't certain about what might transpire inside. The chief inspector was not pleased with him, and this had raised Baron's concerns. He thanked Baron for the information and opened the door, pondering that he could always leave the county if problems arose. Inside, they were greeted by four men, and he was taken aback when he recognized one of them. This was the reason Baron had been worried. The group included Noble Chief Inspector Douglas Hamington and the Second Prince, who was also the Royal Guard's number two commander, and an Orem master named Luke Wynne Reinhardt. He could understand why the Chief Inspector was present, but he wondered why the second in line for the throne was sitting in front of him. He bowed to Luke Wynne and expressed his honor in meeting the commander of the Royal Guards. Luke Wynne enthusiastically responded, noting that he noticed Adrian right away and acknowledged his status as an archwizard. However, Adrian pointed out that he'd be quite the spy if he didn't recognize Second Prince while living in the same country. Luke Wynne allowed him to raise his head, and the system displayed Luke Wynne's affiliations, Reinhardt royalty, Second Prince, 
and number two commander of the Royal Guard. His talents included a very high level of aura mastery, high physical strength, and medium levels of learning ability, intelligence, leadership, and administrative skills. His traits were enhanced muscles and an arrogant leader. His relationships were marked as interested and hostile, and his current status was observing and curious. Adrian noticed that Luke Wynn's stats were high, as expected from an aura master, but not as high as his fame. He speculated that Second Prince probably had an aura master as his teacher and had consumed expensive elixir and medicines regularly. Second Prince informed him that he would be leading the investigation and asked if that was acceptable to Adrian. Adrian responded that he would follow whatever the noble inspection decided. Douglas agreed to proceed, announcing that the investigation would be conducted by Prince Luke Wynne, to which Adrian replied with a yes. He observed Luke Wynne, who appeared uncomfortable, prompting Adrian to wonder if Prince Luke was uneasy due to his requests. Adrian apologized for his impoliteness and explained that he had questioned Luke Wynne's decision. However, Luke Wynne assured him not to worry about it, for which Adrian expressed his gratitude. After they both took their seats, the investigation began. Adrian recognized that there was nothing particularly unusual about the investigation. Even if they held something against him, he had a solid alibi. Prince Luke acknowledged that there seemed to be no other solution for Adrian's situation. Still, Douglas pointed out that it had caused one-sided damage to the Raven Margrave's side. Luke Wynne countered that it was described as an ambush, but it was clearly a territorial dispute. He added that if a war had started, there could be unexpected collateral damage. Luke Wynne then asked Douglas if he believed that Adrian had completely demolished the Raven Margrave. Douglas apologized and explained that he had misspoken. Adrian was worried because his relationship with Luke Wynne was hostile. However, he thought that Luke Wynne appeared to be a fair person. Luke Wynne announced that there was no reason to continue the investigation because there was nothing to uncover. However, Douglas whispered to Prince Luke that the Raven Margrave was a significant force on their side. Adrian could hear Douglas clearly. He noticed that the majority of the noble inspectors stood behind Luke Wynne, with some people representing Raven Margrave's side. This led him to speculate that Prince Luke's strained relationship with him might be due to the influence of people around him rather than his own choice. His initial impression of Luke Wynne was unfavorable, but he suspected that Prince Luke was actually a good person. Luke Wynne asked Douglas if he was expecting him to be unreasonable and told him to stop because the matter was settled. Then Prince Luke called Adrian, who responded, and Prince Luke expressed his preference for straightforward discussions without loopholes. Adrian encouraged him to proceed. Luke Wynne then explained that he was in competition with his brother for the crown, and they were evenly matched. However, things changed, especially after Adrian's involvement with Raven Margrave, one of his primary supporters. He, however, had refused the support. Adrian apologized to Luke for this, but Luke Wynne assured him that he wasn't blaming him and that it was all Raven's fault. He mentioned that if Adrian had joined his brother's side, things could have taken a turn for the worse, and that was why he was reaching out before his brother did, revealing Luke Wynne's true motives for participating in the investigation. The first prince was already the crown prince, but there was a certain unease because the second prince had become an aura master despite being evenly matched. Adrian wondered how the second prince had reached such a position when the first prince had the rightful heritage and status in his favor. He knew that Raven's army had been significantly reduced, but it wasn't enough to create a significant impact. The problem was him and Arcia, who seemed to have appeared out of nowhere. Not only did they possess exceptional individual abilities, but they also had substantial funds, making them potential game-changers capable of disrupting the balance. He recognized that there was no advantage in becoming embroiled in political warfare. Adrian told Prince Luke that he wasn't prepared to enter the political arena, especially since he hadn't acquired his title yet. However, Luke Wynne explained that this was precisely why it mattered more. He told Adrian that if he joined his side, he would value his status as an arch-wizard and his contributions in the previous war. He also promised to support him in obtaining the Marquis title, making Adrian surprised. Adrian inquired if it was really possible, to which Luke Wynne replied that it wasn't easy but he could make it happen. Prince Luke also mentioned that Adrian's Viscount Marinov sounded appealing. 
Adrian intended to remain neutral, but Prince Luke's offer was incredibly tempting. He expressed his surprise at the generous offer and asked if he was truly worth that much to Luke Wynn. Luke Wynn replied that he was worth more than Adrian thought and mentioned the beautiful Aura Master by his side, Arcia. Prince Luke smiled as he gazed at Arcia, leaving Adrian silently disappointed. Adrian requested some time to think it through, but Luke Wynn remarked that wizards were known for their caution, especially those who had spent most of their lives hidden. Adrian realized that it wasn't just caution. He simply didn't like Prince Luke's behavior. Luke Wynn offered a week for him to consider, to which Adrian expressed his gratitude. Facing each other, Prince Luke asked Adrian if he believed that the crown should go to someone with the right abilities while extending his hand. Adrian accepted it, and Prince Luke emphasized that if the crown prince ascended, the Reinhardt kingdom would decline. He urged Adrian to think about the country's future as a noble, to which Adrian agreed to take his words to heart. Prince Luke then turned to Arcia, shook her hand, and expressed his surprise at her smaller stature, adding that it was almost surprising that she was an aura master. Arcia thanked him, and Prince Luke suggested they might duel later, as he had never seen a female aura master. Arcia gladly accepted, while Adrian observed their interaction. As Luke Wynn began to leave, he told Arcia that she seemed very emotionless and that he would see her next time. Douglas, walking behind Adrian, advised Adrian to stop thinking and simply accept the offer, as Prince Luke was not accustomed to rejection. They exited the room, and Adrian thought that Prince Luke had merely gone through the motions and was dragging out the process. He contemplated whether to return or explore further. He asked Arcia if she was hungry, to which she replied that she wasn't really hungry but she had a strong craving for food at the moment, leaving Adrian to ponder if it wasn't the same thing. He then recalled Prince Luke shaking Arcia's hand while making a joke about a poop touching her hands and suggested that they wash their hands. Arcia mentioned that Luke Wynn had also touched her left shoulder. Adrian proposed that they should have a meal since they were already out mentioning that he knew a few restaurants in the area. Then someone from behind addressed them. A man mentioned that it was nice and revealed that he also knew many restaurants. Another man with a handsome face waved hello at them. He was initially confused, looking at the man who appeared to be an overpowered type of guy. To his shock, he realized that the man was none other than the first prince, Michael Van Reinhardt, a fifth circle high wizard. Michael's affiliations included Reinhardt's first prince, and the Reinhardt Kingdom Ministry of Foreign Affairs. His talents were remarkably high, with very high intelligence, learning skill, and administration, and high command and political abilities. On the other hand, his mana, aura, and physical abilities were low. His traits included photographic memory and conductor of stratum, and his relationships were marked as curious and neutral. At the moment, he was using a face alteration spell, leaving Adrian astounded by his capabilities. Adrian noticed that the first prince was moving around seemingly unnoticed by others. He wondered if the lack of attention was due to the face alteration spell. Michael commented that they made quite the pair as an arch wizard and an aura master. However, he speculated that the spell didn't work on those who weren't easily fooled, such as Michael's brother. Michael's behavior didn't fit the typical image of a first prince. Adrian realized that he couldn't afford to make an enemy out of someone like Michael, so he inquired if they could expect fine dining. Michael agreed and told them to follow him as he would guide them to the place. They followed Michael, and Adrian couldn't help but notice that Michael's stats seemed too exceptional for a human. His talents were heavily skewed toward politics and administration. He had never seen a person with three very high talents, except for Arcia, but Michael's overall stats exceeded Arcia's. Arcia's stats weren't particularly high because they were focused on her sword skills. However, the first prince, Michael, possessed two high-grade talents in addition to his three very high-grade talents. Despite having low mana, he had managed to become a high wizard with his wisdom. Michael noticed Adrian staring and remarked that he seemed to have many questions about him. Adrian commented that Michael was a more mysterious person than his younger brother wondering how someone like Michael could remain relatively unknown to the public. Michael pointed to the door, indicating it was the way. As they entered the room, Adrian noticed that it was a teleportation room and mentioned that he thought teleportation spells couldn't be used inside the castle due to the interruption barrier spell surrounding it. 
Michael asked if he didn't know and explained that there was an underground electric stone mine that sometimes clashed with mana, causing interruptions in teleport spells. Michael retrieved a device from his coat and clicked it, causing the interruption spell shielding the castle to slowly disappear. Adrian was shocked to see it vanish, and Michael informed them that it was time to go. They teleported, and Adrian couldn't shake the feeling that Michael was far from an ordinary person. Later, they arrived at their destination, and Michael invited them to enter. The room was filled with golden shining objects, and Michael informed them that they could speak freely now. Michael suddenly realized something and clicked the device he was holding once more. The interruption barrier once again shielded the entire castle, and Michael chuckled, mentioning that the interruption spell was working again. Adrian, in his mind, he acknowledged that it was Michael who had control over it, and doubted that the second prince had any knowledge of the first prince's playful manipulation of security, as second prince Luke probably had no way of knowing cause he is busy singing his own song all the time. They shook hands, and Adrian expressed his honor at meeting the crown prince. Michael replied that it was an honor to meet Adrian and Arcia. The butler approached Michael inquiring if he was back, and Michael confirmed it. He asked the butler to prepare a meal as he was going to have lunch with his guests. The butler assured him that he'd prepare it right away. Adrian was amazed observing the butler, thinking that people with high-end talents seemed to move around as if it were nothing. Adrian asked Michael if it was his palace, and Michael, while offering them juices, confirmed that it was. He mentioned that the palace's chef was hired personally, ensuring that he was one of the finest chefs in the country. Adrian acknowledged the importance of good food. Michael then asked Adrian if he knew that he followed him on social media, leaving Adrian surprised. Michael showed him his own social media account, which featured the overpowered closed eyes profile picture. Adrian was shocked by this revelation and admitted that he hadn't expected the crown prince to have a social media presence. Michael explained that many nobles looked down on the virtual world, but he was an exception as he enjoyed it. Adrian knew that Michael van Reinhardt held the title of crown prince, but he treated him like a best friend. It felt genuine, unlike the second prince's behavior towards him. Adrian commented that Michael had a sense of humor to which Michael responded that he did and that he enjoyed reading Adrian's posts mocking the raven Margrave. Adrian was surprised and asked if Michael had seen his posts because they had significantly helped him gain followers. Michael suggested that it was probably Adrian's looks that played a significant role in gaining followers. Adrian proudly acknowledged that indeed his appearance was a contributing factor. Michael laughed and agreed, saying that he knew Adrian was a handsome person. Arcia paid no attention to their banter and was focused on the food in front of her. Adrian asked Michael how he couldn't be aware of his own handsomeness when he saw his fan club greeting him upon entering the castle. Michael laughed again and admitted that Adrian was right. As they began eating, Adrian inquired about the reason for their invitation. Michael replied with a question, asking if Adrian didn't already know. Adrian responded that he had assumed they were being recruited to which Michael agreed. Adrian asked Michael about his expectations and what he could offer to them. Michael regretfully replied that he didn't have anything to offer at the moment. Adrian inquired if Michael planned to provide benefits once he ascended to the throne, to which Michael confirmed that he would. However, he also mentioned that he would obstruct Adrian from obtaining the Viscount title. Michael explained that the Viscount title wasn't something easily granted, and it was particularly challenging at that time due to the division of power. He also noted that it seemed like Luke Wynne had promised him the title, thinking he had enough authority to do so. However, if the people on Luke Wynne's side disagreed, they could prevent Adrian from acquiring the title, which made perfect sense. Adrian understood that Michael couldn't offer him the title as Prince Luke had done because Michael recognized it was an empty promise, and no one would simply allow the other party to grow stronger without opposition. Michael's statement about not stopping him from obtaining the Viscount title essentially implied that he would support Adrian in securing the title while aligning with the second prince's side. Michael suggested that Adrian would obtain the title by joining Luke Wynne's side, and his side wouldn't oppose it, making it an easy process. Adrian responded by saying he would take whatever he could get, and Michael invited him to join his side. Adrian considered the offer and realized that the real wild card was the choice he made to gain an advantage. If he accepted Michael's offer, 
he could obtain the title and align with the first prince. If he declined, his title would be at risk, and he would have to align with the second prince. He informed Michael that he had more choices, but there was only one answer. Michael asked him what he meant, and Adrian replied that he would do as the crown prince instructed. Michael asked Adrian if he was certain that he didn't need more time to think, and Adrian replied that he was sure. He believed that he deserved the throne more than the second prince. Michael reminded him that he couldn't simply make those claims to obtain the title and then remain on the second prince's side. Adrian stated that he couldn't betray his followers, and he had no intention of doing so, as he believed the first prince would likely win against the second prince even without his support. Michael responded with a cheerful nice, while Arcia continued to enjoy her meal. Michael turned to Arcia and inquired about her choice. Adrian noticed that the first prince's interest was different from the second prince's more malicious demeanor, which made him feel better. He asked Arcia for her thoughts, and she replied that as long as Adrian was okay with it, she would follow. Adrian asked if she truly meant it, even though he expected her response, and he still felt somewhat awkward. Michael cheered for them, commenting that they looked good together. This made Adrian turn as red as a tomato and plead with Michael to stop. A little later, when it was time for dessert, Adrian told Michael that he had a question. He mentioned that he was fine with joining Luke Wynn's side and obtaining the title, but he asked Michael if he thought Luke Wynn might become suspicious if he didn't show any resistance. Michael responded affirmatively, explaining that he planned to pretend to resist initially, and then back down later. Adrian realized it was a clever way to avoid arousing suspicion. However, he also suggested that instead of ending it like that, he should receive something in return for allowing him to win the title. Michael was taken aback and asked for examples. Adrian smiled, thinking that he had the chance to not only back down but also gain some leverage over Luke Wynn. Then he told Michael that Raven Margrave had suffered a great loss for messing with him, and Raven lost 40% of his power due to his personal feelings while taking a major role in national defense. Consequently, he believed that Raven didn't deserve the Margrave title. Michael asked if he meant taking away the title from Raven for giving up the Viscount title, to which he replied that he considered it a fair deal. Demoting Raven Margrave to Earl would inflict significant damage on Luke Wynn's side. Michael suggested that it seemed like a personal matter, and he admitted that he wouldn't deny it. He derived satisfaction from damaging his feud and having an opportunity to control Raven, making it clear that he couldn't miss that chance. Michael then inquired what would happen if Luke Wynn rejected the deal, and he responded that promoting one of his men to Margrave would also be a good option. He explained that he had earned the Viscount title as a reward for his merits in war, and it was a good time to promote one of the earls on his side who had also performed admirably in war. He emphasized the significant difference between a new person becoming a Viscount to support the second prince and an earl on the first prince's side becoming a Margrave. He also noted that he could be a Viscount who possessed an aura master, implying that if Michael accepted the plan and everything went smoothly, they could maximize their profits from his betray trail. However, he noticed Michael's suspicion and confusion but was also intrigued by Michael's reaction, prompting him to wonder why he called Michael to get his attention. Michael apologized, explaining that he was a little surprised. Michael then asked him if he could reveal who he had met on the second prince's side before meeting him. He observed Michael's keen green eye, which shocked him, and he revealed that he had met Baron Walker, who had guided him, Prince Luke Wynne, Viscount Hamington, and six other inspectors for his interrogation, totaling nine people. He glanced at Michael and pondered if he had made a mistake. He then noticed that Michael's suspicious demeanor had transformed into curiosity, which led him to understand what was happening. He told Michael that he now understood and was thinking along the same lines as him causing Michael to laugh and ask if he could read other people's minds since he had quickly grasped his betrayal plan. He acknowledged that he couldn't directly read someone's mind but could make assumptions through his glasses. Michael became confused, concerned that there was a chance his plan had leaked because he had discussed it word by word without explicitly mentioning it. Michael told him that it was amazing and that he had been considering those two plans as well. He admitted that he had suggested a plan he had already formulated which was impressive, and he felt embarrassed. Michael reassured him not to be embarrassed because it showcased his excellent decision-making abilities. 
achieving the seventh circle at the age of twenty was not an accomplishment just anyone could claim. Michael also expressed his desire not to be his enemy and suggested that they should remain friends. They both laughed silently, agreeing with the sentiment. Moments later, Michael handed him a gadget, and he accepted it while inquiring if it was a communication device. Michael confirmed it and explained that it was a secure device that couldn't be bugged. He informed him that he would contact him on that device if there was more to discuss and thanked him for the helpful and joyful meal. Clicking the device in his hand, transportation magic appeared beneath them, and just before they were transported, Michael told him that they would meet again. He replied that he looked forward to it, and with that they vanished, leaving Michael alone in his chamber. A minute later, they found themselves in a different location. He asked Arcia where they were, and she replied that they were in storage near the entrance, revealing that it was a place Michael had taken care of. He wondered how many similar places Michael had. Realizing Michael was a meticulous person, he suggested they leave the storage, and Arcia followed him. As they were about to exit, he spotted Bill Am and Lopez in the storage, both holding a variety of items. They were equally surprised to see him and greeted him with respect, concealing the objects they were holding behind them. Curious, he asked them what they were hiding behind their backs. However, Arcia tapped him to get his attention and pointed to miniature figurines of him and her scattered throughout the storage. He was astonished to see that in Reinhardt Kingdom star figurines of himself, and Arcia had been stocked for sale in souvenir stores inside the castle. Arcia noticed the paper bags Bill Am and Lopez were holding and asked them if they were purchases, to which Lopez shyly replied no. Bill Am explained that they had merely been admiring the figurines. Meanwhile, on the internet, the trending news reported that Frias Empire's debt-to-GDP ratio had increased by 12% within the year, and there was severe corruption that had made Recess Island hesitant to consider introducing a republic. The economy showing signs of inflation had taken a backseat as the Fest Republic focused solely on its military strength. The hope of the Fest Republic rested in the hands of a lucky encounter which the president's son Louis Fairmont had obtained. A question arose about whether the lucky encounter of Archduke Lucas acquired by the president's son was even real. Someone clenched their teeth furiously, shouting as they questioned whether Archduke Lucas's supposed lucky encounter had fallen into the hands of these clueless individuals. In the Brigham Empire's Palace Gold Dragon Castle, Emperor Edward Noah Brigham passionately declared that they deserved the lucky encounter, asserting that Manuel Lucas's home country was the nation that had led Rondel into its golden age. Edward urged the people around him to speak up, questioning whether they were not investing enough effort and funds into the search for the lucky encounter. Despite their apologies, he expressed frustration and summoned the director of information Earl Alfred, a member of the Seventh Circle, to confirm Edward's inquiry prompting him to ask for her thoughts on the claims made by the Frias Empire. She calmly opened her red eyes and expressed the view that it was a 50-50 situation, leaving Edward curious about her reasoning. Alfred explained that she had assessed their exploration methods, finding their approach outdated compared to their own. Additionally, the discovery of the lucky encounter had occurred in an unexpected and seemingly random location. If this was something discoverable, it should have been found years ago. Crucially, she highlighted that they had no knowledge of the core of the lucky encounter, including the cipher text Archduke Lucas had hinted at in English. The fact that the lucky encounter was found without deciphering these hints seemed illogical, suggesting either the hints were misleading or there was more to the discovery than met the eye. Edward questioned why she still offered a 50-50 chance considering these suspicious circumstances. Already proposed two possibilities— Either the hints by Archduke Lucas were mere diversions or someone had already found the real lucky encounter, drawing in the freest empire to mislead others. Edward wondered why someone with the real discovery would create distractions instead of remaining hidden. Alfred theorized that the individual might have been exposed or was an unknown variable, prompting the need to explore all potential scenarios thoroughly. Edward fell silent in frustration, concluding, Edward suggested the possibility that the real owner of the lucky encounter might indeed exist, orchestrating a grand deception to mislead the Frias Empire. Such an elaborate ruse would require manipulation on a national level, narrowing down the potential suspects to four possible nations. Edward listed the potential culprits, the Croizen Empire, the Elysia Allies, Lucia's Kingdom, and Reinhardt Kingdom, 
expressing a higher suspicion toward the Elysia allies due to the capabilities of the elves in manipulating situations. He had also heard news from the Reinhardt kingdom. Earl informed Edward about a young man who had achieved the seventh circle at the age of twenty, causing a stir in the country. This prodigious individual had amassed assets of sixty trillion through investments. Edward found this exceptionally unusual and suspiciously talented. Earl added that no single person would likely possess the power to orchestrate everything. Additionally, the Lucius kingdom had acknowledged him as one of their own, and investigations into his investments hadn't revealed any ties to the lucky encounter. Edward found this intriguing and questioned if it was all accomplished solely by the individual's talent, wondering about the possibility. Earl recalled that their empire had long harbored someone with talents surpassing even Adrian Lawrence. Edward acknowledged this and noted that the Reinhardt kingdom was already entangled in succession conflicts, making it seemingly illogical for them to orchestrate such a scheme. Earl suggested ranking the potential culprits as the Elysia allies, Lucia's kingdom, Reinhardt kingdom, and the Croizen empire. Edward commanded an increase in surveillance on royals and nobles in that order, and they complied as instructed. He further instructed his people to send a stern warning to the empire laying claim to Archduke Lucas' lucky encounter, asserting it was their nation's property. If they disregarded the warning, it would escalate into a threat, showcasing their power to the world. Everyone agreed to this strategy. Edward brazenly declared that sacrificing one country to acquire Archduke Lucas' lucky encounter was a small price to pay. He stood up, indicating there was one more action to take. When asked, he ordered Earl to attempt to contact the young man in Reinhardt. She inquired about the nature of this contact. Edward instructed her to propose immigration, suggesting that becoming an Earl in their empire would be more beneficial for the young man than his current situation. In a castle, shocking rumors circulated among the nobles about Adrian. They heard that Adrian had imprisoned and ultimately killed his half-brother and mother in a flying fortress because they had troubled him. The audience was stunned into horror upon hearing these accounts. One of them questioned the veracity of the rumors, while another described Adrian as a lunatic who had callously observed his family's demise, even posting celebratory images online while drinking wine. One of the men exclaimed that had they known this, they wouldn't have dared to cross paths with Adrian. Another individual expressed surprise, remarking that they had seen Adrian as merely arrogant without any substance never realizing he was the Duke of Riverdale's disciple. A concerned lady inquired about their safety considering Adrian's prowess as a grand wizard and the presence of an aura master, speculating that both might soon receive the earl title. A man among the nobles emphasized that this union of two earls and one viscount consolidated a significant power base, almost rivaling that of a margrave or marquis. He questioned if this aggregation of influence wasn't excessive for a new aristocrat. However, a lady among them dismissed their concerns. Isabella Cascabel pointed out that Margrave Raven's struggle stemmed from Adrienne's reckless intrusion with his troops. She queried whether it would have been an equal match in a direct confrontation. Agreeing with her sentiment, one of the men supported her standpoint. Another member asked if she wasn't worried given that she particularly antagonized Adrian. However, she rebuked them, labeling them as cowards and urging them to employ common sense. She emphasized that the times had changed, and they need not tremble in fear because of a single grand wizard and an aura master. She expounded on the strengths of their defenses, indicating that the flying fortress could withstand multiple attacks from a grand wizard. Furthermore, with the right strategy and sufficient forces, they could neutralize the aura master. She pointed out that, in essence, their combined power was not significantly different from an alliance comprising a margrave family, an earl and four viscounts, urging the nobles not to underestimate their strength, silencing further discussion. One of the nobles acknowledged that it would indeed be challenging to directly harm Adrian if he were to acquire the title of an earl. Another noble agreed, sharing the insight that if Adrian did become an earl, he would be a high aristocrat in name only for a while. Realizing that their fear was unfounded, they began to tease each other, lightening the mood. Isabella expressed her exasperation at their apprehension toward Adrian, calling them foolish. When asked why they were scared, one noble explained it was because they lacked a prestigious background like hers. The nobles continued to jest with each other, but Isabella's watch suddenly lit up. 
she stood up and informed them that she needed to leave. A man asked why she was leaving as they were just starting to enjoy, mentioning that a person named Lotus had gone to the Allies and obtained valuable medicine. Isabella replied that her father had called, making it impossible for her to stay this time. The lady encouraged her to return quickly after completing her business, to which Isabella promised she would try. As Isabella left the room, her thoughts turned to Adrian. She remembered his striking silver hair and blue eyes, a standout appearance even among their classmates at the academy. She recalled a day when Adrian had become furious, asking them what they were doing. She calmly told him that he had chosen to be there, and that the commoner had offended her. Two other ladies whispered to each other, noting that Adrian had never responded to anything until that moment. They speculated whether it was because he shared a humble background with the commoner. Isabella smugly asked Adrian if he was glad to learn that making fun of an aristocrat would lead to dire consequences. Adrian responded by vowing to torment her in the most terrible way possible and make her regret being born into that world. Isabella laughed at the memory and reflected on her fondness for Adrian, especially when she saw his handsome face twist in anger. She arrogantly wondered what a mere earl without a political base could do to her, as she dominated the social circle within the sixth Margrave family. However, her thoughts took a sharp turn when she asked her father, Margrave Cascabel, what he had just said. Her father, an ally of the second prince Luke Wynne, revealed that Luke had promised Adrian the title of a marquis. Cascabel explained that Second Prince Luquin believed Adrian was well worth it, given that he had become a Seventh Circle wizard at the age of twenty, making it possible for him to reach the status of an Eighth Circle great wizard in the future. Additionally, Adrian possessed the talent of a Grand Master, equivalent to a Ninth Circle wizard. His presence was crucial for shifting the balance in their favor, and it was advantageous to have someone of such influence on their side. Cascabel conveyed his desire for Isabella to use her position in society to establish a friendship with Adrian. The best-case scenario would be for her to marry him, leaving Isabella in a state of silent realization that this would be a challenging task. Shortly after, she rushed down the corridor, her mind racing with the realization that Adrian had become the sixth Marquis of Reinhardt. She understood that, while an earl and a Marquis were only one rank apart, the difference in their political influence was immeasurable. She worried about the implications this had for her future. Frantically, she opened the door and called out loudly for her friends, but she was stunned to find them inebriated and reveling in a party. It became clear to her that these friends would be of no assistance in her current predicament. Meanwhile, within the game, Arcia's hair underwent a transformation, turning into a shining white hue. She asked Adrian if this change was acceptable and he complimented her, saying that it looked good on her. After returning from the royal palace to express his gratitude, Adrian had logged back into Chronicle. To avoid the presence of a character bearing a striking resemblance to the celebrity Arcia, he decided to give her this simple disguise by altering her hair color to white. Moments later, someone inquired if he was contemplating entering the military industry. When Pesius turned to look at the person, he was taken aback by the individual's presence. Pesius questioned the man's behavior in front of Adrian, but the man retorted by asking about Pesius's own behavior. This man was a Grand Nocturne or first-time accountant, twenty-two years old, affiliated with the Green Accounting Office and the Kingdom of Reinhardt's. He possessed high skills in intellectual ability, administrative power, and academic ability, with low political power. His attributed quality was quick analysis, and his relationships were marked by interest and alliance. His current status was deemed surprising. Adrian was astonished to see that Pesius's son shared three high-ranking abilities identical to those of his father. He inquired about the reasons behind this similarity. The man explained that the industries they had taken over, such as cult steel manufacturing, zenith artifacts, conia magic towers, and panic mana, were akin to hippos that didn't yield immediate profits but instead consumed capital. Adrian had acquired all five of these companies, and the man believed that it was a strategic move for future investment. Adrian grinned, acknowledging the man's astute observation. He told the man that while the mining and distribution industries, the primary sectors of their Lawrence estate, were viable, they had clear growth limitations. Hence, he saw the military industry as a promising venture in that regard. The man expressed his surprise, 
remarking that the plan seemed fitting for a grand wizard. He asked Adrian if he might know what specific items he had in mind, but Adrian countered with a question, wondering if the man's inquiry stemmed from mere curiosity. The man clarified that he sought to understand the priorities for future instructions. Pesius, in response, sighed lightly. Adrian smiled and indicated they would begin with vanguard equipment, leaving both Pesius and the man astonished. Pesius inquired if it was feasible, to which Adrian confirmed that they had a grasp of the force system's principles and a rough manufacturing method for the vanguard equipment. As long as their assistants followed these guidelines diligently, the production was indeed possible. Adrian knew that the manufacturing of Vanguard Force equipment was currently in the hands of three powerful families in the kingdom of Reinhardt. They are the second prince's mother's family, the Duke of Enerheim, the current king's mother's family, and the distinguished magic master, the Duke of Haines, and lastly the House of Reinhardt's. Essentially, this indicated that the creation of Vanguard Force equipment was orchestrated by the most influential figures in the kingdom. Interpreting it differently, he believed that if they could produce such equipment, they could stand on equal ground with these formidable entities. The man expressed concern about the existing power's potential reactions. Adrian reassured him, stating that he had contemplated the response after visiting the royal palace. He explained that if they initially produced force equipment similar to or slightly less potent than the existing ones, the threats wouldn't be severe. Adrian noted that creating vanguard force equipment wasn't a feat achievable by just any grand wizard. In the kingdom of Reinhardt's there were four grand wizards apart from him, but only two had the capability to craft force equipment. Thus, a sudden appearance of a twenty-year-old grand wizard manufacturing vanguard force equipment was certain to attract public attention and would lead to a partial diversion of strength, inevitably resulting in some failures. Adrian informed them that he wouldn't settle for the current level of vanguard equipment, expressing his intent to be informed as soon as a good magic tower became available for purchase. Pesius and his son were initially confused about Adrian's dissatisfaction with the vanguard's equipment, but they soon realized it pertained to the flying fortresses. Their relationship with Adrian shifted from mere respect and admiration to a status of goodwill and loyalty. Both of them enthusiastically assured Adrian of their commitment to which he replied that he looked forward to their efforts. Rayford, taken aback, let the tea drool from his mouth in shock and queried Adrian about his reference to the title of Marquis. He reminded his father that he had agreed to accept the second prince's offer, thinking to himself that he shouldn't disclose first Prince Michael's proposal to his father, as maintaining strict secrecy was crucial to avoid potential betrayal. Rayford expressed his dismay stating that nothing had unfolded as expected since his return from the battlefield. His mother also expressed concerns, fearing that her son might ascend to nobility, and inquired if it was all right. Adrian explained that an earl held the same noble status as a marquis, but his mother worriedly pointed out the differences in their hierarchical level. Sighing, Adrian pondered that despite his mother's experience as the hostess of a viscount, she still struggled to adapt. He humorously questioned the significance of becoming a marquis, stating that he need to ascend to the position of a king in a country and establish a harem to be content. However, to his surprise, his father reacted angrily, and his mother appeared pale, leaving Adrian confused about their responses. His father passionately questioned the absurdity of his remarks, particularly with his lover sitting beside him. Realizing that he had portrayed Arcia as his lover for convenience, Though their relationship was not of that nature, he hastily attempted to retract his words, claiming it was a jest. However, his father sternly advised him against joking about certain matters. Adrian suggested his father observe Arcia's reaction but found her status to be complex and subtle. In a momentary blink, her status seemed to return to normal, adding to his confusion. His mother advised him to treat Arcia well and not to look at her differently without reason. He nodded in agreement and offered an apology to Arcia, who continued eating without any visible reaction. Feeling awkward, Adrian cleared his throat and proposed they address an impending important task that had been postponed, intending to mark a fresh start for the Lawrence family. His father inquired about the delay, to which Adrian clarified that it referred to dealing with the employees who had caused harm to him and his mother. He intended to cleanse the situation both internally and externally. The next day in the royal castle, 
someone told the king that not even a margrave but a marquis was too much for such a situation. However, someone shouted that it was not too much. Adrian was not only a rare genius who became a grand wizard at the age of twenty, but also an expert in economics who had built tens of trillions of wealth on his own. Then the men shouted that it was right, and even with Adrian's achievements in that war alone, they were more than enough to bestow upon Adrian the title of a viscount or baronet. So they should take it into account. Then another man added that Adrian also had the Aura Master Arcia as his fiancée. If Adrian left for another country that treated him better, they would lose Arcia as well. The other side still asked if there shouldn't be equity. Lukewin responded that, on the contrary, it was against equity to give Arcia only the title of a contest given Adrian's great achievements. Second Prince Luke told the king that many countries were already trying to approach Adrian because they had fallen for Adrian's talents, and some people even said that Adrian was the person who would become the next Archduke Lucas. Thus, half-hearted treatment was akin to abandoning a competent young man who would lead the future of their kingdom. However, Michael told the king that he knew that in almost two hundred years, there had not been a case of someone with no title becoming a marquis at once. Then first Price argued that he had won over Adrian, and he had no other intention than to empower Adrian. Michael just asked him why they needed to sugarcoat their discussion and whether Second Prince thought he'd allow it so easily even if Adrian was a figure that could benefit him. This made Luke win angry, and he asked Michael what he meant and told him that he wanted him to understand how inappropriate his comment was considering his position as the Crown Prince. Michael told Second Prince that if he accepted their request, they would accept his argument. Their request was that they should let Earl Raven step down from his position as a margrave. Luke when asked Michael if he was suggesting that they should give up their existing influence to gain new influence, and Michael replied that he didn't think it was a bad suggestion because Margrave Raven could maintain his position as an earl. He asked Luke when if it wouldn't simply be adding another marquis. Luke when shouted that it was not possible, and he could never do something so despicable as risking the well-being of his people for personal gain. This was how people trusted and followed him. Michael laughed and told Lukewin that he was quite amazing, just as he expected from a leader. Michael thought that, as he had anticipated, Lukewin refused the proposal due to the nature of the second prince. He didn't believe the proposal would be accepted. He told Lukewin that if that was the case, he'd make a new proposal. Michael expressed that Earl Otis, who made a significant contribution as Adrian's superior during the war, would be appointed as a margrave, which surprised and confused Otis. Michael then addressed everyone and admitted that Adrian had made a great contribution to the war, but it was no exaggeration to say that about half of the credit belonged to Adrian's immediate superior Otis. Michael suggested this in response to the rather unreasonable Marquiate proposal and as a way to overlook Margrave Raven's mistakes. Luke when fell silent. The king intervened and put an end to their debate, making a decision. The king announced that they would accept the requests of Crown Prince Michael and Prince Luke Wynne to which both princes thanked the king. A few days later, on the day of the victory celebration, Sylvia excitedly exclaimed that it was the place as she looked at the grand royal castle. She then asked Adrian if she looked weird and if her dress was too flashy. He reassured his mother not to worry about it, and mentioned that there were probably many esteemed sons who would ask her for a dance without knowing she was a noblewoman. Sylvia commented that Arcia would look good in a dress but Arcia told her that she liked her outfit very much. Sylvia explained that there was going to be an official ceremony, but she hoped they had time to change into a dress before the party began. Suddenly, some nobles appeared in front of Adrian in surprise, and he recognized them as Viscount Doherty, Viscount Parma, Viscount Karma, and Viscount Ronier. He noted that those were the faces he had missed and inquired where their master had gone. One of them sweetly asked him what was wrong and reminded him that they were also alumni, but he turned around and told them that he'd visit them later when he had time and that they should enjoy themselves. This left them confused, but Ronier mentioned that Isabella would be arriving later as well. Sylvia asked if they were Adrian's friends, and he replied that they were his academy classmates. Doherty asked if they noticed Arcia's gaze because she seemed as if she were going to kill him. Arcia responded that it seemed like Adrian hadn't forgotten them, and Parma said he was getting annoyed, asking if Isabella should cover for them again this time. Parma agreed and said it would be fine because there was nothing aristocrats could do. 
Ronier suggested that they should find Isabella first and ask why she couldn't reach her without knowing Arcia is listening to them. Arcia asked Adrian if she should kill them, but he told her not yet because he had made a promise to them. Later, the man welcomed them to Lawrence's household and informed them that he would show them to their seats. Then the man offered them seats in the front row, making them realize that these were VIP front row table seats. Suddenly, a horde of demon, I mean a lot of noble women inquired if they were the Lawrence Viscounts. The nobles began to surround them, congratulating them for seizing this opportunity, and asking Sylvia where she had purchased her jewels because they were as beautiful as her elegant dress, which suited her well. A man told Rayford that it had been a long time since he last met him, and wondered if he might be interested in visiting their estate. The nobles surrounding them made him guess that the high-ranking nobles were aware of his marquis title. He was then shocked to notice Margrave Raven who gazed at him with a dagger in his eyes. He suspected that Raven had been warned by Luke Wynne, who was discreetly keeping his distance. Later, the host announced that the victory celebration would commence, and the king proclaimed that Count Otis would be honored with the Order of the Golden Lion, the border city of Ort, and the appointment as a frontier margrave to I.E.S. He was pleased to see that Earl Otis was also on the crown prince's side. However, he noticed Luke Wynne whispering something to the man beside him and guessed that the man next to Luke Wynne was undoubtedly the kingdom's most famous sword master, Marquis Vincent. He also observed that the Aura masters in the country were very interested in Arcia but, as expected, she didn't match the second prince. A moment later, the king summoned him and Arcia to come forward and ordered them to kneel. The king announced that he was bestowing upon him the title of Marquis in the Marinkoff area as his estate. Arcia was granted the title of Countess in the Glendale area as her estate. Additionally, they were each given a fortified fortress. The king hoped they would do their best to protect their country. They both expressed their gratitude to the king while the nobles whispered about Adrian's title's sudden elevation to Marquis and asked if there had ever been a case of someone becoming a Marquis so suddenly. The king inquired if he had anything to say. He then addressed the nobles, expressing his gratitude to the king the heart and fair administration of the country, as well as the crown and second princes. He revealed that as a new aristocrat within a state he had a wish to fulfill. He called Doherty, Parma, Karma, and Ronier and declared a cooperative effort to wage war on estates involving these four families. The king, the princes, and his parents were shocked and asked him to explain, but he simply smiled calmly. Kalitz van Reinhardt, the king of the Reinhardt kingdom, had been growing increasingly concerned in recent days. His worry centered around the issue of selecting a successor, a decision divided between his two sons, Crown Prince Michael and Second Prince Luke Wynne. To compound his worries, a new eccentric individual had emerged in the country. A moment later, Luke Wynne angrily confronted him, stating that he must have misunderstood Marquis Lawrence's character. He had initially believed Lawrence to be a typical scholarly type but was taken aback by his aggressiveness. In the back hall second Prince Luke inquired if he was aware that a new lord couldn't expand his territory for one year. In response, Adrian mentioned that if that were the case, he would simply dismantle those four families and revert the territory to the royal decree. Luke when asked if he had no intention of backing down, to which he firmly replied in the affirmative. Luke patted his shoulder realizing that trying to dissuade him would be futile and expressed his disappointment with his behavior. He suggested that they wait and see what unfolds. Adrian had expected such a reaction from Luke but still wondered whether Luke would be successful in driving him out. They then left the room, and Adrian wondered if the real party had started. Arcia appeared and informed him that she had been waiting for him. However, he noticed that people were avoiding him, and he realized that even before the event had begun, Everyone had exchanged greetings and expressed a desire to be friends. But now, no one was approaching them. He thought it seemed like he had been labeled as a troublemaker, and commented that it felt as though he had become the black sheep of the family. His father, Rayford, shouted at him, confirming his feelings. Adrian explained to his father that he had not initially planned to go to such extremes, but had been provoked, and he apologized to his father. Rayford asked him why he had done it and he replied that it was for revenge, causing Rayford to fall in frustration. Rayford then advised him that taking on four families simultaneously would undoubtedly be dangerous, and inquired if he had considered the risks when declaring a territory war. 
Adrian responded that he had been fully aware of the risks and reassured his father not to worry. Rayford sighed and expressed his trust in him, while his mother anxiously observed them. His father added that it had been a long time since he had attended a party hosted by the royal family, and he intended to enjoy it. Rayford addressed Sylvia, his wife, telling her not to worry and to have faith in their capable son. Sylvia nodded, and Sylvia accepted his hand, all while smiling, knowing that Rayford had been treading carefully around Anna all this time. But he was aware that he would now look after his mother just as diligently. He turned back to the nobles and asked if they should continue with what they were doing. Meanwhile, on the side, someone shouted that even territory wars should have valid reasons and asked if it made sense. Karma questioned if their actions were the reason, and Ronia replied that those were merely their childish actions from their youth. Suddenly, Parma inquired if they would lose, leaving everyone confused. However, Parma asked once again if they couldn't unit as the four families when Adrian declared war. Ronier acknowledged that it was true, but their opponent was a marquis. Parma suggested they calm down first, emphasizing that although they were smaller in comparison to Isabella, they were a noble family with a viscount. Combining the strength of these four families should be sufficient to deal with a newly appointed marquis. Doherty panicked and asked if that was the case. Ronier explained to Parma that it was true, with their four families uniting, their combined power would be greater than that of a viscount but less than that of a margrave. Karma exclaimed that it sounded entirely plausible. However, Adrian suddenly appeared behind her, energetically greeting them, leaving them shocked and calling his name. He questioned how they dared to address the Marquis by his name in such a casual manner. Parma shouted back, telling him not to make him laugh and asking if he thought they would respect him after he had declared the territory war. Adrian removed his gloves, declaring that he would make them respect him, and tossed his gloves at Parma's face. He challenged Parma to a duel, but someone behind him informed him that he was not allowed to participate in that duel. The man, along with three others, told him that he had provoked them first and explained that given the significant differences between the two parties, a duel could not be sanctioned under national law. Adrian smiled, acknowledging their quick response and mentioned that it was unfortunate because if they had let him behead young Master Parma, he would have spared them from the territory war. The man questioned the nature of his relationship with his son, expressing concern that he might be going too far. Adrian retorted that he wasn't going too far and claimed to have a clear relationship with his son, implying that if he lost something, he expected it to be repaid. The man asked for clarification, and Adrian suggested he inquire about the details from his son. Parma then told them that the announcement letter of the territory war should arrive within a week unless they wished to have their family suffer because of their foolish son. Arrest him and bring him before Adrian. The man asked him if he was telling him to sell his son off and told him that he keeps crossing the line, but he just peeked while asking if it is so. And then he saw Isabella hiding behind in fear. Then he walked away while telling them that they'll see them on the battlefield. Parma fearfully called his father, but his father just told him that they should go back and talk. Parma was shocked to see someone and called Isabella, who was hiding behind and shaking in fear. Parma asked her why she only appeared now and he begged her to speak to his father, but she was lost in her thoughts, wondering what in the world is going on. Meanwhile, on social media, the news wrote that the new Marquis Adrian Lawrence declared a territory war against the four Viscountcies as soon as he was given the title. The new Marquis's fighting spirit embarrassed even His Majesty the King, leading to the question of why Marquis Lawrence took such action, ruining the atmosphere of the commemorative event. Marquis Lawrence's ill-fated relationship with the four families dates back to his school days. Then he read the comments saying that he was a victim of school violence and group bullying, and someone replied that it was severe to the point that there wasn't a day he walked around without injury. The commenter replied that he heard he was from a noble family, so he wondered why he was so pitiful, and someone replied that he was only a noble on paper but he has lived a life worse than a commoner. Also, he suffered an assassination attempt at home and was bullied and violently assaulted at school, so he respected him for becoming an archmage under those circumstances, making him realize that there was no secret in that current world world and it revealed itself without him having to leak that to the media himself. Also, with it, there wouldn't be any problem with the justifications of the territory war. But that situation aside, 
he couldn't believe that so many people were rooting for him even when he induced that situation, which is so touching for him. But then a man called him, making him snap, and asked the man what he was saying. The man replied that they were informing him of the specifications of the sky fortress that could be shipped immediately. Then the man gave him a book and explained to him that it was the catalog of the sky fortress. He looked at it, thinking that as he expected, the sky fortress was really expensive, and that was why someone said that Noble will be dreaming of having one sky castle in the territory. He knows that people look at him and say that he's reckless. They also say it was illogical for him to engage in a territory war when they didn't yet have proper military power, but it was obvious that they were mistaken about something. If they ran out of military power, shouldn't they just buy some more to make up for it? Then he told the man that he'd buy everything. He knows that as of now, he has forty-eight trillion in cash. If he adds together the property confiscated from the vassals belonging to the Margrave Raven faction, including Anna and Cedric and their family's assets, the amount easily adds up to seventy trillion. Additionally, if he adds installments based on his credit rating, the man told him that the transaction amount is so large that half of the selling price must be paid in advance. He tells the man that he paid a lot of taxes recently, and asks if he can get some tax exemption, while Arcia next to him is just thinking about cake. The man shook his hand and thanked him for his purchase. He smiled, knowing that even if he had just bought eight sky fortresses, he still had twenty trillion in change. He thought it was too big of a deal that it didn't feel real. Even if he excludes the prepayment, he'll be paying a whopping fifty trillion in installments. But then Otis saw them, and he was surprised to see Otis too. He excitedly calls Otis a margrave, and Otis excitedly calls him Marquis. He tells Otis to speak comfortably and asks him if they weren't going to the battlefield together. But Otis tells him that he is the Marquis and asks if he may do it. He tells Otis that he can if he was Earl Otis, but he can if he was Margrave Otis, making Otis laugh hard. But then Otis remembers something and asks him what the meaning is he is coming there. Then he replied that he just purchased all the sky fortresses, making Otis shout that as he expected. Otis tells him that he has no other choice but to make a reservation, but he expects it to because now that Otis has become a margrave, the military power restrictions have been lifted to the level of a marquis, and Otis must be there to try to buy additional sky fortresses. Then he asked him if it was his first time seeing her and introduced his daughter that he was talking about, making him remember that she was the famous one for being a lunatic. Michelle gracefully introduced herself to Adrian and smiled at them like a shining blue rose. He greeted her back and introduced his fiancée Arcia to Michelle, to which Arcia bowed gracefully while he was confused because according to the rumors, Michelle is a psycho with a bad reputation, but she doesn't look like one at all. Then he sees her status that her talents are exploration, which is very high, learning power and intellectual ability, which are high. Her traits are English and interpretation and reasoning ability. Her relationships are interested and neutral, and her current status is favor and fascinated. But then he was shocked to see one of her talents, and read it over and over again in shock, wondering what it was and if it was the English that he knows of. Margrave Otis revealed that Michelle had been tirelessly searching for Archduke Lucas's fate until it was found in the Post Republic. He playfully teased Michelle for falling into despair after hearing it was a found. Michelle, however, contradicted him and stepped on his father's foot, insisting that the founded fate is fake and real fate existed but was hidden in an undisclosed location. Adrian considered the possibility that Michelle, with her English interpretation trait, might have found the fate if he didn't possess the advantage of being born on earth. Adrian found Michelle's claim intriguing and asked about the secret location. Michelle, maintaining secrecy, hinted that it was a difficult place for nobles to find. Adrian speculated that it might be Hollywood, a virtual reality system viewed by nobles as an escape for commoners, making it inherently challenging for nobles to locate. While Adrian thought Michelle's prediction was somewhat faint, she was surprisingly close to discovering the actual location. Michelle expressed admiration for Adrian's achievements and self-made status, preferring individuals like him and Arcia, who earn their titles based on skills rather than bloodline. Margrave Otis couldn't hold back tears as he massaged the area that Michelle stepped in. 
Michelle proposed the idea of playing online diaries together and asked Adrian for permission, to which he gladly agreed. She expressed her preference for watching over self-made individuals, causing emotional distress to her father. As Adrian and Arcia walked away, Michelle and Margrave Otis bowed in respect. Arcia suggested killing Michelle because of what she knew, but Adrian deemed it unnecessary, opting to observe her for a while longer. Adrian acknowledged the need to keep a close eye on Michelle's actions. In a meeting of the four family heads, Viscount Doherty, Viscount Karma, Viscount Rani, and Viscount Pharma, they discussed Adrian's astounding purchases during his capital tour. He had ordered eight sky fortresses, 400 units of Vanguard exclusive equipment, 400 units of Vanguard exclusive hoverboards, eight Vanguard high speed combat support ships, and 100 teleport artifacts. Additionally, there were 4,000 effect armors and swords for knights, as well as 20 medium sized transport ships with seating for 500. The family heads couldn't believe the extensive list of military supplies Adrian had acquired in a single day. Viscount Pharma angrily asserted that Adrian was indeed preparing for a territorial war. At the same time, Viscount Karma labeled him as a crazy person for spending 70 trillion on weapons in one day. Viscount Doherty clarified that Adrian paid an exact sum of 140 trillion, with 70 trillion paid up front and the rest in installments. The family heads presented in the meeting were astonished, comparing this amount to the entire kingdom's defense budget of the previous year. Viscount Pharma, realizing the gravity of the situation, expressed his agony. On the other hand, Viscount Doherty emphasized that even with Adrian's weapon purchases, they were useless without proper knightage, especially since Adrian, as a new lord, wouldn't have the necessary military strength. Viscountess Rani questioned if anything had gone according to their expectations since Adrian's arrival, suggesting that he couldn't be judged based on common sense. She warned against underestimating someone on the brink of becoming an archmage. Viscount Pharma asked if she meant to consider the worst-case scenario. Viscountess Rani agreed, emphasizing the importance of preparing for the worst to avoid confusion. A butler interjected, revealing that before Adrian was granted the title of Marquis, he had posted a night job opening on online diaries, receiving around 4,000 responses. The family heads were taken aback by this revelation. The butler added that Adrian had acquired a magic tower and an artifact production company, potentially utilizing the magicians and technicians there. Viscount Karma criticized Adrian's arrogance for acting like a lord even before receiving his title. Viscount Pharma, acknowledging Viscountess Rani's prediction, feared a one-sided massacre in the upcoming territorial war, considering Adrian's leadership and his aura master fiancé. Viscount Doherty proposed the strategy to turn the territorial war into a civil war by involving surrounding territories and gathering allies. Viscountess Rani dismissed this, stating that Adrian wouldn't be wary of the royal family, and there was no way to prepare for countermeasures. Viscount Pharma, infuriated, ordered the butler to bring the person responsible for their humiliation. Meanwhile, at Marquis Lawrence's estate in Marenkoff Metropolitan City, where Cowie joyfully flies in the sky, Adrian gazed at the city from the terrace of his building, feeling the weight of his new status. Pessis asked Adrian what he thought about the newly formed night troop. Adrian greeted Pessis as soon as they met and told Pessis that the newly formed night troop was pretty good, even though they were a bit late. Pessis stated that it was a miracle that in a short amount of time, they created such a nice knighthood as he expected from the Riverdale family. Adrian expressed relief that many people saw him positively. Baroness Helena, the head of security and leader of the dispatch night troop in Marenkoff City, complimented Adrian's surprising achievements and strategic planning. Adrian, feeling flustered, credited much of it to luck. Pessis and Baroness Helena disagreed, affirming that everything Adrian did was calculated and meaningful. Adrian considered that he had only outlined a basic plan, not divulging the impressive details that had come together seamlessly, leaving everyone in awe due to a stroke of luck. Turning to Pessis and Baroness Helena, 
he inquired about their opinion on dispatching the knights to the territorial war immediately. Pessus expressed confidence, stating that Adrian had made well-informed choices, and there seemed to be no issues. Baroness Helena concurred with Pessus. Adrian then shifted his gaze to the sky, taking a moment to glance at the newly acquired sky fortresses ranging from first to third generation. Adrian reflected on how things came together remarkably well, creating an impressive outcome that amazed everyone. He pondered why the kingdom had provided him with discounted sky fortresses instead of the latest generation. Although they were royal gifts, Adrian saw an opportunity to use them temporarily and later sell them to smaller estates at a reasonable price. He shared his plans with Pessus and Baroness Helena, assuring them that there would be no issues. Observing the sky fortresses, Adrian decided it was time to move forward. Pessus and Baroness Helena were puzzled, prompting Adrian to announce that they were going into battle. Pessus questioned when they would begin, to which Adrian replied that they would finish preparations in three hours. He outlined the strategy of dividing into four groups to lock the enemies in their territory and capturing each territory one by one, with the main force, including Arcia and himself. Pessus raised the concern of needing permission from the royal family to attack. Adrian acknowledged this but emphasized that the permission would come eventually. Until then, they could refer to it as training, an excuse commonly used. Adrian declared his intention to lead from the front, showcasing his military prowess directly alongside Arcia. He aimed to capture the hearts of his subordinates early in his leadership. Meanwhile, the heirs of the Viscount families faced backlash from Adrian's declaration of war. As Adrian prepared to leave the estate and initiate the war, the stage was set for the unfolding conflict. The scene shifts to a cafe in Pharma Viscounty. The people of Pharma Viscounty run in fear, anticipating that war might erupt at any moment. A woman sips a fruit shake, contemplating the troublesome turn of events. She never imagined Adrian would be bestowed with a title. The emperor ordered her to recruit Adrian, but to her surprise, Reinhardt had already taken action. Most shockingly, as soon as Adrian received the title, he requested a territorial war with the four Viscounties simultaneously. Earl Alfred from Brigham Empire finds it most perplexing. She must determine if Adrian is a lunatic or an eccentric person. Another woman... Duchess Olivia Riverdale, appears beside her, expressing disbelief at the unexpected visitor. In the resident of Lawrence, Adrian and Arcia sit in a room facing the representatives of Pharma Viscounty. The representatives express their awareness that permission for the territorial war is yet to be granted, questioning why Adrian deployed his troops in front of their Viscounty. They demand to know if Adrian is ignoring the law. Adrian responds, suggesting that the people in Pharma Viscounty might be in delusion. His army is only training, coincidentally near the border of the Viscounty. He asks if they were attacked, to which they reply in the negative. Adrian assures them not to worry because he upholds the law. He won't attack until permission for the territorial war is granted, advising them to mind their own business. Representatives voiced their concern that Adrian might attack immediately upon receiving permission. Adrian openly agreed with their suspicions. The representatives of Viscount Pharma shouted at Adrian, accusing him of crossing moral boundaries. In his mind, Adrian conceded that he might be pushing the limits, but he retorted by questioning the morality of their young master bullying him during their school days. When the man argued that permission for the territory war wouldn't be granted in the first place, Adrian received a notification on his smartwatch. With a subtle hand gesture, he muted the people in front of him and answered the call. On the other end, a person informed Adrian that, as of that moment, permission had been granted for the territory war he had requested. The muted representatives were left shocked and sweating. Wearing an evil smile, Adrian thought that the timing was perfect for what he had in mind. With a flick of his finger, he unmuted them and stated that it seemed the royal family had a different opinion from theirs. The decision was likely based on who was more valuable to them. The representatives began to panic and pleaded with Adrian to make a rational decision. Ignoring their pleas, 
Adrian instructed them to leave and advised them to convince their master, not him. Adrian, with a resolute tone, declared that the only way Pharma territory could survive was by surrendering, otherwise, war was inevitable. Pessius then ordered his troops to activate a teleportation interfering magic spell, met with a chorus of replies confirming its activation. He further commanded the Sky Fortress and Vanguard Troop to march, with the collective goal of bringing down Pharma Viscounty. The unexpected turn of events left all three representatives in shock. Adrian questioned their lack of urgency, urging them to leave immediately. Helpless, they could do nothing but grit their teeth and depart. Following this, Adrian gestured towards Arcia, inviting her to join him in the war. He informed Pessius that he and Arcia would directly join the front lines, temporarily leaving command to Sir Pessius. Despite Pessius's shock and attempts to dissuade Adrian, he and Arcia exited the room promptly. Pessius wasted no time informing the vanguard group that Marquis Adrian and Count Arcia would be directly participating in the battle, with their safety being the top priority. Adrian starts to laugh thinking, someone said that even after revenge is achieved, nothing but a sense of futility would be left. In the end revenge will breed more revenge. But Adrian has a different opinion, because to him nothing provides a clearer sense of purpose than revenge. From Anna and Cedric, up to the Academy's villains, the eradication of their existence can be said to be the starting point of his new future. And more than anything it's fun to watch enemies screaming with their face twisted. Cut to another scene, and we witness the young master of Viscounty Pharma unleashing screams and tears, displaying sheer disbelief and manic distress at Adrian's unexpected assault. Turning to his guard knight, he desperately seeks reassurance regarding their chances of victory in this looming battle. The knight grimly informs him that Marquis Lawrence commands more than double their forces, and now with the formidable additions of Adrian, an Archmage, and Arcia, an Aura Master, their odds are perilously close to non-existent. Furious, the young master berates them, insisting that they must take action to halt Adrian's onslaught. He reminds them of the significant amount he paid to receive such disheartening news of impending defeat and expresses concern about the dire consequences should he fall at Adrian's hands. In response, the guard knight, maintaining a stern tone, chides him for his self-contentedness in this critical moment. Instead, he suggests a grim strategy. Young Master Pharma should meet his end at Marquis Lawrence's hands by sacrificing himself. Adrian might be less incensed, potentially sparing the rest and minimizing overall damage. Trembling with fear, the young master protests such a proposition, questioning how they could suggest such a fate for the son of his esteemed master. Unmoved, the guard knight asserts that everyone in the castle shares the same sentiment. The young master's ruthless behavior has left a trail of casualties, and blaming him for incompetence rather than Marquis Lawrence is a pragmatic choice. He emphasizes the principle of reaping what one sows, and the guards express gratitude for the lesson. In the young master's mind, he clings to the belief that he belongs to the ruling class, enforcing discipline on those he deems inferior. To him, Adrian is the abnormal one, not himself. Abruptly, the door swings open, revealing the knight commander standing before him. A glimmer of hope flickers in the young master's eyes. He pleads to be rescued from this predicament and is advised to seek assistance from surrounding territories. However, the commander dismisses his pleas, dropping vanguard equipment, force armor and a force sword. The order is clear. The young master is to wear them and challenge Marquis Lawrence to a one-on-one -on -one match. This is the decree of Viscount Pharma. Amidst his curses, other soldiers seize him, preparing to outfit him in the designated equipment. That's the time when he remembers Adrian's promises. You'll have to look forward to it. Because I'm going to torment you all in the most horrible ways. I will make you regret being born into this world. Young Master Pharma walking through the corridor of the palace. Remembers what happened, Commander assures him that there is no need to despair like that. Even if Maki Lawrence is an archmage, a mage is still a mage. A vanguard armed with force equipment should be able to face him. 
while young master argues that this is not comforting at all. Commander says that no matter what happen Adrian will come for him life. In this situation he shouldn't cower in fear and let Adrian take his life. If he took advantage of the vanguard equipment, while letting Marquis Lawrence guard down and defeat him then he can enjoy the fortune made by Adrian since Adrian has no wife or successor. In the end they will win the battle and he will become the hero of Viscounty Pharma. Before he goes, he shouts towards his guard knight that he is going to defeat Adrian and live, after that he will deal with them for their disrespect towards his master's son. Commander agrees with him that he will gladly receive any punishment after young master come victorious. He opens the door hopping that he might have a chance to win the duel. Defeating a mage with vanguard equipment will be easy but he was stunned to see the battle ongoing outside. His side of soldiers are being defeated mercilessly. His glimmer of hope disappears after hearing their war cries echoing despair. Adrian was flying on the sky attacking while Arcea slashes through between them. Young Master turns to Commander and says them he has no chance of winning. Adrian confronted four vanguards simultaneously, but with a swift teleportation spell, he unleashed a barrage of electro, leaving no room for counteraction. Even the appearance of three sky fortresses proved futile in their attempts to vanquish Adrian and Arcea, meeting a doomed end in the unfolding chaos. After that, Adrian directly lands before him, stating that at last he came out. With a smile in his face, he says that he thought young Master Pharma would be hiding in somewhere. It's so unexpected to him. Guards behind him surrenders while Pharma starts to shrink in fear. He looks at Commander, who pushes him to fight in a duel. Then he challenged Adrian Lawrence one-on-one -on -one duel. Adrian was shocked to see his courage. With a smug look in his face, young Master continues that if Adrian is a noble who values honor then surely he won't ignore. Adrian calls him crazy incompetent, and what he is scheming. He flicks and a ray of blue light passes through him. Before he could fathom the situation, his arm falls off. He screams in pain saying that at this rate he going to die. Adrian just laughs and says that he spent 70 trillion loots in installments to purchase weapons this time. Seeing his pitiful situation he can easily pay it in no time. Young Master was crying, his eye turned red. Crowy is carrying Young Master's hand. Adrian continues that there are several vanguard equipment and sky fortress falling from sky like rain. The scenery was as if Pharma Viscounty was displaying their family treasures. Adrian says he killed two birds in one shot. He got revenge and earned money at the same time. Adrian also said that broken ribs twice, once humerus, once carpal bone, once tarsal bone, those are the bone young master has broken when they were in academy. Although Adrian would have endured it if he only caused Adrian fractures, because Adrian has a strong patience. But Adrian was mentally tortured to the pinpoint that it even upsets him. Arcia unsheathed her sword and approached to take Pharma's life. But Adrian stops her and tells Pharma he won't let him die in peace. Then he heals Pharma and stops his bleeding saying it won't be fun if he dies from excessive blood loss and told his minions to take a good care of him. Then he turns and told Pharma Viscounty Commander to guide him to the Lord's office. Thirty minutes. The battle between the Marquis Lawrence and the Pharma Viscounty ended in just thirty minutes. Meanwhile, nearby at Pharma's Viscounty, Earl Alfred asks Olivia if she is right that Adrian is from the social circle of the Riverdale family. She tells Alfred that she wouldn't have come here to help Adrian either and wonders if she came there to check for herself because she suspected that Adrian wasn't from the social circle of the Riverdale family. Olivia tells her not to frame her strangely and says that Adrian is indeed from their social circle. However, she can say that she was there to cheer on Adrian as an excuse. She then asks her what brings the head of the intelligence department of the Brigham Empire there, and tells her that if she was thinking of taking Adrian out of the empire, it'd be a good idea to stop. The two ladies smile at each other with killing intent, but Olivia breaks the tension by telling Earl that they should just keep it at that. Earl agrees with Olivia and tells her that even if they fight each other, it'll only tire both of them out. Suddenly, 
they feel a teleportation interfering magic spell, making them realize that the war had begun. They use their eyesight skill to see how good Adrian is, but then they are surprised to see that a mage is engaged in a short-range battle. Olivia looks at Adrian carefully in confusion but Earl knows that the biggest reason why mages' movements are limited in the modern battlefield is not because of compatibility with vanguards. Teleportation interfering magic spell was a short movement magic spell that can increase the survivability and mobility of mages who are relatively less agile. As the best evasion technique to that teleportation interfering magic spell became more common, the spell can no longer be used on the battlefield. She also knows that it ultimately forced mages to be eliminated from the battlefield, but Adrian's battle seems to suggest that he can just dodge it himself if he can't use teleportation. She asks Olivia if she thinks that kind of battle is possible, and Olivia replies that even with a lot of aiding magic spells, it won't be easy. It looks like it requires an ample amount of combat experience, a trained physique, and battle sense because it's not something just anyone can pull off. She tells Olivia that she has an amazing priest, and Olivia tells her that she was telling her in advance, but she should stop with her interest in their people. She tells Olivia that it's unfortunate because she quite liked Adrian in many ways and says goodbye to Olivia because she has seen everything she wanted to see, and the result of that territory war is obvious. Olivia sighs and tells her okay. Olivia knows that she came there to check just in case, but Adrian showed many habits unique to their Riverdale school while casting those magic spells, and she tells herself that she shouldn't have doubted Adrian. She got to watch a good show thanks to Adrian. Then Olivia stretches her body, wondering if she should also head back now because she has done checking it for herself without realizing that Koei saw her from the top. Sharing Koei's vision Adrian also saw that Olivia and Earl had finally left, and he was glad that it looked like he had tricked them. Well then, the night commander of Pharma guided him to Pharma's office, and he blew the office door open. Pharma looked back and was shocked to see him with Arcia. Pharma shouted for him not to come any closer, but then Pharma tripped on his own feet and slammed onto the ground. Adrian hit the ground near Pharma and asked Pharma why he didn't sign the surrender document. Pharma asked him what Adrian was going to do to him and his entire family. He told Pharma not to worry because he would not kill anyone except for the main culprit, and in return, they would become a fallen noble family who had been robbed of their property and titled, or else he wished for death. Pharma cried defeated and told him that he would sign it. The moment Pharma's Viscounty collapsed in the war between Adrian and the four Viscounts, everybody knew the war was basically over. Later, in Doherty Viscounty, Adrian's Sky Fortresses attacked Doherty's Sky Fortresses while Doherty reported to the other families that Adrian, who had occupied Pharma Viscounty, was said to be heading to their territory. But to be clear, Adrian and Narcia may have already arrived there. Then he shouted to them that they must not forget that if he loses there, it'll just be their turn next, to which Karma replied that he knew. Then a loud explosion could be heard outside, making Doherty jump a little in shock. Karma asked them how about they just hand over their children, but Ronnie told them that there was no use for it because they said that as soon as Adrian subdues the young master of Pharma, Adrian enters their castle on foot. Karma asked her what she meant by it and she angrily told them that to Adrian, revenge was just a justification for war in the first place, and it was obvious that it was to fill Adrian's treasury while building an army. Also, so Adrian is planning to pass along his military supply shopping receipts to them. Doherty worriedly asked them if it wouldn't be an even bigger problem, and Karma asked Ronnie if she had any way to stop it. She replied that not that it was obvious they couldn't ordinarily win that war so they must change their method. Later, Ronnie's vanguard army reported that they had arrived at the teleportation area, and a few seconds later, Karma's vanguard army reported that they had arrived too. Then a man named Dennis called his lord to report that Doherty's vanguard army had just arrived at the teleportation area as well. Doherty told Dennis that teleportation would be carried out at 12.10 based on Ronald's standard time, to which Dennis replied that he understood. 
Then the vanguard commander of Karma told his comrade that it was a battle of time, and the march would be empty right now. The vanguard commander of Rani told his people that they should take advantage of this time to take the march's facilities and citizens hostage. Then Dennis, the knight commander of Doherty, told his people that if that operation succeeded, the tide of the war would be upturned in an instant, and they must succeed at all costs. Then one of Dennis's people reported to him that it was fifteen seconds until the operation time, to which he replied okay. Dennis began to count down and open the seal, to which the knight commander of Karma and Rani also did while counting down. When the countdown reached zero, they all together ripped the seal, and the transportation light appeared beneath them. Then, in midair, the vanguards of the three viscounts were transported. Rani's vanguard knight troop reported that they were online, same as Karma and Doherty's vanguard knight troop. When they were about to begin their operation, someone told them that he had prepared a welcome ceremony for all of them. They were all surprised when they saw a huge blue flying ship in front of them with Adrian Pezius and Arcia aboard. He told them to come with him and opened a huge transportation magic circle in front of them. While they were being pulled, Dennis cursed and shouted that the operation had been discovered, and then they all slowly disappeared. They were transported somewhere, and Dennis asked them if they had been teleported. When Dennis was about to ask where they were, he stopped in shock when he saw that they were being surrounded by Adrian's vanguards and sky fortresses that were above them. Dennis cursed in frustration, realizing that they were completely surrounded, while Adrian looked at them. Beforehand, Adrian's ship with Adrian and his people on board was waiting for the vanguards to arrive. Suddenly, they all felt something coming, so he stood up and told his people they were there. Pesius asked him if he had clairvoyant ability, and he replied that it was a simple prediction. Pesius told him that it was getting scary now, and he didn't know how relieved he was that Adrian was not his enemy. He raised his wand and released his magic power smilingly telling them that it was a passable strategy from the enemy, but it was useless if they could read their thoughts. Pesius stood aside and told him that the enemies had finally gained his pity. Then the enemy's vanguards appeared right in front of him, and he told them that they had prepared a welcoming ceremony for all of them, so they should come with him and teleported all of them back in the present. Adrian jumped out of his ship and landed in front of the enemy's vanguards. He ordered them to disarm themselves at once and surrender because if they did so, they would be able to keep their lives. However, Dennis clenched his teeth in anger and shouted that he was Adrian Lawrence, confusing him. Then Dennis told the others that the war would be over if they captured Adrian, which surprised him because he didn't expect it. Pesius, panicking, called him in worry, while Arcia swiftly ran and landed in front of him. A vanguard jumped toward him to attack him when Dennis shouted to everyone that it was their chance, and they should go at Adrian all at once. One of Doherty's vanguards launched an attack on him while shouting for him to surrender obediently. However, he attacked the man with his magic and told them that they should be the ones surrendering. The man fell to the ground dead, and he remarked that he didn't even consider that situation worth his time. Then Arcia swiftly attacked them causing loud explosions. Dennis cursed in fear but still ordered everyone to kill Adrian instead of subduing him, ending the territory war right there. He killed the vanguards attacking him while wondering why he even went easy on them, and then he attacked them with his flame blast skill. Dennis knew he couldn't dodge that one, so he tried to offset it with his force sword. He swung his sword to cut the flames in half, but the fire still burned him making him shout in pain. A moment later, when the fire was extinguished, Dennis's armor was destroyed. But before he could react, he saw Adrian speedily running toward him. He shouted at Adrian not to come any closer while swinging his sword continuously, but Adrian blocked it with his magic shield and dodged Dennis's powerful attack, leaving Dennis surprised. He couldn't believe that Adrian was making the aura force of vanguard equipment bounce off him with a barely fifth circle hard shield. Dennis clenched his teeth and sweat and shouted, asking how a magician could be like this. 
Adrian just raised his wand and told Dennis that he was hearing the same line he had said most of today. Then he killed Dennis. A moment later, he was in his mansion drinking a soda when a system appeared by his side. Then he noticed that there were numerous articles stating that once Adrian had gathered sufficient military power, the outcome of the battle had already been decided. Some nobles raised concerns with the royal family, suggesting that granting permission for the territory war might have been excessive. Initially, everyone had expressed concerns about the unreasonable request for the territory war, but the subsequent response had been unexpected. People were now speculating whether Adrian's sword would be pointed towards someone else. The article stating that the territory war between him and the four Viscounty had ended in just half a day caught his attention, confirming that the war had indeed concluded. The final struggle had been a solo operation because he knew there was no way for the vices to win, and he had been able to swiftly capture the remaining castles. The system showed him that his relationship with the vanguards was characterized by favorability and a state of obedience akin to an employment relationship. Their status towards him was one of fear and awe, recognizing that he was the one who had ultimately handled everything. Then someone knocked on his door, and he invited them in. Arcia opened the door and walked inside while the maid commented that she was covered in dirt. Arcia replied that her mouth was bored and she wanted cake. The maid reminded her that snacks should come after meals and that she had already eaten plenty of cookies in the morning. Arcia sat down on the sofa, causing the maid to panic and warn her about potentially staining the sofa with blood. He found it a bit noisy but noticed that Catherine had adapted well, which was a relief. A few days ago, right after the end of the Territory War, the people approached Catherine and admitted they were wrong apologized to her and begged her for help. Catherine fearfully asked him what was happening, and he explained that it was just as she had seen. These were the four people who had bullied her in the past. He also mentioned that she had to drop out of school just because she talked to him who was being bullied, and he reminded her of the bullying she had endured. He explained that for political reasons— he needed some time but planned to make Isabella Cascabel and Philo Brooks apologize as well. Catherine begged him to stop, but he sighed, held her hand, and told her he couldn't fulfill her requests. He healed her wounds and told her she might not realize it, but she had been his savior, and they should keep smiling from now on. Back to the present, Adrian called Catherine, and she immediately asked him if he had summoned her. He inquired about how her days had been going, and Catherine smiled, replying that every day was fun. They looked at each other in silence, and he told her that it was good to hear. Mm -hmm.